Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Yumi Shirai, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Arizona. I'm also affiliated with the Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities. For about 25 years, I have been involved in the intellectual and developmental disability direct care field through art program, which is called Artworks on the University of Arizona campus. So this is my passion, supporting the growing uh, older population proportion of people with IDD. This conference aims to inform about potential challenges and share support strategies and resources for the family caregivers and the community caregivers who support this aging proportion of our population. Although the conference focuses on IDD and dementia, much of the information we share today may be applicable to supporting all adults with IDD who have lifelong conditions, face age-related health and functional changes. We are excited to have um, national speakers and local experts from both IDD and aging networks. We are very thrilled to all of them here. This event allows us to gain knowledge together expand our condition, uh, our connections to better utilize existing support, sorry, existing support, and further develop collaboration to better serve our community. This conference is planned and hosted by iADAPT, which is an Arizona statewide task force of professionals who share the mission of supporting IDD um, and the caregivers who are affected by dementia. And next slide. Uh, so sorry, so we have a list of all the names who are in this committee. So many of those uh, listed on the uh, slide who shared the passion and planned and presenting today the content. And then also some of them are working in the background. Uh, we are very lucky to have them all in our state. Next slide. So those are the uh, topics, adapting the way we provide support, finding joy in life as we approach end of life, critical significance identification and screening and system navigation, and screening support and services. Those are the four topics. And between time, you do have a minor minute session that is very fantastic made by our um, task force team. So um, please be ready for fun activity as well. Next slide. And the drawing for a LAFO prize available after the completion, completion of the existing feedback survey. So hoping that you guys stay through the end of the session. And we have so many um, numbers of raffle prizes for self-care. So we really acknowledge that caregiver carry a great burden and also the responsibility. And we celebrate their um, roles in this um, community. And please note that references related to the presentation will be shared via email after the conference. We have short breaks and lunches you see in our program. You are welcome to eat and use the restroom as wish, as you wish. So please um, free to do so. And um, that's the first part of my um, remarks. And this is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathy Bishop. She's our dear mentor, collaborator, and a friend who has been working with the iADAPT Task Force since 2016 as our keynote speaker today. She's a leading scholar and practitioner in the field of IDD and dementia. She's the vice president of the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, NTG and the NTG co-chair of the Educational Training Committee. Welcome, Dr. Bishop. Thank you, Yumi. I'm in the process of uh, sharing my screen. Yeah. Can everyone see it now? 
Um, yes. Assuming yes. Um, thank you. It is a great honor for me to be here today with you um, and to present at this um, fabulous um, webinar for all of you, really showing uh, support for caregivers. And I hope I can add a little bit and help set the, the tone. First of all, I'd like you to put away your cell phones, text messages, worries of the day, be in the moment together. The slide that you're seeing here is the slide of our koi fish pond up in our primary home in upstate New York at the foot of the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, we just opened this up and returned a couple of weeks ago from our home in Florida, and all of our fish are thriving. One of the things I have learned is to be able to sit still and be present, and I hope each of you will give a gift to yourself to be here and be present. Yeah. I also wanted to introduce my pets of um, Misty, who is our Maine Coon cat and the matriarch currently of our, our family, actually, and Brandywine Bear, who is a 16 and a half year old Sharpe with a lot of underlying problems. He would be considered about 110 uh, to 120 in people years. Misty let us know long before we realized that Brandywine Bear is blind and partially deaf. She was guiding him and thought we thought she was teasing him and trying to play with him when actually she was bumping into him to make sure that he wouldn't hurt himself bumping into other, um, other objects and, and possibly hurting himself. Yeah. Um, that for me is uh, just an okay. unbelievable okay. lesson. I'm sorry, I'm hearing background noise. Um, I don't know if someone hasn't shut off their, their microphone. Um, so I hope that you look to nature and others around to understand that we are in this together and that we can all teach each other love, caring, and compassion, which are the most important lessons of life. Today's um, presentation, the keynote is first what we can learn and what we can teach each other. Adapting activities, it's important to understand that we modify um, activities and the habits and routines of life as people advance into the stages of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. It is extremely important to me to, that you know that it does not mean that you're only providing comfort care, but that we find ways to provide meaningful supports and activities uh, that we help to maintain the essence and the life story of each person through adapting those activities. And I, like you, am looking forward to this particular presentation. Additionally, it is so rare to have a, a presentation on finding joy in life. And so I am also looking forward to and have the opportunity to um, actually see um, this presentation uh, before we have it today. Um, and really am looking forward again and hope that you think about how you add joy into your life, commend yourself for the caregiving that you do and for the advocacy you do because together we can solve the issue of how we continue quality of life throughout. The clinical significance, it's important that we're able to do diagnostic um, practices and make sure that people are receiving as much as possible appropriate diagnosis, which helps guide us to how we can support. And then at the end of the day, the support and resources. Understand that dementia is a public health priority. It is significant that today's uh, webinar is a combination of people from the IDD network who focus on dementia-capable care and people from the aging network who also uh, focus on this as well. Some of the good news is, is that especially for people with Down syndrome who have been known to um, in the past have an earlier onset of uh, risk for age-related conditions and diseases, and have had a shorter life expectancy that we are looking at today of at 56 as average life expectancy for people with Down syndrome. Understand that in the early 1900s, nine years old, and when I came into the field and became a gerontologist, which is what I am a gerontologist with a specialty with aging with developmental disabilities, 
in the 1980s, life expectancy was thought to be 25 for people with Down syndrome. Obviously, the increased risk for conditions like Alzheimer's disease and related dementia is higher um, because of the longer life expectancy. But isn't this a joy that we have this as a challenge that we will also uh, solve because it is us together that has made it possible for an increased life expectancy. Understand that for every person, aging is aging is aging. It is always important when we're doing diagnostic practice, when we are uh, trying to determine the best course of support and care, that we compare the person to who she or he has been throughout a lifetime. Age-related changes occur in all persons. Each one of us has unique risk factors that will make a difference what our aging will be. We will age uniquely, but within patterns of aging that can help guide us in how we can support each other, how we can make a difference, especially for adults with IDD when they are challenged by disease process. Understand that um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias is not normal aging. It is important we find, um, find ways to um, compare the person to who the person has been over the lifetime. Um, make sure that we can, um, sorry about that interruption, make sure that we understand that uh, significant losses and changes are disease process and not normal aging, that we find ways to diagnose and provide interventions. Uh, that can make a difference for quality of life throughout the entire course of life. The exception, of course, is people with Down syndrome because of the chromosome 21 and the amy um, amyloid beta protein relationship, um, which increases the risk factor. But remember, I just mentioned that longevity has increased, which means it is more than this risk factor. And so we need to make sure that our healthcare providers, our providers of services, and our caregivers understand that when a person with Down syndrome, like anyone else in the population, experiences significant losses and decline, we have to rule out what are those possible losses and declines. What is causing it? What are the underlying factors? The challenges for healthcare disparities for older adults with IDD include lack of knowledge and research about aging in adults with IDD lack of training and expertise for healthcare providers on IDD, even less known about aging. Aging for everyone is still a stereotype and prejudice um, allowed to be voiced. For example, if you watch late night talk shows, um, which and how have gone off the air because of the writer's strike, um, that you will see that it is okay to joke about age. Chronological age is still one of the stereotypes um, and the assumption of loss of capacity and automatic loss of capacity um, still um, able to be joked about and for people to be insulted because of that. In a society in which material wealth is highly valued, especially for quality of life in later years, adults with IDD are more likely to be in poverty, their families to be more challenged, um, by the um, having a family member or more than one family member who is vulnerable in our population. And so needing to take income and put it into more family supports, um, more support for the vulnerable people in their family. The strengths of the IDD network um, and working together with the aging network, we can solve the problems. For example, we understand the need to emphasize and build on capabilities across the lifespan. That is what um, family members, this is what caregivers, uh, people who provide direct support, clinicians are trained to build on capacities. And so an understanding of continuing to build on this, uh, the capacity when there is disease process of Alzheimer's disease is something that comes naturally. It's something that we have been taught over our lifetime. Creative ways to communicate and accept people as each chooses to communicate. Funding supports, including alternative levels of care. While no one will ever admit or say that we have more funding than we need, because of course we don't, we also tend to be more highly fun uh, funded in the IDD network than in the aging network. 
That is why it is so essential that today we have brought together people from both networks. And not only does this happen today, that we continue to find ways we work together to solve the problems. Each of the networks has strengths. An indiv individualized approach to care, and that is what our funding supports. And we have organized networks with career paths and strong knowledge base, especially for children. The strengths of the dementia care network, caring and knowledgeable caregivers and advocates who have spent years and years of providing support and understand that the research and the knowledge we have about caregiving for people with ADRD and relate um, ADRD uh, comes from the aging network, the dementia care network. We do not have that research. We have informed research because we are building on the capacity and the knowledge that has already been built in the dementia care network. Thousands of resources and hours of experiences available to us, often free to the public. Um, again, understanding that we also need to understand that we need to bring in our own resources, a national plan with intended research and funding. Not one of us can do this alone, has all the answers or all the resources. It takes many, many villages together to make the difference. Understand there's a great importance help of healthcare advocacy. There are often interventions that make a difference in quality of life and health. Staff and family, direct support are the experts, the people who spend every day supporting, um, understand the reciprocity that comes from people with IDD, people with dementia, because there is also a gift that they give to us as well as caregivers. Healthcare is an art, not a science, and it is essential we understand that. It is the ability to take the science and the, the research and the information we know and apply that to make a difference for each and every person who is challenged by this disease. Are there really senior environments or are they physical environments for all of us? And should we be building environments that include all of us and make it possible for all of us to function at our capacity. Oftentimes it's just an awareness that the environments need to be modified, adapted to make sure that we are not excluding people from the supports and resources we intend to be there. It is essential that we maintain the essence of each person throughout the life and disease. This is especially challenged as many of our services are provided in a medically focused environment which is not always conducive to individualization for opportunities of sitting still and being present. I suspect those of you who have worked um, have never had an interview, a job interview, that um, they ask if you have the ability to sit still for periods of time and just be present in space. That's not usually considered um, a great work asset. And yet, especially for dementia-capable care, it is essential that we are able to do that, to sit still and be there. To find joy within aging and age-related challenges. I won't tell you the story of um, Dancing with Rose. I really recommend that the viewers read this book because it really helps you understand what it's meant by the essence of each person. And that one of the ways that we can provide joy is knowing each person in finding ways we can keep the environment and the supports meaningful, the day-to-day -day activities meaningful, but also conducive for caregivers and supporting caregivers so they have time for rest, but they have time for joy, and they're able to uh, share joy with the people they are helping support and spend life with. Everyone has a life that needs to be honored and respected. The life story is the essence of each person and should be documented over the lifespan. When a person can no longer tell their own stories, activities related to storytelling can still be used to inform caregiving and plan activities. Building bridges across the networks today is an example of building bridges together so we can share what we know and also our resources to figure out how we will make all communities have the supports um, for vulnerable people in their communities. Um, an example of a mom and son unable to receive birth services both together 
it is essential we understand that there are family units that survive due to reciprocity of relationships and the strengths from each person. It is not caregiving as a one-way street. It is the family unit together and together with each of their strengths making a difference. Many times in the IDD community, we have come to understand that the person with IDD living at home still with mom in this example, it was the two of them together that made it possible for them to stay in their family home as they chose and not one providing the care while the other one was just the recipient. Always respect and understand the reciprocity of relationships. We have many systems issues, goals and programs that are focused on younger adults, healthcare disparities, lack of systems for much needed healthcare advocacy, the ageism, turnover, and this has been especially an issue in all of human services due to COVID, major turnover, and lack of funded flexible program supports and activities. Um, the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities that Dr. Sheree uh, mentioned as we began is a coalition of interesting persons and organizations, and our mission is to ensure that we are addressing the needs of uh, into, uh, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are affected by Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, as well as their families and friends. To access our resources, uh, here is the, the link. Um, and hopefully the, these slides in this link will be shared. Um, here are the many resources that are available to you on the website. Um, really hope that you will go to um, look for these resources. They are available free to you, as well as people in the NTG, the experts, um, those who are advocates are um, more than willing to share the, their expertise as well. Again, here are some additional resources available to you. Um, really hope that you will access these resources. I hope today you will take the time for our gift together, be kind to yourself, value your compassion and caring. You do the most important task that you can do. Take today as a gift that's given to all of us to be still, and to focus together of how in the future we may continue on to support each other. Thank you for listening and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Bishop. I'm seeing some thank yous in the chat as well. Okay, moving on to our next session, we are now going to be presenting the first me in a minute session, an opportunity for each of us to take a short moment to ourselves. These sessions are planned and facilitated by our conference planning team members, Eileen Lawless, Monica Wukashevich, Tracy Carroll, Lynn Tomasa, and Marsha Berger. I will hand it over to that team. Thank you so much, Dr. Bishop. Thank you, Lizzie, and everyone who's put work into this conference today. Um, I'm gonna give it just a second for our slides to come up for the me in a minute. So thank you again so much for being here. Before we begin, will you please just take a moment to notice your body? Um, Dr. Bishop did such a great job of highlighting the power, but also the challenge of just being still. So I'm wondering um, if you would just be open to sharing one word that comes to mind when you tune into your body. Um, no judgment, it could be anything from tight, stressed, um, to open and ready, but just to be mindful. And if you're open to it, you can put it in the chat 
But again, this is just an opportunity to take notice of your own body before we dig in. So as we open up to this short session, we want to first say, we see you. Though we can't say we understand exactly what you are experiencing in this moment, we want to say that we recognize you just being here shows that you care and want to keep growing. And we don't take that for granted. We truly appreciate you being here. So let's jump in. What is self-care? A simple way to think about self-care is to picture taking care of yourself. Or if you love even more low-hanging fruit, this is taking care of our bodies, our mental health, our spiritual health. My name is Monika Wukashevich, and I am a COPE-trained occupational therapist currently serving at the Dementia Hub by Oakwood Creative Care. As a holistic healthcare professional, I understand the power of taking care of yourself. And I also understand that this is way easier said than done. Currently, I work as a team lead when delivering an evidence-based program called the COPE program. To give you context of the program, Studied benefits for the person living with dementia may include supporting and maintenance of daily function, reduction of behavioral and psychological symptoms, increased engagement, pleasure, and positive affect. For family caregivers, benefits may include improved well being, reduction in depressive symptoms and distress, enhanced confidence in using activities, and improved health. I work among family members and the person living with dementia in the home, and the first topic of discussion in this evidence-based approach is self-care through stress management. Allow me to read you a short quote from a book by leading researchers on dementia care, Dr. Gitlin and Dr. Pearsall. Caring for a person with dementia can be an exhausting job physically and emotionally. Many families providing care put aside their own needs, leaving themselves at high risk for stress, poor health, and other potential consequences. However, your needs are very important and you have a duty to take care of yourself. Helping yourself stay as emotionally and physically healthy as you can while caring for a person with dementia is the best thing that you can do for you and the person you care for. To make a long story short, dynamic space by being a care partner can cause stress. So by teaching you a stress management strategy today, we are equipping you to actually take care of yourself in a very practical and free way. Here's why. Stress can either be short-term or long-term. Short-term or acute stress is a reaction to a short-term situation that is experienced as danger commonly known as the fight or flight response. Examples could include hearing a loud noise, kind of jumping, and then your body naturally will relax. With that acute stress, there's a relaxed relaxation response that follows the short-term stress event. Long-term or chronic stress, however, is a reaction to ongoing stressful situations. In recognizing stress, this is not to say that the caring for another person is bad or negative. And it is clear that the physical and sensory experiences involved with caregiving can be perceived by your body as ongoing stressors. And as a result, your body may not initiate the same relaxation response as it does after a short-term stress situation. This is why I now want to give you a quick, free, evidence-based strategy that I teach every family I work with. This strategy can be used to elicit the re relaxation response in your body within one minute, and it's called deep breathing. Please now join me in trying this new strategy. I invite you to find a comfortable position. You'll notice that I may close my eyes. Feel free to close your eyes if you like, but I invite you to just arrive a little more deeply into the room. Perhaps if your eyes are still open, notice something in front of you, perhaps it's a color. Perhaps notice uh, just your feet on the floor or what it feels like to have your butt sitting in the chair that you're sitting in. 
And I invite you to take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. Exhale through your mouth. As you exhale, see if you can relax your jaw. And we'll just repeat this a couple more times, all guided. See if you can take a deep inhale through your nose and hold it. Exhale through your mouth. As you exhale, see if you can relax your jaw, maybe your shoulders. Take another deep inhale through your nose and hold it. Exhale through your mouth. As you exhale, see if you can relax your shoulders, maybe even your wrists. We'll do two more. See if you can take a deep inhale through your nose and hold it. Exhale through your mouth. As you exhale, see if you can relax your jaw, maybe even your eyelids. And one last, take a deep inhale through your nose and hold it. Exhale through your mouth. As you exhale, see if you can relax, maybe your shoulders, perhaps your ankles. And at the bottom of that exhale, see if you can just give yourself a gentle moment to maybe wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, as you gently come back into the experience in the room. Perhaps noticing as you open your eyes, if your eyes were closed, notice a color of something in front of you. And if you're open to it, you can type into the chat the one word that describes how your body feels now in this moment. I want to thank you for making the time to be part of this village of support and learning today. As we continue today, you will also have the opportunity to learn other strategies you can layer onto this deep breathing with Tracy Carroll. And we will conclude with more time for your input and a summary. And with that, I'll pass it to our hosts. Um, and perhaps first, Eileen, if you have any announcements. No, I just want to apologize for um... I'm experiencing some technical difficulties uh, with my PowerPoint presentation in my monitor. So I do apologize about the inability to reflect what you wanted to put down. Uh, what I did want to do is thank you so much for a beautiful presentation. And you know, when we have these me in the minute, we just want to recognize what you do as caregivers and who you are and give you space for that. So I thank you. And as Yumi mentioned before, we have some wonderful, wonderful raffle gifts. And we'll, we want to remind you to please make sure that, you that that will be available to you at the end uh, when you complete your, 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 um, your survey, your exit survey. So thank you so much. And I think what we'll do is, is pass it along. Um, Eileen and Lizzie and um, Mo, there are some nice words in the chat because we have a few seconds. So if you want to just review some of those words, it's wonderful. Um, peaceful, comfortable, relaxed, more relaxed, prepared, relief. Thank you for this. More relaxed, calm. So that's after the breathing. So great work, the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that exercise. And there are me in a minute sessions scheduled after each of today's presentations. Uh, all right, so moving on through the agenda. Uh, we're going to be moving into a, a five minute break here. So feel free to stay logged in, but you can step away if you need to use the restroom, grab a glass of water, make a phone call, anything like that. And we'll be reconvening in five minutes for the next presentation. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We're going to be moving on to the next session now. This, this next session is titled Adapting Ways We Provide Support. It's presented by Dr. Liz Carr, Monica Lukashevich, and Tracy Carroll. I will go ahead and hand it over to that presentation team. And... I'm going to unshare and then reshare because it's only sharing half my screen on my side. Okay, there we go. Now the whole thing is there. Sorry about that. So good morning. Thank you all for choosing to spend your Wednesday with us. It's the middle of the week. We only have a few more days and then we have the weekend. So we hope that you find useful information throughout the day. My name is Liz Carr. I'm a doctor of behavioral health and a board certified behavior analyst. I've supported adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities for over 30 years. I am currently the clinical director for residential programs with COPA Health and MESA. And today I have the pleasure of presenting Adapting Ways We Provide Support with Mo and Tracy. And I'll let them briefly introduce themselves. And you, you met Mo, so her introduction might be kind of short. But Mo, you want to go ahead? Sure. Good morning. My name is Monika Wubashevich. I also go by Mo. <clears throat> I'm the COPE director at the Dementia Hub by Oakwood Creative Care in Mesa, Arizona. And I'll say a little bit more about that later in the presentation. So I'll kick it to you, Tracy. Good morning. You go ahead and take the next slide for me, Liz, thanks. So my name is Tracy Carroll and I'm really feeling so very grateful to be here with my colleagues and fellow caregivers. Um, I'll be wearing two hats today, um, one as a physical physical therapist, and one is a sister caregiver. So I'll be sharing from both of these perspectives. So I found this slide. What do you think? Um, the care for burnout is not self-care, despite what we read in health magazines, self-help magazines, and see on social media. And um, we learned earlier, it does take a vill village. It's caring for each other, and we can't do it alone. We need each other. Liz, Mo, and I want this presentation to resonate with you as caregivers, and we're here uh, for your support. Um, feel free to put any comments that come up for you during our presentation in the chat box, and we will try to get to all questions before we conclude today, but we might not be able to do that. So please include your contact information. You can DM us and we'll definitely get back to you. So we value your feedback and questions. And now I'll turn it back to my co-presenters, Liz and Mo. Hey, so we have complete bios in the slide deck, which you're gonna get, but we're not gonna spend any time on them since you came to learn about IDD and dementia, not us. You'll be receiving slide decks at the end of the conference. Uh, should you decide that you want to know more about any of us, our information will be there. So Mo, can you go over the objectives for the presentation? Absolutely, thanks Liz. Before we begin to dig in, we want to quickly highlight what we will be talking about today. We will be introducing you to a few case studies to showcase real ways to adapt situations. However, with the three of us being so passionate, we do have a bonus case study tucked in at the end in case we have a little extra time. We will highlight adaptations based on the individual and collaborative skill set of three different disciplines that include an applied behavioral analyst, a physical therapist, and an occupational therapist. We will then briefly cover more about the COPE program that you've been hearing about, then show you some examples of adaptive equipment that are commonly associated, though not restricted to, the different disciplines of OT, PT, and ABA. 
we will then conclude. <clears throat> As we dig into case studies and examples, it is important to remember that each person moves through dementia in their own way. And as a result, each care partner responds in very unique ways. We hope this gives you inspiration for new ways to see situations. Another point to remember is that all behavior is a form of communication, and it is up to us as care partners or caregivers to determine what the person is attempting to communicate with us. We need to keep learning to adjust our expectations to match a realistic perspective for the person living with dementia. Lastly, although Liz, Tracy, and I have never had the privilege of working together on the same case yet, we have each brought our own experiences to the cases we will cover today. Liz will now begin to dig deeper with you into this with the whole concept of a team approach. So we know that the member or client loved one is in the center of the team, but there's many other professional and non-professionals that may be involved in supporting you. Each person with IDD and dementia requires and is eligible for different services. If the person has division developmental disabilities involvement, then they would have a case manager support coordinator. And later you'll hear from DDD about what services they offer. Daytime programming may be through an IDD program or a senior dementia, dementia specific program. And you'll hear from some of those programs and services later today as well. The primary care provider or PCP is a great place to begin to start requesting referrals for pro professions such as OT, PT, speech, ABA, and nutrition. Thinking outside the box, some of the supports that you have, you may not even realize that they're part of your support system. They could be other family members, clergy, neighbors, even look to local parks and recreation services that offer specialized IDD program or senior programming. Someone else that could be a support but not really on the team is your local police department. Many departments offer a registration for a person or address that you sign up for that either identifies the person as someone with an IDD or dementia or the address that the person lives at as a location that a person with an IDD or dementia lives. So essentially what that looks like is your the person's name or address will go into the police department system and it will be flagged. So if there's ever a call about that person, there'll be information that will populate for dispatch that will say that this person has uh, dementia, or this person has autism, and then just a little bit of information about them. And the same with the address. So for COPA Health, we let all of our local police departments know where our programs are. So if there's ever a call from one of our locations, uh, the responding officers already know that it's a service location and have a different skill set that they'll use in order to support whatever the, the crisis is. So reach out to your local police department, the non-emergency number, it's not a 911 call, uh, to see if it's something that they do and then how you would go about signing up for that if you're interested. A note, and we've already kind of talked about this before, but you'll hear it several times, is that as professionals or non-professionals, the way we support a person with IDD and dementia needs to change. The person with dementia is not going to change. We need to adapt how we do what we do to make it match what they need when they need it. So I'm gonna let Mo tell you about some considerations when we're looking at how to best support someone with an IDD and dementia. Mo? Thanks, Liz. One of the biggest and most critical questions we can begin to ask ourselves as team members is how can I help adapt this situation? Or how can I write or think of goals with the realistic considerations of the presence of dementia in the situation? <clears throat> so here's an evidence-informed tool you can use Using the triadic model or the triangle of triggers, as we've lovingly come to label the triangle, 
we are encouraged to see that the three points of the triangle represent areas that may be causing or triggering a response, a behavior or an expression in the person living with dementia, such as yelling or wandering. The three main categories of a trigger or corners of the triangle, if you're a visual learner, fall under the person living with dementia. So you can imagine that maybe at the top of the triangle, the care partner, maybe at the bottom left of the triangle, and the environment, the other corner of the triangle. On a practical level, what you can begin to do is shift from thinking, what new skill am I going to teach the person with dementia, which is often but not always unrealistic, to thinking which of the three areas can I adjust or influence in order to help them reach their goal, which may also mean having less expressions of yelling or, or wandering in a day. The person with dementia, living with dementia, may use the bathroom more easily and safely by adapting the environment with a safety frame. The person may yell less by trialing an adaptation in how we, as the care partner, approach them or how we set them up for success to do the activity that is often happening when they are yelling, or trialing an adaptation that would immediately impact how the person living with dementia may be feeling in their own body, such as repositioning of the sitting position so they can better reach their food, changing when pain medications are given so they are less, are in less pain, or assisting them to the bathroom so they don't have the discomfort of needing to urinate or have a bowel movement, but maybe are unable to ask or know to go. As we adjust our expectations and look more deeply at the causes of behaviors, we can begin to ask ourselves, how can I help this person maintain the skills that they do have? How can we begin to view and write goals from a lens of protecting the strengths and engagement of the person living with dementia, not just focus on the learning of a new skill. In the following case study, Liz will begin to share different adaptations from professional caregiver and other team member lenses. Okay, the first case study that we're gonna go through is Estella. Estelle is a 45-year-old female with Down syndrome, and she has the beginning signs of dementia. She was referred for a functional behavior assessment, also known as a FBA, by DDD. And if you remember back at the beginning, those of you not familiar with the acronym DDD, that's the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Uh, she has minimal verbal skills and is ambulatory, lives in a group home with three housemates, attends a DD day program, and the mom is guardian. So the way we're gonna do our case studies is each profession, ABA, OT, and PT, are going to take a part of it and give suggestions or ideas on what we would do as coming from that profession to help support the member and their caregiver or care partner. So the behavior that's of concern for Estella is hoarding. And I think it was Yumi or, or Kathy Bishop at the beginning said that the information that you're getting today isn't specific to someone with an IDD and dementia. The, the tips and tricks and suggestions that we're providing today can be applied to anyone with an IDD. And oftentimes someone without an ID, IDD, but just a, a diagnosis of dementia. So take these suggestions and apply them wherever you can. So hoarding can be connected to a person's feeling of loss of control. And it's most often seen in the early to mid stages of the disease progression. Hoarding allows a person to gain control over some part of their life. Typical items that someone may hoard can include food, garbage, plastic bags, paper, small items like um, dice or soda tabs. And obviously hoarding can be dangerous depending on what's being hoarded. So if someone's hoarding food, we could end up with spoiled food. If someone's hoarding trash, bacteria from garbage. If someone is hoarding 
uh, pop tabs, they're soda tabs. I'm from the Midwest, so it's pop. Um, they could get injured with the, the sharp metal on that. So safe hoarding can be accomplished in time. Trying to remove all the items being hoarded at one time may cause undue stress to Estella. This is the one part or the one area that she feels that she has control in. So if we just take everything away, she has lost that sense of control throughout her life. So we could create a space for Estella to create uh, or to keep the items and allow her to choose what or how much to get rid of when the area becomes too full or add additional space as possible. So thinking about what she's hoarding would determine whether we wanted to add additional space. I've supported someone in the past who was, who hoarded watch parts. So would find old watches or go purchase old watches and take them apart. And he just had a whole drawer of watch parts. And that somehow gave him comfort being able to go through the, the basket of, of watch parts. When the basket got too full, we asked him, you know, which, which ones do you want to get rid of so we can get some more? And in order to keep his hands busy, that's what he did is he took apart the watches. So if it was someone that was hoarding food, so it, we could look at exchanging food that spoils with food that has a longer shelf life. So consider applesauce for apples or maybe even the plastic foam apples for a real apple. If that's going to happen, you need to make sure that that's not something that the person is going to attempt to eat. It may just be the control of always having some kind of food available that could be um, thoughts of food insecurity that maybe happened in the past or something they're concerned about happening now. So if Estella's hoarding food, I would remind her that food is available in whatever specific location it is, and she can eat it and replace it whenever she wants. But we don't suggest adding a new place to tell her to go get food, because if she's starting to experience dementia symptoms, she's not going to remember that new place. So it needs to be something that's been consistent um, before she started displaying the signs of some dementia. So she has that control. Uh, we may also need to discreetly remove the items that could be unsafe or that could be made unsafe in time. Looking at, and it's not the, the route we want to go, but thinking about the, the gentleman that had the, the watch parts, when the tote got like close to full, we would go in because he wasn't really wanting to give up any and take out a few pieces just so he would have maybe an inch or two at the top of the little tote thing that he'd be able to put more in. So Tracy, the, the physical skills that we have of, con of concern for Estella are intrinsic and extrinsic fall risks. So would you be able to share some tips, tricks, suggestions on what you could do to help support Estella? Sure, thank you, Liz. So because Estella has some fall risks, we are encouraging a PT referral for support in creating safe passageways that Estella shares and frequents in her group home and quite probably at work as well. She may also need a gait assessment and consideration of using a walker or a cane if indicated. Um, so I'll give some adaptations to incorporate into a fall prevention and home safety um, environment for Estella. So a PT would do a home assessment to increase awareness of the shared living spaces and hallways. And we would also include outside patios and walkways, especially noting if there is an uneven ground that she has to navigate to ensure that Estella and for that matter, her roommates also can safely get around without needing to adjust for clutter and tripping hazards. So this would all be done with Estella present and with staff interaction and family if they were able to attend. And once her home has safe passageways, then we would do a gate assessment, which would determine if Estella can safely ambulate room to room and short community distances independently, or maybe she would benefit from using a walker 
or a cane, or maybe even companion handholds. And finally, PT would work with the Stella and her family and the home staff to expand meaningful activities at her home that she could do alone or with her roommates, housemates and staff to be a good destruction, for, destruction from her less safe or hoarding tendencies. So now we'll hear from Mo from an OT perspective. Thanks, Tracy. So like Tracy had pointed out, the concerns for mo mobility really warrant uh, physical therapy involvement and the challenges with the bathing and the dressing in those particular occupations certainly support the need to initiate or um, at least the opportunity to initiate a referral for occupational therapy. And also you may think, um, well, if PT is involved, does OT need to be involved, especially for a home safety assessment? And this is actually a really great example of why. Um, because though we both may be in the home where Tracy or the physical therapist is looking at kind of mobility of routes throughout the home, the occupational therapist can really look at the environment that surrounds the occupations that are challenging. Um, so for example, looking more closely at the setup of where the dressing routine is happening, perhaps looking at the specific shower room and what's happening in the routine of kind of getting undressed to getting in the shower to getting out of the shower. Um, so there's, there's certainly um, room and opportunity to have kind of an extended home safety assessment to address some different goals of, around the concerns of dressing and bathing. Like you've heard it mentioned, collaboration with the caregiver um, would also be something that the occupational therapist would do to identify the key areas in the environment that may be either creating the safety hazards for dressing and showering, or maybe causing too much visual stress um, that may be the reason for more challenges with bathing. And so that if we think of kind of Liz's example of the need for control, part of if part of the situation is that maybe someone wants to or has a tendency to hoard and it's around the shower, maybe it's like shower items, there's the opportunity to consider that perhaps the visual of the hoarding is partly a trigger, but also how to keep an appropriate perhaps choices and control present. Like Liz talked about adapting kind of the watch pieces. Some of those same principles can be applied in the actual showering and dressing occupations so that we find ways to promote the independence and abilities of them still getting dressed, still bathing with as much independence as possible, but perhaps helping the care partner understand how they can adapt the environment. The OT could also explore and demonstrate the use of ways to communicate or direct the bathing uh, and dressing tasks. So for example, maybe there's a trigger happening when Estella is getting dressed because there are too many choices being offered either visually, which is the environmental cause, or because the caregiver is using too many words when cueing her to get dressed. More specifically, the OT can help the care partner to see that too many words or steps are being used and then could demonstrate an adapted approach such as, instead of saying, here, Estella, put on your shirt, put this on, uh, put your right arm here, turn it this way. Okay, this next, instead of doing that, the OT could demonstrate so a couple different adaptations to simplify the cueing and the routine process. So maybe the OT teaches the person some type of strategy to match the abilities of Estella. So perhaps it's just laying the shirt out as it needs to be put on and says, start here. And maybe it's just cueing that's more visual than it is verbal. Tracy, I'll kick it back to you for the next one. Okay, case study two is my brother Dirk, or Cowboy Dirk as he liked to be called. And I wanted referrals to behavioral health and occupational therapy, even though I am a PT, I need in my village. And so I asked my friend and neighbor who is an OT to help with adaptations to improve safety and Dirk's quality of life. When Dirk was around 57, 58 years old, his dementia had progressed and he began to have nighttime seizures and incontinence. 
Previously, he was independent with all of his activities of daily living. We say ADLs, which means he could get up, get dressed, go into the bathroom, fix his breakfast, eat, but also many of his instrumental activities of daily living. He could ride the bus to work. Um, he could do chores, help neighbors. He volunteered with some of the community organizations. He was very verbal and worked as a stalker in a grocery store, but he left his job pre-pandemic over concerns of safety, decreased communication and judgment. He lived with me and our extended family in a co-housing community and I was his guardian. His wandering was becoming problematic and I was worried for his safety. Um, of, of these concerns, I was worried about falling especially when he was wandering. I knew also I needed to be aware of his skin integrity because of his incontinence. I also had concerns as his swallowing changed and he began to have choking episodes. He was also forgetting his glasses and refusing to wear his hearing aids. And we didn't always know if this was his dementia that was interfering or that he just couldn't see or hear well enough to understand what we were saying. Well, as Dirk was changing, I knew I needed to change and revamp our home environment. So here are some of the helpful physical therapy adaptations that we made. For his transfers, we eventually switched from a bed to, re to a recliner lift chair. And I used, utilized a swivel transfer disc when he couldn't get his feet to coordinate. And we explored various gait belts that were more comfortable than just a waist strap and we ended up settling on a vest that had handholds. For his ambulation and wandering, we met his companionship needs for walking always accompanied. Eventually a walker was determined to be too complicated for him and handholding was accepted by him. I really liked it and it was effective as a safety measure. He also slept in our room so that we could be more aware of him getting up at night or if he had a seizure. With respect to his sensory issues, we needed to reframe wearing his glasses, pun intended. I would say things like, hey buddy, here are your cowboy glasses. All of the ranchers wear them. We didn't push the hearing aid issue. Um, and like Mo um, suggested earlier, we really worked on our communication strategies, like always having face-to-face -face contact, speaking slowly and clearly, incorporating more light physical prompts, and less complicated verbal directions. So, and now more of the OT perspective from Monica. Thanks, Tracy. So if you're wondering what might be wording that you could use to uh, request in orders for occupational therapy in a situation like with Dirk, you could express something like uh, Dirk is having trouble or perhaps I as a care partner am having trouble with the hygiene, he's struggling with eating, Maybe it's something like toileting. So these are all some of the occupations where there's a challenge that you can have the help of an occupational therapist to address. So more specifically in dirt situations surrounding hygiene um, or even like toileting and eating, I wanna kindly empower you to remember that you can help to request orders for any of us, in this case situation for an occupational therapist to come and evaluate Dirk during the actual occupation of eating or perhaps toileting or wherever the challenge is. And in Tracy's situations, you heard that she actually did reach out and had an occupational therapist come on site to be able to, to provide more custom recommendations. Another adaptation is to begin using a timed voiding schedule so that Dirk is cued to use the bathroom with meaningful cues so like you just heard Tracy mention that he really resonates with being a cowboy and a rancher. So maybe instead of um, just waiting for him to ask to go to the bathroom, 30 minutes, 30 minutes after every meal, you could say like rancher break, like uh, and cue simply, but in a fun, meaningful way that it's time to just take a bathroom break. And then that the other recommended time slot, if you're going to use what we call timed voiding, or if you, ex if you um, suspect that someone is having difficulty timing 
when they go to the bathroom or perhaps knowing that they need to get to the bathroom in order to go in the toilet, which is very common, know that you can start with this external cue, which would relate to the you part of a triangle, like the caregiver part of the triangle. So you can say, hey, let's take a break. Let's all just take a break or let's take a, a rancher, rancher break. That can happen 30 minutes after a meal and then every two hours. Typically we find when people use that type of timed voiding, it helps you stay ahead of the bladder. Typically that's the most common one. Um, and oftentimes there may not be as many accidents in the briefs. Depending on the swallowing abilities, like Tracy mentioned that there were some swallowing challenges. So depending on the swallowing abilities and possibly input from a speech language pathologist, your occupational therapist may recommend adaptations to the consistency of foods um, that may need careful adjustment or size and textures. So an adaptation could be changing the placement or setup approaches that are used or to making it finger food to eliminate the need for silverware. And of course, most importantly, we wanna match dirt's preference for taste and texture, even in as much as possible as his abilities change. Liz, how about you? Um, so the behavior of concern for Dirk was wandering, and wandering can happen at any uh, stage of the disease, can happen at any time of the day, which makes this behavior one of the scariest for care providers, care partners. Um, we've all heard the stories and seen on TV about a person with dementia wandering away or driving away from their family home um, or care home, not ever to be located or found days later with no memory of what happened to them or where they were, uh, how they found their way home, who found them. So a person in our eyes may wander, but in their eyes, they're actually maybe going to see their parents who we know are no longer living. Um, maybe they're returning to a previous residence thinking it's still their home looking for a location that they know well, such as the neighbors or the bathroom in their own home, but not be able to find it. So from the behavior analytic side or lens, I would look at what time Dirk is wandering and try and find alternative uh, activities to occupy that time frame. So activities that are gonna exert some physical energy because wandering takes physical energy. So I want to replace that behavior with a safe behavior. Um, use ABC data collection to identify when Dirk is wandering and develop a plan based off the data gathered. So the example of Dirk, consider creating maybe a visual calendar for him so he knows what his day consists of. So in a minute, I'll show you what an ABC uh, data collection form might look like. I'd also wanna ensure that Dirk's needs are being met. And Monica just gave a great example of the timed voiding. So remember, it's us that needs to change our behaviors when we're supporting Dirk, because his behaviors and his needs are changing. So in order to, to help support him, we have to figure out how he's communicating, what he's communicating and adapt the way that we respond to that. So we could also set up a schedule for eating, toileting, exercising, relaxing, sleeping. So if it's a visual calendar, Dirk would be able to see this is what we're going to do. He also would be able to see these are activities that may happen, whether it happens in that order or not, it still gives him a visual cue to what options are. So also I would probably assist Dirk in locating what he's looking for. May have to use some therapeutic lies for redirection. For example, if Dirk is looking for mom and we know that she's already passed away, we can tell Dirk that his mother had to step out or run an errand and then turn the conversation into having Dirk tell us about mom. Favorite thing to do with mom, um, favorite thing that mom cooked for him, favorite vacation, anything that we can get him to do to talk about mom. And if the conversation goes long enough, you can easily transition into something like, let's get a snack or something similar. 
and we've changed the flow of Dirk's thoughts. We've been able to help him make that successful transition and also able to meet his need to either speak with his mom, speak about his mom, see his mom. So I'm gonna show you what an ABC data collection form might look like. So in this example of the ABC data collection form, my goal is to figure out why Dirk is wandering and what can I put in place to help keep him safe. So if Dirk starts wandering at 6.40 in the morning and doesn't stop until 7.22, he wandered for 42 minutes while waiting for staff to redirect him to a task he knows how to do, a transition to the next part of his day. So all we did was verbally redirect him to join his, and this would be if he was living in a group home, join his housemates in gathering their lunches for the day program. But that's 42 minutes of Dirk not being engaged in his life, not being engaged in his day. So looking for something to fill that 42 minutes is, is preferable. Granted, in this example, Dirk is only wandering in his home, not, not in the community where there may be extra dangers, but everyone likes to be engaged in their life. So finding something to fill that voided space or that empty space will help keep Dirk present and in the moment. The second one is happened at 718. So he took in the evening, he took his 7 p.m. medication and he wandered from the bathroom to the backyard until about 815. So that's an hour and 15 minutes. So with him wandering to the bath, the bathroom, maybe he is somehow communicating that or just by wandering that he needs to use the restroom and may just need that verbal prompt okay, go ahead and use the bathroom. Maybe he's going to the backyard because when he was growing up and they went camping, when you go camping, guys pee in the forest. So maybe he's going back and forth to the bathroom, to the backyard to communicate he needs to use the bathroom. But if we finally either pick that up just through observation and knowing Dirk well, we can prompt him to use the bathroom. In this example, I verbally prompted him to brush his teeth before bed. He did that and then went to bed. So he knew that after he takes his meds, the next thing in his, in his mind that we do is brush teeth. So back and forth, back and forth to brush teeth. So it really is just observation, knowing the person. By doing the ABC data collection, we have a, a running log of what's happening and especially if you're uh, working in a group home or um, any congregate setting, the more data you have, the easier it is to support someone the way they need to be supported. If Tracy, Mo, and I all work in the group home and I don't write down what Dirk was doing or how I responded, and then Tracy doesn't do it, and Mo comes in and she can't figure out why Dirk is pacing uh, back and forth after his medication, that's our fault. And we've failed Dirk and failed to be able to provide him supports simply by failing to write something down. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't have to be on a form. It can just be you know, on a notepad, however you wanna do it. But communication amongst the support team that directly work with Dirk is really what's gonna make a difference for him. Okay, Mo, hope in 60. And we've timed this before, she can't do it in 60, so don't hold her to it. Thank you. So you've heard a, a little bit about COPE um, in other parts of this presentation, but I wanted to give you just uh, a few other details. And please know also that there are a variety of in-home skilled programs that are covered by insurance. Um, so though I'm gonna talk about COPE briefly, um, there are other programs like Skills to Care, TAP or Tailored Activity Program, um, regular in-home health kind of, it counts as an in-home skilled program. So I'm gonna give you a couple details about a very specific type, but again, know that there are a variety. So COPE 
is an in-home program of four to 12 sessions that offers a problem-solving approach that follows a thorough assessment of the person living with dementia, the care partner, and the environment at home. This is completed by a COPE-trained occupational therapist and is supported in the original research by a COPE-trained nurse. However, locally um, in Mesa, Arizona, we are using a COPE-trained physician assistant. COPE stands for Care of the Older Person in Their Environment and was developed at Drexel University. Where many approaches are using only a drug or pharmaceutical approach, COPE uses a strengths-based, family-focused, problem-solving approach. Oakwood Creative Care in Mesa, Arizona has gained access to the COPE program thanks to a federal grant from the Administration for Community Living that was awarded in 2021 and is actively working on strategies for easier access and insurance coverage for any families in need of it. In case you are just joining us in this COPE program, studied benefits for the person living with dementia may include supporting and maintenance of daily function, reduction of behavioral and psychological symptoms, increased engagement, pleasure, and positive affect. For family caregivers, benefits may include improved well-being, reduction in depressive symptoms and distress, enhanced confidence in using activities and improved health. If you want more information, refer to the handouts from the conference. So now let's circle back and show you some specific adaptive tools you can use or ask one of us more about later. So Liz, I'll kick it back to you. Just to give everyone a, a idea, the pictures that are on this slide, that's all Tracy and Dirk. So since we talked so much about Dirk, we wanted to make sure that he had a presence. Okay, the toolbox. Each profession has their own toolbox of assessments, equipment, processes, to reach the end goal, but you may be surprised at how we complement each other. For example, an OTPT and BCBA can all work together on a goal, an activity of uh, daily living goal like eating. An OT may suggest an adaptive fork or spoon to increase independence in eating. PT may suggest the same thing, focusing on range of motion, where a BCBA may also suggest it for decreasing sensory input from a metal fork to a padded one. So all of us working on the same goal in different ways, but all of us using the same tool. So same scenario, the OT may uh, suggest the fork to increase independence in eating. A PT may suggest a raised seat to allow the person to get on and off the chair easier at the dining table. And a BCBA may suggest using a timer that alerts the person to meal time, even if it's used as, as a countdown. Uh, transitions are difficult for the folks that we support with or without dementia typically. So just having a, a countdown may be enough to, to support safe eating. So we're all working on the same thing, just different parts of it. We're gonna share a few examples of equipment that you may see one of us use or suggest so you can get a better idea of typical equipment for each profession. Just remember that multiple professions may use the same tools just from different toolboxes. So the first one is Mo. Thank you, Liz. As we've been discussing, there are different causes for why a task or occupation may become challenging. In every case, the environment can be part of the reasoning. So here are some common examples of environmental adaptations you can make or that an occupational therapist may, you work with may, rec may recommend to you. So I cannot emphasize enough that these are not meant to be one size fits all adaptations. Each person and situation will require careful consideration. But here are a few common examples of environmental adaptations from an OT. So on the far left, you'll notice a nosy cup which helps to compensate for challenges in leaning the head back when drinking and keeping it, the person as independent as possible with the occupation of drinking. A tub bench, so the next item in, or a shower bench with adjustable legs helps to compensate for weakness 
um, or having to step over a tub where it's uneven and also helps to keep them engaged in bathing. Um, this particular bench has screw instead of uh, the pop legs, like the metal legs. So this one can be actually really nice when you have a bathtub that you're like, there's no way we're gonna get the chair to be actually even across. But this particular Carex tub bench, it's pretty amazing that you can typically get it quite level so that when someone's sitting down to enter the tub more easily, they don't have to step over the um, edge of the tub. They can just sit down and slide straight over into the shower. The next item over um, is a high contrast toilet seat. So this can help to compensate for low vision um, if someone is having difficulty hitting a target and also helps to keep their independence a little bit longer. At the last item on this particular slide, uh, a blue shirt may look like just a normal shirt from here, but it's actually a magnetic button up shirt. So this can help to compensate for difficulties that there may be with buttoning. Let's say perhaps someone loves being in a button up shirt for the look of it. Perhaps they're a very high fashion individual and do not want to change their fashion just because things may have gotten difficult putting buttons together. So there are options such as this adaptive clothing that can be possibilities. And Tracy, I'm gonna kick it to you for some peachy things, but will you bridge over and actually share the story about the adaptive pants for dirt? Okay. Yeah, oh, sure. So um, we mentioned that Dirk really saw himself as a cowboy and he loved to dress the part. Um, he would wear blue jeans and a Western shirt and his boots almost every day. And um, as his abilities to dress himself changed or I needed to help him more, I still wanted him to be able to pick and choose and have the clothes he wanted to wear. And we were able to go online to a adaptive clothing um, online store that sold blue jeans that um, are essentially open in the back with a flap. At that point, he was wearing pull-ups and I could slip the blue jeans on and snap them in the front and zip them. But essentially from when he was sitting, no one could tell that he wasn't really in um, his regular 501s. But when he stood up to transfer to a toilet, we could just flip the back up and put down. And we did buy quite a few really nice checkered shirts that he was happy with about that were easier for him to put on from that same catalog. So I was really appreciative that we had those options so that Dirk could maintain his personality and joy in being a cowboy. So a PT may use these tools from, from the toolbox to facilitate safe mobility for our family members, but also for ourselves, because uh, we don't want to injure uh, our, you know, we don't want to have an injury while we're helping others move about safely. And each of these tools or types of equipment are chosen to keep folks as independent for as long as possible without compromising safety. For example, gate belts or gate vest, as I chose for Dirk and I can be held while transferring or walking with someone and come into play if a person starts to lose their balance or missteps and you can gently keep them on track. We used a pivot disc with Durkee, but sometimes a Hoyer lift is needed to help folks get out of bed. And it's really, it's so very important that people with dementia continue to be included in the home and family activities and not get stuck in their rooms in bed. Short bed rails are a great way to help people get in and out of bed themselves. And longer bed rails can be installed to slow down or discourage getting up when it's not safe to do so. And Monica went over some of the bathroom transfers, but um, there's so many options out there and the transfers can be arranged in small spaces such as this setup of sliding from the toilet right into the tub. And now we get to go to Liz who gets to show us some fun tools. I get the colorful slide. <laughs> so when we were talking about Dirk, I mentioned the possibility about using a visual schedule. So if you look at the bottom right in uh, blue and green, and then there's a striped one 
which is yellow and blue and pink, those are examples of uh, visual schedules. So someone can see exactly what is going on. These are super easy to make. I do always suggest instead of using the, whether I'm working with someone with uh, dementia or not, that you actually use pictures of the actual item as opposed to clip art or cartoons. If we're wanting someone to, to stay present, then a cartoon isn't gonna help. Seeing an actual picture of their toothbrush is gonna be a better prompt than a cartoon uh, toothbrush. So when I practiced this the other day with Mo and Tracy, it didn't happen, so we'll find out. Um, if a uh, Alexa device for is, is available, use that for prompts. We talked about uh, Dirk using the restroom or mealtime you can actually set the device up to do reminders. I have a dog that takes medication at 5A and 5P, and that's the reminder that we have set up at those two times is to remind us to get the medication. So you could actually set this up for every two hours to say cowboy, cowboy bathroom break or ranchers take a rest. And then every two hours, that's going to prompt that. So that's going to maintain Dirk's independence. You're going to have to prompt him less. It's, you know, you've got to, got to weigh whether you're comfortable with technology helping you support someone or if you want to do it yourself. But this is a, a great way where you're not having to always prompt somebody. So if someone picks their skin, these aprons are a really neat idea. There's all kinds of stuff on it to be able to manipulate. The fidget spinner, or well, this one's more than a spinner, up in the upper right also gives hands something to do. With the apron, you can find on Amazon or a variety of other uh, therapeutic websites, like boards or pillows that have all kinds of things to manipulate on them. The top picture is a box of fun. It's all sensory items. So we found that different items, we could, we could use all these sensory items either as options for sensory input, or we could put them in a box for rummaging. So folks with dementia will occasionally like to just go through things, whether it's a silverware drawer or a sewing kit or, uh, toolbox, looking at something that would be safe for them to rummage through could be a bunch of sensory items. Um, on the top left is a preference assessment. <laughs> Excuse me. So with a preference assessment, you would just have a few items that you would set out and look to see what that person gravitates to, because that's something that they're willing or that motivates them. People, dementia or not, our, our preferences, our motivators change over time. So this is something that would probably have to be done, you know, it could be every week, depending on the, the stage of dementia that the person is in. And the last one that is on the bottom left is, oops, there we go. The last one that's on the bottom left is a alarm. So if someone is wandering, just putting these alarms up throughout the house, it's, it's not a camera. It just lets you know if someone passes a uh, certain point, like the hallway or the door or something. Okay, so what does all of this mean? We're not alone, or you're not alone. There are supports available, including professions such as OT, ABA, PT. Uh, therapies can work together to support the member, client, loved one, just as we've provided examples about how we complement each other. So it often does take a multi-professional team to accomplish goals. We're going to st always start with the, the member, the client, the loved one, uh, families member, PCP, to ask for referrals. Uh, if the member does receive services from DDD, let the support coordinator know what services and supports you need so they can start looking for those and start putting out referrals for those services. 
Uh, we always advise asking for help from someone that already has the services so you can figure out the best way to get them. There's no reason to recreate a process if someone's already been successful. It could just be uh, words to use to get something funded. Uh, Mo pointed out earlier some, some tips on what to say in order to get an assessment approved. It's, you're, not, you're not lying about it, you just are using the, the keywords that usually trigger something. And then remember to be an advocate for what you know will support you and the member. Be that squeaky wheel. And because this is kind of a new space, like uh, Dr. Bishop mentioned at the beginning in the keynote, this isn't something that 20, 30 years ago that we had to consider as far as someone with IDD having dementia. So if we as care providers and family members weren't thinking about it, neither were the professionals, neither were the, the primary care providers. So letting these professions know that this is a problem, that you do need support, will kind of open up their eyes to how, how services that are designed specifically for seniors and those that are designed specifically for people with IDD can work together to create a cohesive system that can support a member that's diagnosed with both. Um, I don't think we're going to have time to get into a mirror. So, but he he'll be on uh, the slide deck that you get. Mo, is there Mo or Tracy? Is there anything you want to highlight on a mirror at all? Yeah, I'm going to just jump in really quick. Um, yeah. So, with a mirror, long story short, if the unique parts of this case study were that it was a sister and um, she was the main caregiver. Amir was living at home with her with Down syndrome in dementia. And some of the things that we thought were interesting or, or unique about this particular situation that we wanted to emphasize was getting medical support. Um, so in this particular case, um, one of the challenges was getting up multiple times at night, difficulty urinating into the toilet and taking medications. So an example of um, actually using COPE was to initiate some blood and urine testing to help rule out things like um, either a vitamin deficiency, but especially something like a urinary tract infection. Um, and even surrounding the, uh, the past medical history, other professionals can help see if there may be uh, an interaction of a medication such as uh, like a Lasix, or like a fluid removing medication that may be causing interruptions to sleep, but really it's actually because of a change in a medication. And a, a professional that can also look at the full medication list can also give an opinion if there may be something called polypharmacy, or perhaps there's just an interaction of medications that has accidentally begun to happen. Um, Tracy or Liz, was there anything else we wanted to highlight? I know we're so passionate. In. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes the simplest solution is the best. And I think a PT referral would be helpful since Amir is becoming less active to improve his daily mobility and well being. So, um, like I said, simple is best. Sometimes we'd look into the activities that Amir enjoys already to increase his movement. Does he like walking? Could he be walking a dog? How about impromptu dancing to his favorite music? What about group sports that he could enjoy with family and friends? And PT would likely go in and recommend adaptive measures with each of those activities to ensure safety and success, something that he not only liked to do, but could do, and enjoyment. How about you, Liz, some highlights um, from the behavior aspect? I, with the behavior of concern being resistance to care, um, I'm definitely going to suggest doing ABC data, finding out what part of the what part of the care in Mir is resisting, and then trying to come up with ways to make that more pleasurable for him. Whether it's put, playing music while the shower is going, um, making those transitions earlier, using some sensory tools if the if touch is is something that's bothering him. 
So really, I guess, starting with the ABC data and finding out when it's happening, it, maybe it's a specific caregiver. Maybe it's the uh, person that comes in to do habilitation hours or uh, provides respite. So his sister, <laughs> people, I am so sorry, doorbell. I'm going to move on. So thanks, Mo, if you want to take it, I don't know who's out there. So this is just a slide to cover some definitions of uh, common acronyms you may hear us or hear people using. Um, so know that, again, these will all be shared with you. We're mindful of time. We're incredibly grateful for your time. And with that, we'll bring it to a close. Thank you so much. So the references are not only on the slide deck, but they're also going to be on the resource list that will be sent out at the end of the conference. It should have resources from all the presenters today. So thank you for spending an hour with us. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that insightful presentation. Uh, now we're going to be moving directly into the next Me in a Minute session. So I will hand it over to that team. Thank you. So we'll start with the labyrinth picture. Um, the next four me in a minute exercises, we'll do two right now and two later uh, in the morning. So the next four were developed by an international organization called Capacitar. And Capacitar in Spanish means to empower or to encourage or bring, bring to life. And for almost 35 years now, Capacitar has been teaching these simple practices of healing to communities all around the world. They developed many of these exercises that anyone can do. You don't need to be a professional, a health professional, to um, have them done to you or to do them um, to restore balance and relieve stress. Um, we hope you'll enjoy uh, participating and we invite you to um, practice each one of them. We only have a minute or so with each of them. And uh, I really want to encourage you to practice the breathing technique that Mo demonstrated and we practiced earlier during these capacitor sessions. So uh, you received a PDF with um, these fancy labyrinths on them. But I encourage if you don't have one in front of you to just um, draw a spiral. I don't think that's uh, focusing well. Just a spiral on a sheet of paper that you can um, trace with your fingers during this activity. Um, and I think the other thing we're gonna try to do is pay, play some music. Um, so I hope everybody's had an experience of walking the labyrinth. And if you haven't, I encourage that to happen. But uh, you know, labyrinths aren't always available for us to walk and many healing benefits of this practice can be received through walking with our fingers. So with your index finger, simply follow the labyrinth path, just like you were walking. You do it very slowly and mindfully, um, calming and centering and relaxing while you do this. So I'm going to put on some music and hopefully by now you've drawn a spiral and we're just going to practice this. It's a very quiet um, activity. Um, don't rush through it and don't be judgmental of your thoughts or your breathing while you're doing it. And I'll just start.
there. So I hope you get an idea of the pause in life that this might provide and be able to create your own labyrinth or utilize um, the PDF printouts. We're gonna flow right into the second, or the, it's actually the third me in a minute. And it's the EFT or the emotional freedom technique. Some of you may know it as tapping. Um, the EFT was developed by Dr. Gary Craig. It's very useful in unlocking and healing strong emotions, fears, anxiety, phobias, as well as for alleviating body symptoms, pain, headaches, and overall uh, lethargy. Um, tapping or Pressing acupressure points connected with channels or, or meridians of energy can move blocked energy in congested areas and promote the healthy flow of energy in the body. So not necessary, but one thing you could do would be to think of an issue you're having. Um, if you're aware of some current stress or anxiety, you could keep that in mind when you do these um, tapping points. And I will lead you through the little body diagram. We, uh, you tap with your index and your long finger, um, except for where there's single points. And you wanna tap nine or 12 times. Uh, and you can repeat this cycle two or three times. So we'll just start. And again, just take a deep breath. I love the breath in through the nose. In PT, we say breathe, uh, breathe in, you smell the roses and blow out the birthday candles. So just quietly, again, um, there's no wrong way to breathe. There's no wrong thoughts. If you get distracted, just bring yourself back. So we'll start here with the first one. Go to the second point. third point. The six is a little lower on the trunk here. Seven onto the clavicles. And the last one is a point on the outside of your hand by the small finger. And you're just gonna tap this a few times and you think to yourself or say out loud, in spite of the fact that I have this situation, I'm okay and I accept myself. And so I'm going to repeat this. I won't talk this time and we'll just go through and I'll let you be with your thoughts and your breathing. In spite of the fact that I have this situation, we're all going to be okay. Thank you. Lizzie, you're muted. 
Sorry about that. Um, now we're going to be moving into our next short break. So um, feel free again to step away. The next presentation will start in 10 minutes at 1035 Arizona time. Thank you.
Okay, it is 1035, which means we're going to be moving into our next session. This next presentation is titled Finding Joy in Life as We Approach End of Life. And it will be featuring Maribeth Gallagher as the presenter and Kathy Bishop as a discuss discussant. So I will hand it over to the presenting team. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Beth. My um, background is that I'm a nurse practitioner board certified in psychiatry with a doctoral degree in nursing. Most importantly, I was a family member of someone with dementia, so accompanied her along that journey from pre-diagnosis to death. I serve as the director of the dementia program at Hospice of the Valley. We also have a program, though, for any stage of any type of dementia. And these individuals and their care partners have been my greatest and most noble of teachers. So my intention is to share with you some of the things that I've learned from them and the evidence of what are best practices for advanced dementia. Dr. Kathy Bishop will be joining me. Dr. Kathy, some of the folks um, were in here earlier. Do you want to do a brief introduction while I bring up my slide? Or not. All right, then how about we get started? Okay. So essentially, we're going to be looking for, you know, the essentials of taking care of someone with the advanced stage of any type of dementia, the core elements that would be included in a care plan, and to look at some of the evidence in order to understand how do we map maximize comfort and optimize quality of life for individuals who have reached this stage of dementia. I wanted to start off with a picture of the brain just to, for us to appreciate that Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia are progressive neurodegenerative conditions. So over time, the disease will hit more and more parts of the brain, and those brain cells will die. And so in this picture on the left, what you're seeing is the atrophy, the shrinkage of the brain that normally accompanies the advanced stage of dementia. So when we think about our brains, every part of our brain has a job to do. And then it works in collaboration with the other parts of the brain in symphony, if you will. So if we get the advanced stage of dementia, we still have all of the same needs that we had earlier and when we didn't have dementia, only now, because those parts of our brain are gonna be impacted, we'll have great difficulty meeting our own needs in the way that we do now. And so the care is gonna to have to shift so that we anticipate the, the needs of the individual. This individual in the advanced stage is very, very vulnerable. Here's the good news though. You and I are experts in being human beings. We know what makes us comfortable. We know what's unpleasant. And when I talk about this, I'm talking holistically, body, mind, and spirit. So you already are experts in understanding what creates a good life. And so now we're just gonna interpret this through the lens of how do we apply it for someone with advanced dementia. So what we're talking about here is Dementia will show up in people differently in the earlier and the moderate stages. But by the time we get to the advanced stage, almost all of the individuals will have a profound continuation of decline of the previous symptoms that they were showing. We'll see incontinence of bowel and bladder. We'll start to see more and more difficulties with swallowing in spite of the tips and the tricks that we've been using along the way. And we'll start to see impaired movement and balance. So this person is really going to be slowing down. Their gait's going to be unstable if they're able to stand at all. At end of life, in that last six months that we're looking in hospice, usually the person is in a bed or a chair and they can't get up unaccompanied safely. Their verbal abilities have been diminished to very short phrases, if saying anything at all. That's just their verbal ability of communication, okay? We'll see that they'll start to get more and more infections. And this is telling us biology is taking over. Everything that we've done medically perhaps has been successful up to now. Biology is taking over. The person is very frail. 
Their immune system is not as robust as it once did. And the body, in spite of its best efforts, is having difficulty fighting infections. We're gonna see more swallowing difficulties and this may show up as silent aspiration, meaning in the middle of the night, maybe some saliva will go down the person's airway and our saliva is loaded with bacteria. And so because of all of the other factors, it sets us up for an aspiration pneumonia, which is very commonly the cause of death for someone with dementia. So I just wanted to sort of hone in here on the stage that we're talking about. I also wanted to share some of the literature with you that you might find interesting. Most people with dementia who are in the earlier stages report that when they reach the advanced stage, they would want to be kept safe and comfortable, but essentially they go, when it's my time, it's my time. Don't prolong that last stage doing all sorts of stuff that's not going to pay off in order to keep me comfortable. Most proxy decision makers who will be speaking for the person with dementia in the advanced stage report that comfort is the primary goal of care when the person's in the advanced stage. So again, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's what's right for you. So in spite of the fact that everybody seems or the majority of people seem to say comfort's my highest goal, here's what we're really seeing in the real world. We're seeing that people who have advanced dementia have fewer completed advanced directives, meaning again, human rights issue. I wanna determine how this plays out. And me, we, my, we don't have the documentation or perhaps even the ongoing conversations earlier up stream to say what's most important to me? How do I want this to play out? Because again, no right or wrong answer. What's right for you? We also see that these are the folks at end of life who have more distressing symptoms that we could actually be doing something about. It's low hanging fruit. So there's a lot more suffering going on. These individuals also, according to the research, have more costly and burdensome interventions that pose little to no clinical benefit, again, causing more suffering. We see that these are individuals that are more often in the emergency department and, and the hospitals. That, that when they are in the hospitals, it's longer stays. And whether they went into the hospital for a good reason or not, there's usually higher mortality rates after that. And that's not to slam hospital workers, but they don't have this, the training and the time ability to slow down and to give the care that a person in the advanced stage of dementia usually requires. So I've told you what people want. I've shown you what people actually receive. And so it raises the critical question, how do we bridge the gap between the care that people say they want and what they actually receive? Well, when we look at the literature and we look at our clinical experiences, we see that these are some of the factors that can determine the difference, right? Now, first again, here we are with advanced directives, right? So we want to figure out Will the person in the advanced stage want resuscitation or allow natural death? Will they want a feeding tube? Will they want IVs and all of these different decisions? And if we have time or if you're interested later, I'd certainly be happy to talk about each one of those decisions to help you consider the informed decision. In other words, CPR is three times less likely to be successful in a person with advanced dementia. That rare individual who actually is resuscitated will more than likely wind up in an ICU, intubated and restrained, and probably die within the next 24 hours. Well, that's really different than the resuscitation I see on TV where I get up and I'm talking and everything. I want to make informed decisions about what's going to play out. Also, advanced directives can change for a person. What I want done in my early stage of dementia is quite different, perhaps, from what I want in the advanced stage. So these are ongoing conversations, and it's never too early to start. We want to align all of the treatment decisions with the goals of care. Now, the goals of care are changing, so we need to keep revisiting the treatment decisions. And here's a big one. I love that everything that I've heard everybody say so far this morning, I'm building on, I'm in alignment with. You know, we just heard about polypharmacy. Sometimes, especially in advanced dementia, we have to look at each medication that the person has been prescribed for a good reason, 
But now we have to determine, is it helping or is it harming the person? We need to look at the risks and the benefits and we wanna simplify the medications. First of all, just for the swallowing ability alone, right? So I'm gonna stop for a minute because when you're the care partner of someone with dementia and I'm talking about de-prescribing, about simplifying medications, it can feel like, oh, are we giving up? Oh, is this neglect? We're not doing for them what we do for somebody else. No, it's not that. Based on the evidence, we find that actually some of these medications that we've been administering before are no longer working for the person and are actually working against them. Because now that the organs are changing, they're not filtering out the medication. There could be um, side effects that the person's experiencing, but now they don't have the ability to verbally communicate that to you. There could be drug-drug interactions causing this chemical soup you know. So we also want to eliminate any unnecessary interventions. You know, when we reach certain ages, there's certain screenings we're supposed to have. And at, at some point with advanced dementia, all of these are just so burdensome for the individual and sometimes for the care partners. So we have to think about every decision we're making in the context of the larger issue, which, which is the person has a terminal neurodegenerative condition. Also, what we want to do as best as possible is keep these folks out of the emergency departments and hospitals whenever possible. The reason, again, because in advanced dementia, I'm processing more slowly. And meanwhile, in the hospital, people are moving very quickly, but I need this kind of pacing. People are still using verbal language instead of visual cues and other ways of communicating. And so it can be I'm having so much trouble in, within advanced dementia, deciphering and interpreting everything that's going on around me. I'm doing the very best I can, but the world is spinning by so quickly. It's really scaring me. It's putting me in a very vulnerable and anxious place. And then when I go to protect myself, as somebody comes near me and grabs me, perhaps, or that's the way I'm perceiving it, I may push them away. And then I get called combative when in actuality, I'm being self-protective because the number one job of the brain, even for people with advanced dementia, is to keep the body safe. So those are some of the considerations. It's person-directed. Whatever the person has decided they want, we're gonna revise that care plan as best we can to maximize their comfort and body, mind and spirit and to live well, to optimize well-being, which really is possible in advanced dementia. As Dr. Maya Angelou says, when we know better, we do better. So, so some of the things we're gonna do is we need to start to anticipate more and more what the needs of the individual are because they're no longer going to be able to verbally communicate it to us. But again, here's the good part. You can anticipate your person's needs. You know what they need. We're also going to liberalize the diet. It is party time. In case anybody's been on a restricted diet or glucose restricted, et cetera, et cetera, it's party time. And instead of going into meals, because meal times can be very fatiguing and overwhelming, we're really going to start to graze throughout the day. We want to adjust our communication techniques as been already spoken about, where we're going to slow down. We're going to use fewer words. We're going to use a lot more visual cues because the number one way the brain takes in information is not through the ears, it's through the eyes. We're going to customize the approaches to that which is culturally sensitive, um, sensitive to what the individual will um, be able to feel so respected and be able to feel a sense of real connection. You know, some of them are just as simple as, by the time I'm in a bed or a chair, it means every time I interact with somebody, I have to look up at them. And when my eyeballs look up, it increases my sense of vulnerability. So what we wanna do is we wanna get at or below the eye level of the person. Kindness and respect is the language we will always understand. And so my physical presence, the way I stand before you, is going to be really important. Say much more than my words, huh? And we want to provide meaningful engagement. 
We want to provide sensory pleasures. We want to provide a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. As Dr. Bishop said initially, which is a great lesson we learn every day in hospice, until I draw my last breath, I want to feel a sense of reciprocity with the world around me. I want to feel that I matter, that I belong. And you see, you, you feel me, you see me, you hear me. And of course, what we also want to do is we want to seek supportive services for the caregivers. Again, a lot of advanced dementia care, it's very, very little medical care. It's just really about how do we show up as excellent human beings, compassionate and skillful in our ways to care for these individuals. A couple of medical words though I wanna say, because as a dementia caregiver, I wish somebody had taught me this. One, delirium is an acute confusional state that could happen to any human being. However, some of the highest risk groups for developing delirium, this acute confusional state, happen to be people who have dementia, so chronic confusional state. And you might say, well, how am I supposed to notice acute confusion in somebody who's chronically confused? And my key takeaway for you is when you see a change in behavior or function or increased falling or suddenly visual hallucinations or paranoid delusions, if that comes on in a matter of hours or a couple of days or this past week, that isn't the natural progression of dementia. That is something else. So if the person hasn't you know, been um, transported Bird recently, because that could certainly pull the rug out from underneath me, or if my personal caregiver hasn't changed recently, if life is going on pretty much the way it has, and suddenly you're seeing changes, please report that to your provider, because that could be telling us that the person's developing a delirium. And acute confusional states, delirium, have underlying causes like infection, like urinary tract infection, like a reaction to a medication, like fecal impaction, just pain, so many reasons. And so we want to call that to the attention of providers who might be able to help you with that. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing I want to really say when I think about advanced dementia on what you need to know is pain is terribly underrecognized and undertreated in people with dementia. On any given day, the research says that people with moderate to advanced dementia, at least 50 to 80% of them have significant levels of pain. Wow, we can do better than that, right? Why would they have increased risk for pains? Well, of course, as we age, we develop more medical conditions. Also, if your person's still walking around, are they bumping into things? Are they possibly having falls or accidents or injuries that maybe you're not aware of, and yet that might hurt like the Dickens? Meanwhile, you see that they might be a little distressed, but you don't know why, and they might not have the ability, A, to recognize that this thing that's bothering them is called pain, and then B, to have the verbal ability to say it to you. When we see increased distress, behaviors, increased confusion, reduced func physical function and quality of life, oftentimes pain is one of the factors. So let's look a little bit more closely. I do ask the person if they're having pain and I have techniques for that. In addition to that, what's considered best practice is a tool called the pain ad, pain in advanced dementia. You can, um, get it for free here, and simply using the skill of observation, which we're all excellent at, to look for these signs, and it's, it's marked zero to 10. And at Hospice of the Valley, if a person with advanced dementia has a score of four or greater, we know that the RN case manager is gonna get involved to use non-pharmacological and pharmacological methods to bring that score down, because hum comfort in body, mind, and spirit is the highest goal. Just also want to give you another little clinical pearl though. So PRN, when I prescribe a medication, I can prescribe a medication of give every eight hours, or I can say give PRN as needed. PRN, we joke in the dementia world that PRN when it comes to pain medicines for a person with dementia often sadly stands for patient receives nothing because it, re it depends on others to recognize that the person's having pain. So if you think about your person holistically, there's any reasons why they might have pain, their knees, their shoulders, their back, you know, oftentimes it's considered best practice to do a trial of Tylenol, acetaminophen, three times a day for at least a week. 
And then I check in with the families. I say, is a little better, a little worse, just the same. And oftentimes at the very least, it's a little better and the person sleeps better, et cetera. But please discuss that with your provider, okay? To make sure that the person can tolerate it. All right. So the overall goal is comfort in body, mind, and spirit. The picture on the left in sepia is Dr. Alzheimer's first patient. And in this picture, she was 52 to 54 years old. And boy, she became the poster girl for, for Alzheimer's disease, how forlorn. Meanwhile, over here, look, you don't even know which person has dementia because you see people who are comfortable. They have a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, a sense of love and joy. We determine the difference between these faces. And it's all about relationships. It's all about connections. We hold the key to the quality of life for people living with dementia. Now, the good news is, even if my thinker is broken, you know, the way that I was able to think before, my feeler is still working. So I can't fix the way a person thinks, but I can change the way a person feels. Dr. Maya Angelou also said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so we're going to shift the focus on everything dealing with feelings. And when we talk about feelings, we're talking about our limbic system in the brain. And our limbic systems are powerfully influenced by our five senses. One person's musical heaven, for instance, is another person's musical hell. So we have to customize our approach. And I'm building upon what the other speakers are, have already said. So at Hospice of the Valley, when a person comes on with advanced dementia, they can't tell me about themselves. But we have a form that we use, and there's many types of forms. But in here, we really want to know, who is this person? What matters most to them? How do they identify where is their joy? What is their favorite smell, their form of touch, music, spiritual practices? All of this is really important for us to know and will guide us. So let's just talk just a couple of seconds on the senses. Listen, who here has not put a piece of food in their mouth to make themselves feel better, right? And when we do that, how quickly does it work? Right away, quicker than IV push medication. Also, when we were infants and we first got on the planet, the way that we learned how to self-soothe the first way was we sucked our thumb. Oral stimulation can be really soothing to the brain. And when a person gets into the advanced stage, they don't possess the ability any longer to regulate their emotions, to soothe themselves, to calm down, to filter this uh, frustration and anger that they have so that it's not doesn't come out into the world. I lose my ability to regulate my emotions. I'm doing the best I can. This is biology taking over. But the way you can help soothe me from the outside in is through using the senses. So perhaps giving me a snack. We know that soft and sweet, usually in advanced dementia, is the most powerful. Think about it. As soon as that tongue gets sugar on it, it releases dopamine in the reward centers of the brain, you know? Same thing with touch. How many of our folks who are institutionalized in, with advanced dementia are dying from failure to thrive syndrome? They're getting custodial touch, right? We're cleaning them, we're keeping them skin, you know, from having breakdown, but they're not getting that meaningful touch. And also, when I lose my ability to use verbal language, can't the squeeze of a hand and a hug and a kiss say so much more without placing any cognitive demand on me? So here, this is what you already know what to do. I'm just taking it maybe from the back of your head to the front going, oh yeah, I can do this. So we're gonna be talking about high touch, low tech approaches. Smell can change the way we feel right away. As a matter of fact, the way we're wired through this first cranial nerve, the signal goes right to our limbic system. Smells change the way we feel before they even change the way we think. So think of all of the smells that your person finds interesting or pleasant or is a touchstone for a pleasant moment or a pleasant person in their life. Sight, again, the number one way we take in information if we still have sight, okay? And so think about, we have the world at our fingertips right now. We have smartphones and laptops that can take us anywhere in the universe on YouTube. 
or we can simply maybe go out in the backyard and take in nature. There's so many things that we can look at or pictures of me in my younger years or the people that I love. Sound, my master's and doctoral work was using music to prevent or minimize agitation and dementia. So we know that some of the last, if the person does have hearing ability, that some of the last abilities we have is hearing. And interestingly enough, some of the last parts of the brain to deteriorate in illnesses that affect the brain are parts that process music. So I bet that you've seen videos where people with dementia who haven't been responding to anything else suddenly are sparked by music that's familiar to them. People who haven't been able to speak can sing. So many ways that music can have potential. And spiritual, again, my patients have been my greatest and most noble of teachers. And I've seen how spiritual practices that they invested in in their earlier years have paid off beyond how well I could ever give a scientific explanation for. And so the fact of hymns or prayers that are recited slowly or are recorded, but also I've learned that for those of us who love nature, I know that I've learned that a farmer needs to get out of the building. We need to put his John Deere cap on his head, let him feel the sun and the wind on his face, let him smell the grass, put his tootsies in the earth, and that's the best medicine. So as people have been already talking about, the environment makes a huge impact on the person with dementia as does our presence. Our presence is so, so powerful. We need to be accountable for the energy that we bring into the room and the way that we approach someone. So as the kids say, check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? We need to modify the surroundings. And you might think, oh no, I know what they like, but stay alert to the fact that they may be changing now. And the things that once were really pleasant, let's say the television on or a bunch of people in the room, at this point, the person's ability to process that information may be struggling. And so these things that have normally historically been working well for the person may now be overstimulating. So it's always good to stay fresh in the moment and evaluate. But that said, boredom. Some of our folks are just so bored. They're just blah, sitting there. And so how do we find that Goldilocks just right? just right, that sweet spot that matches their abilities with what we're providing for them. We have a communication technique that we always talk about, validate, connect, and redirect. People with dementia live in a world of no's, not intentionally, but no, let me do that for you. No, I can help you. No, please don't go out without anybody. You know, no, 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 no. And maybe even on the inside, they're experiencing, oh, I feel stupid. I can't do this. So how do we create a world of yes. And one of the ways is that we try never to use the word no. We try never to shake our head no, right? Because it's so invalidating that no matter what is coming at us, that we meet it with a yes. And that we step into the person's world. And you know, I don't know if you've ever danced like old fashioned danced with someone who's really good. And let's say you're not good, but they're so good at leading you that all of a sudden when you're dancing with them, you go, you know what? I'm better than I thought I was. But actually, it's because the leader is so proficient at what they do that you don't even feel like you're being led. And that is what we're going for when we're with a person with dementia, to help them dance, but not even feel like they're being led, that they're in control. So our technique is that no matter what a person with dementia says to us, we say yes. And we repeat what they said to us so that they feel seen, heard, and valued, because oftentimes they feel so invisible. And then we connect with saying, and I'd like to help you with that. How about we do that together? And then as you've heard before, we use that short attention span that the person has and that really short-term memory. And we take them on this journey with us and hope they're going to forget what that need was if we can't meet that need. So a person who says, I want to go home who already lives in their home. We can try thinking and reasoning, but that will probably fail miserably. And if so, instead we go, yes, you want to go home and I want to help you with that. How about we first get a real cold drink because it is so hot out and then you can start to move them through. All of this is to use redirection to make the brain a better offer. Number one job of the brain, keep the body alive. Number two job of the brain, let's find something that makes me feel good. 
I also want to say a word about the blessed care partners. We know that they have high morbidity and mortality rates. We know that they're experiencing ambiguous loss. So we provide classes for that, a very kind of complex type of grief. And we can't say, hey, just avoid stress, because that would sound pretty stupid, right? We can't stop the waves, but we absolutely can learn how to surf. We absolutely can cultivate resiliency. You know, caregivers that we provide classes for have said, you know, I still experience the stress, but I, I handle it better. And I also, as I, I catch myself moving into that rumination of worrying about what's next, 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 and I bring myself right back to the here and now, and I appreciate this person who's still with me in the way that they still are. We teach certain mindfulness practices like STOP. We take little stop signs and we put them in the house where the caregiver gets um, triggered more often than not. And we teach them this brief practice about when they see the, the stop sign, they remember to stop what they're doing, to take a couple of deep breaths in with a slower exhalation, which is turning on the parasympathetic nervous system, the tend and befriend part versus the fight, flight, or freeze part, just to observe what's going on here. And to remember that if they want to, if they're going to do the same thing they've always done, that's caused a resistance in the person, that that would be the definition of insanity. So to observe what's going on here and to proceed in a way that's going to be more effective. We talk about weaving mindfulness through, through the day because to say to somebody, hey, why don't you get in 15 minutes a day to meditate? That would be really good for you. They'd be like, do you know me? Do you know what my life is like? So instead, how do we weave it through the day so that if I'm doing dishes or I'm walking with the person, I can practice this. And I love the little um, practices that you've been sharing. And another one is that you can do with your person with dementia is taking your finger and you inhale as you come up and then you exhale as you go down and you're feeling it, you're seeing it and you're experiencing the breath. So you're incorporating different senses. And as we direct our attention on our senses, it pulls us out of our spinning thoughts and our anxiety. So it's time to talk about hospice, the last six months of life. And this is just a guesstimate, okay? But hospice is there for people, we focus on the whole person with a serious illness that's approaching the end of their life. And all of the treatments that we do are focused on comfort rather than curative, okay? And all of the things that have been, the person's been using before, certain medications, et cetera, we pause and we consider, is this helping or harming? Because we just wanna focus on what's helping at this point. Hospice professionals are trained experts focusing on symptom management and quality of life, body, mind, and spirit. It's provided wherever the person resides. It's not 24-hour, 24-7 care. We're available 24-7, but we go in to wherever the person resides. Many people confuse the term palliative care with hospice care. Palliative care means comfort care that can start at any stage of a chronic serious illness. Hospice is a form of palliative care that's specifically for the last six months of life. Dame Cicely Saunders, who founded Hospice, says, you matter because of who you are. You matter to the last moment of your life, and we will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but to also live until you die. That's the focus. It's living until you die. So what does hospice provide? Well, you can look here. It offers many services, and one of the richest things that we offer are the interdisciplinary team. Everybody brings different skills. We work together. So uh, for lack of time, I'm just going to continue moving through this. But remember, hospice is not only serving the patient. Hospice is serving the whole family, and family is a loosely defined by the people that we're serving. You are all entrusted to our care. We're going to be focusing in on each one of you, which is super important because how many times along the way has someone asked, how are you doing and how can we uplift you?
Also, you get bereavement services. These are skilled individuals for 13 months after the person dies to help you through this process. And at Hospice of the Valley, we have a specific bereavement group just for people who are dementia care partners because their experience, their grief experience can be different. So hospice is paid for by different insurance companies and Medicare, and they're all diseases that come into hospice have eligibility criteria, if you will. It's the federal government. So anyway, here's what it looks like. At this point, the person's unable to walk, bathe, dress independently. They speak few intelligible words. They're incontinent of bowel and bladder. They're steadily losing weight. And in the past six months to a year, we're starting to see that they're getting infections like pneumonia, kidney infections. We're starting to see skin breakdown, et cetera. Again, what we're looking at is holistic, but we're getting that impression that in spite of our best efforts, biology is taking over. This is the way we were created. When we look at the studies that say, so is hospice good for people with dementia? Well, first of all, it's gotta be a dementia capable hospice. Hospice was built on cancer care. So not all of them are practicing a dementia capable model, but the dementia capable hospices, the research suggests that there's lower rates of restraints, feeding tubes, hospitalizations, more effective symptom management, the interdisciplinary support, not only for the patients, but for the families, 13 months of bereavement counseling, respite care. Part of the benefit is that you get five days every month in order to be able to take care of yourself. Dying in the place of choice, which is what people say they want. Families perceive higher quality of care and dying, which is so important because I want the families to be able to look back years from now and say, I did the best I could. I, don't, I never wanna have a presentation about people with dementia unless I include their voice, nothing about us without us. So they've done studies where they've asked people in the earlier stages of dementia, what is important to you as you look down the road? And this is what they say about ideal end of life care. Keep me comfortable, recognize, evaluate and treat my pain and all my other symptoms, uphold my dignity. Facilitate self-determination and informed decision-making. This is what I was talking about before. Be frank regarding realistic outcomes for my chronic illnesses and what happens if I break a hip, for instance. I want my family present and I want them to advocate. Listen to them and provide skilled staff in dementia comfort care. Interestingly enough, 100% of the participants, none of them wanted heroics. None of them wanted their dying prolonged. When I'm keep me safe and comfortable, when it's my time, it's my time is what I said. So there's always more that we can do, even when we're looking at a person in the advanced and end of life stages. There's a saying, cure sometimes, treat often, comfort always. There's another saying that says, to love someone is to learn the unique song in their heart and to sing it back to them when they have forgotten. And so some of these things that I've said, hopefully they resonate with you. And most importantly, you recognize that you're an expert in being a human being. You're an expert in comfort. When we know better, we do better. With a little bit of coaching, you can do this. So at this time, I will stop sharing my screen and invite Dr. Kathy Bishop to join me. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Um, oops, sorry. I had the video. Um, I have to tell you, I've never been asked to be a discussant before, so I'm, I'm not familiar with this role, um, and I'm absolutely humbled by the two presentations that came before me, and um, that very last quote, I hope you will share it, email with me, because I didn't have time to write it down. Um, I, I guess I'm going to just start before looking for um, questions from participants some thoughts I had um, from your presentation, um, but also the one just before an adaptive, um, because something came to me and actually Liz Carr and I had a, a little interaction about um, the term hoarding. My husband and I are antique dealers 
Um, and I always assure people that we are never hoarders. We are um, collectors who happen to sell and we were too good at collecting. So we do selling now. Um, oftentimes it's embarrassing to ask people who do not understand that who are minimalists to come into your house. Um, so it's often our antique friends that are asked most often to come in. Made me, and both of these presentations has made me um, look differently, think differently about some of the concepts that, that we all share together. Um, and terminology, for one thing, I know if I had um, had form of dementia, and someone came in and told me as an antique dealer, I'm a hoarder and I can no longer have any of these material objects around, the term alone would probably make me not listen. When I think about the people, I was a preschool um, teacher. Uh, many of my children were people, uh, children with Down syndrome. And then I have focused on aging um, over a lifetime. I do want to remind all of you that when we talk about IDD, it's not only with people with Down syndrome um, that have our challenge by Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, it can be many people with a developmental disability diagnosis or a type of intellectual disability. Downs, people with Down syndrome are the most known about, and at this point, the highest percentage. The people I've known with Down syndrome would often be hoarders. Um, they have strict routines. They usually have hobbies or something they like to collect, or at least material objects um, that uh, they find very precious as part of their routine. And so I'm rethinking some of the consults I do, in fact, one that I'm doing tomorrow, um, that I need to look with um, different eyes at what are the material objects that are important and how do we make sure that those continue to be part of their life because what's their history uh, related to those material objects? Um, whose problem is it? Certainly a safety issue has to be resolved, but it's just if someone's a minimalist and really doesn't like a lot of, a lot of objects around, it's not the problem of the individual who likes to collect certain objects. And are there storage um, way, ways we can store and make things safer without having to totally get rid of all the objects in the person's, um, person's possession? Um, so I guess I, that's the first thought. And maybe you or, or maybe um, Liz, because I think about your husband, um, if he ever had dementia and his wanting to um, keep all the used car parts, um, that would be a challenge for him as well. And, and let me just say before I, um, hopefully that you'll have some comments. Um, people with Down syndrome or any other type of intellectual and developmental disabilities don't experience this, this disease any different than anyone in the general population, but they often enter the disease by definition, by the criteria of being diagnosed as having intellectual and developmental disability. They enter in sometimes with less capacity in certain areas, at least, than someone from the general population. So just throwing it open. Hey, Kathy, I think that you bring up kind of a, a good point, something that uh, we've talked about when we do the assessment is that knowing what somebody's wishes are before it gets to the point where you need to know what their wishes are is really important. My husband and I talk all the time about the dang car parts because he's, I'm going to, you know, have a car that I can put this on. Okay, great. You know, now go sell it because we've had it in the garage for too long. But we've had the discussion about when he passes away, he just turned 60, so he's got a few years. Um, but when he passes away, what to do with his stuff. So I think the folks that we support with IDD, we need to have those discussions early so we know what's important to them, that we know how um, how they want to keep those material items, those watch pieces or whatever it is because I don't think that's something that we do well, because we're so ingrained into working on outcomes and goals, um, moving the person forward, we don't necessarily take the time to take stock in who they are now. 
Harry Beth, did you want to comment or? I don't. Um, I was thinking about the wonderful um, photo you had of the woman, obviously, with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, um, holding the doll that was an infant. Um, in the IDD field, um, that would be considered not normalization. Um, I literally, when I do consults, have to write um, giving permission for taking naps when they're tired for being able to take a teddy bear with them on the van because it helps them feel secure or a doll or to sometimes even carry a purse to program because people are afraid that objects are gonna be, um, be uh, taken back to the residents that need to stay at the day program. And it always amazes me when I have to write a recommendation. I often recommend they take it to their GP. Often when they call me in, they're going to have a an appointment with their PCP um, in the near future. And um, if it's something like a nap, I have the PCP also write it in recommendation. So even if it violates policy, um, it's understood that this is important. Um, I'm sure you've come into circumstances like this. Yeah, can and Kathy, can I just comment? Because I know in our world, mm -hmm. Um, we, of course, we want to uphold dignity. And I know that to put a baby doll in somebody's arms to the adult daughter going, oh, my God, my mother's got a PhD, you're putting a baby doll in her. But when the mom, when you see the expression on her face and you know that the oxytocin is cascading through her system, it's sort of like whose problem is, it's more about working with the daughter's grief in the changing that's going on. But it's all about this person and their perception of the world. And so you know, yeah. Teachable. Well, in the IDD field, it's also often related to funding and reaching goals and the policies and practices and regulations. And so um, oftentimes you have to go and fight the regulation as a problem. It's not as simple as saying just the, the daughter or son or whoever has to accept it. It's oftentimes it's a whole organization, maybe the whole state, that this is a regulatory issue. Age appropriateness, thinking chronological yeah. age appropriateness. In the NTG um, two-day dementia-capable care and ID training that we do, um, we call it meaning appropriate. Mm, I like that. Um, when you talk about spirit, it is, it is so um, important, um, but often that's something that's not addressed in the life of people with IDD, especially people who may be nonverbal and cannot express in the same way that others may about their own thoughts. So it always bothers me is how do you make informed decisions? How do you help them make informed decisions when they haven't had the capacity throughout life? And we don't even have the research and the knowledge to support what we're calling informed decisions. Mm. Yeah. And so we do the best we can because nobody knows the person better than we do. And so on their behalf, we can try to figure it out. And you know, I know that this is an evidence-based presentation, but I can't help from letting it escape my lips, people. Uh, so it'll just be between us, okay? But you know, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia are diseases of the brain, but they're not diseases of the heart and the soul or whatever terminology you wanna use of the person. So let us not forget that because there's so much more. It's calling us back to the language of the heart and the soul. And I think it would do us all good to be able to get back in touch with that in this crazy world. Wonderful, great. Um, the book that I showed, Dancing with Rose in, in the keynote, is a wonderful story, true story, of um, a woman who was in a unit um, for dementia-capable care um, in a long-term care setting, and she, um, no one knew anything about her essence or her life story, and a pianist came in one day to play after lunch. Um, and another gentleman also, who he and his wife of 50 years had, had been dancers, somehow instinctually knew to get up when the piano, st piano started playing and went over and bowed and asked Rose to have this dance and then dance for the next 45 minutes of the concert with everyone 
suddenly really seeing the essence of these, these two people that they never had. In the IDD field, um, more and more we need to be, well, documentation is there. It's often formal documentation. And we really need to make um, collecting life stories in the essence fun. And so I guess any comments, suggestions on that? Oh, boy, you know, there seems to be so many of them out there. So remember, my background is nursing. And uh, so I, I want to get stuff done. Okay. And, and so a lot of these, some people have created these beautifully elaborate ones, but what I see in the field is that when I ask the staff, so tell me about Joan, they're like, well, the stuff's in the chart, but I never have time to read it. And it's that kind of thing of if people don't have time, they're not using it. It's, it's not worth anything. So I know that even if people who, who are here, if they're not familiar, grab a one page one and see if you can build on that. But at least if you know that the direct caregivers can know at the essentials of a person. Keep it simple. We, um, yeah, we do uh, recommend videotaping and videotaping and making that a fun activity over a lifetime. But I'm not sure. In fact, um, in the training that I do, it's always recommended at least annually. You start as early as you can um, with the videotaping so that people can visually see the person and who they were uh, when they didn't know the person because of all the turnover we have in our field. Um, so hopefully that's something that can just make it fun. People love to be the star of their story. Yes. Using pictures to create that as well, because not only is that, because I'm, I'm one of those guilty people, Mary Beth, I don't always have time to sit down and read a full story about someone. But if I have a, a book that has pictures of the person doing things they like, that's going to stick in my head. and the person I'm supporting gets to relive and, and share those memories with me at the same time. So because direct uh, care providers are running, 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 just like nursing does, having something like that put together makes it quick and easy for the care provider, but also a resource and something comforting to the person that you're supporting. I've yeah. also found that's a great task for people who are in this disease to be able to sort um, people, especially with IDD, they often come late into an organization. They no longer have caregivers there. Or they go into a crisis where no longer can be supported. There's not enough, um, enough assets and, and resources at home to be able to continue to support 24 hours. Um, but they often come in without a story. And if you can get the family to send in a box of photos and, and have people be able to sort and do photo albums, that's also a soothing activity as well, I found. Um, the mention about changing routines um, and meals were given as an example. Again, I find, and, and all of us are routine. Uh, we need routines to be able to function. If That's one thing I think we're all reminded of during COVID when our whole life's routines had to change. And I also find recently um, a lack of paying attention to people who are reluctant to go back out into the community or to assume formal activities again out um, with other people after two years of lockdown and not understanding how long it may take to readjust back and may never go totally back to a routine. Um, that recommendation, of course, is excellent of, you know, maybe you have six meals a day and not the one big sit down. Um, the one thing I would caution is to do that change in routine slowly and add it in and maybe take less some calories out of one meal to be able to put into the snack. Um, I also find programs sometimes have difficulty with thinking about when they get in in the morning um, to continue breakfast there to make it a welcoming rather than starting something that helps the transition. Um, so again, just comments, suggestions you may have. 
Yeah, I, I was so when I was saying about the liberalizing and the loosening of the routine, it's more that again, if we the center of our being is that the person with dementia is doing the best that he or she can. So if it's person directed care and we're paying really close attention, it's nice to have these routines, but everything's got to be real flexible of paying attention to the person right here, right now, because Tuesday may be very different than Wednesday, right? Or well, the morning may be very different than the afternoon. So it really is coming back to what you're talking about, about presence, Kathy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's so hard. Um, I'm this week consulting with someone in the organization and the family I've been for a long time. And it is so hard for the direct support and the family to be present because um, they're getting closer to crisis stage or losing who the person has been throughout a lifetime. Um, and so being able to sit still, I, I love some of the exercises um, that you gave earlier um, in the adapting of, um, you know, looking at soothing ways for people to sit and, and just the, the sense of touch. And both the, of you did that, both um, presentations. Um, so I'm thinking of using some of those tomorrow and trying them with the person I'm working with. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're right at where we're supposed to end. Um, I'm so grateful for having the opportunity to come back because I'm not used to 20 minutes for a, a keynote. And it's just wonderful to have learned from all of you and heard and been able to share this time together with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we do still a bit of time, five minutes. If you have any questions and answers, so um, audience or speakers, if you have any questions to Malibeth, uh, Kathy, or anyone else, just prior to the presentation, we can share some of the questions and answers. While we wait for a question to come in, I would just like to say that, again, with my patients being my greatest teachers and talking on the, the theme of reciprocity, it is so important for a person to feel valued and a sense of belonging. It's a huge theme this year for me with my patients. And so there are patients who no longer have verbal ability, but when I go to visit them and maybe they're in the bed and before they leave, if they give me even the smallest crack of a smile, I go, thank you so much for that smile. It made my day. So I always try to pull out something to reflect that you made a difference in my life. Earlier on, will you help me with this? Those kinds of things. Nobody says that to people who have dementia by a certain stage. Again, very unintentionally, but imagine if nobody asked you for help or reflected in some way that you mattered in the world anymore. And we don't do it intentionally, but just please focus on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Maribeth and Kathy. And we don't see any question in the chat, but I love that comment, Maribeth, that you made just now that, you know, throughout your speech, you talked about the slowing down. And Kathy knows and Liz knows and all of the folks who, who work in the IDD world, we work like back to back to what's next? What can we achieve? How can we improve? How can we give them more choices, opportunities? So slowing down for the family member, caregiver is a task. We need to remind ourselves all the time. And if we forget, so we need to repeat Maribeth video every time when we see it, because that's the hardest one for ourselves. And then it comes back to the self-care of me in a minute. But I think that's, you just really flamed and gave us permission. That's your job. Part of the job is to slow down. And I think that we really, as a system and network of support, we need to look at that because we feel guilty if we are not producing something when you work for a group home or a day program or even being a mother, right? So I think that's, I think we need to have this kind of discussion and thank you so much for this and very, very beautiful presentation. Thank you. Yumi, I love that. Um, maybe if we start making it a task for the caregivers, so they're assigned it, that gives it permission to do it. 
And it, it does appear that there is one quick question in the chat, uh, Mary Beth or Kathy. Linda asks, so it's okay to soothe, soothe my mother with a baby doll? It's not degrading to her? Could one of you speak to that? I think, can I start? Because I'm pretty passionate about this. Look, try something and look at what you get from what you do. So let's say I know that a person's history that they love caring for babies. The way I introduce it, I may say, I have something here I want to share with you. Would you like to hold this? Now, I'm not telling you it's a baby. I'm not telling you it's a baby doll. I'm just having this and then I'm showing it to you and then I'm going to watch how you receive it. This is person directed care. I'm taking my lead from you. What do you think, Kathy? I, I, I can't agree with you more, um, definitely. In the IDD world, I always say, make sure you document, document, document. And if you have to bring in human rights committees, um, if you have to bring in administration to say how you will be violating what may be a stupid policy to begin with, but it's there. We don't want families direct support. Families don't have this issue, but people who are paid caregivers do have this issue. I think you always ask the question, what does it do? How does it help? How does it calm the person? And how is it meaningful, important to the person? and making sure no one is harmed as a result of it. And with handing someone a baby doll, I can't think of, of any way you're harming the person if it's something that's so important and it's soothing them. And if they have to carry it, um, I tell a story, a real life story of someone who bought a lot of my teddy bears. I'm a teddy bear collector, so I have to try to sell some. And the husband would come shopping at one of our co-ops and buy her a teddy bear and um, would take her out. She would be able to go out to lunch afterwards because she could sit the teddy bear next to her in the restaurant. What does it matter? It was a joyful moment. And if someone has a problem with it, it's their problem. It, it's not the person, the, the husband's problem. They were having a great moment. I also Thank you. I also usually say to people, this could be my last thing, but I usually say to people, when in doubt, when you're at a fork in the road, and I'm always <laughs> at a fork in the road, I ask myself, what is the highest goal here? If it's safety and comfort and body, mind and spirit of the options that I have, which one's going to help me reach the goal? And then I just trial different things. So I would try the baby doll just in case. Great. Thank you so much. So. We are at time for this session, but we will now be trans uh, moving over into the next me in a minute session, um, which is our final one before we break for lunch. Thank you. So I guess if we could roll down the slides to the mobility, I think there might be a salutations to the sun. There we go. So it's ready to stretch. So I can't say enough, not just because I'm a PT, about mobility and moving it, movement um, as a way to soothe, regroup, um, and complement that with breathing as a, as a healing technique for us. And I love how all the presentations have extended um, these exercises beyond us to the people that we're caring for. Um, even if you don't have time to go out and take a walk, um, you could gently walk around the house and just do some breathing. Um, you could sit in a chair and sway or um, find a favorite rocking chair that you could rock in. It's very soothing to the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, rocking with the person that you love and are caring for is a way to have that healing touch and sort of integrate um, your systems together. So I'm going to modify the modified movement. Um, and I think I'll just use sort of our upper extremities and our lungs and our chest and just show you a couple of ways. This also could be accompanied by music. And maybe, maybe I'll take this opportunity to, uh, Monica invited us earlier to associate a word with our current feelings before and after the, the um, exercise. And so 
I'd like to use a number scale. So if you're inclined or you feel like it might help, you could jot a number down about how you're feeling now, maybe hungry, we're going into lunch, but um, write a number down now. And then when we conclude with the next two short exercises, you can jot the number down, 10 being sort of representing the more negative aspects or stress or anxiety that you might be feeling today because you're behind in work or family stresses and zero being a very calm sort of settled place. So we're just going to do a little bit of movement, maybe just shrug your shoulders, and loosen your neck up and starting with our palms together. We're going to start with an exhale and you can just follow along. There's, there's no right or wrong way to do this, but we'll exhale and I'll take us very slowly. And I'm gonna breathe with these movements. We're gonna exhale. And inhale. And exhale. And inhale, settling in, exhale. Inhale, and exhale, and inhale. And as you're experiencing, as you're experiencing these movements, hope you can appreciate, rather than just sitting, that you're actually using physiology to expand the lung capacity by using your arms. And we'll stop with our hands together. So the last of the four Kapasatar exercises is the finger holds. And I was um, happy to tag on to you, Dr. Gallagher, because you mentioned um, touch, but mentioned touch to the fingers. And um, I'm gonna introduce to you what Kapasatar has assigned to our fingers in the way of emotions and um, give you an opportunity to choose a finger and emotion and practice this exercises, exercise. So um, it's a very simple practice to work with, um, utilizing this emotions associated with the fingers. And in, in my feeling, emotions and feelings are like waves of energy that move through the body and mind. And each of our fingers is a channel or meridian of energy connected with our related emotions and organs. And when we have really strong or overwhelming feelings, energies can get blocked or stifled and, and built up, resulting in pain and congestion or way, responding in ways that we really don't want to. So holding each finger, and again, we're gonna bring back the breathing and breathing into our fingers and our holds can, can bring about a physical release and healing. I found that finger holds can be very practical in my life. I can just hold a finger. No one needs to know what emotion I'm feeling. I use them with Durkee too. So when I felt like he was anxious or sad, I just held a finger and sort of sat next to him using that. Um, it helps sort of bring into focus, peace and calm. Um, allowing opportunity for appropriate responses. Um, the, the activity can be done quietly. It can be done, you know, in a crowd or by yourself. It can be done relaxation to music, it can be an intentional setting aside of time. Um, I like to do it before I go to sleep at night and use some of the relaxing breathing. Um, I'll introduce the hands. So, um, with your fingers, the thumb represents grief, tears, or emotional pain. Holding the index represents fear or panic. The middle finger, anger, rage, resentment. The ring finger, worry or anxiety. And the small finger, uh, lack of self-esteem. So if you will and would like to, um, you can choose a finger and I'll talk you through the first sort of sense of this activity. You're gonna, you doesn't matter which hand you use, your dominant or your non-dominant, but you can choose a finger and you're gonna 
when you're practicing this yourself, you can hold for a little longer. You can hold up to five minutes um, until you feel that settling happen. But for the sake of this exercise, we'll hold less long. Um, breathe in deeply. Recognize, you know, you're choosing your fingers. So recognize that feeling or that maybe strong or disturbing thought that might have led you to choose that finger. And then since you've breathed in, then you breathe out and you slowly let that particular feeling go. And you're imagining that as you breathe out, you're letting those feelings go and that they're draining out of your body, away from your body into the earth. When you go to breathe in again, you breathe in that sense of harmony or strength and healing. And then you breathe out, further letting go, releasing these past feelings, negative feelings or problems. So you can continue to breathe in and breathe out. Sometimes when I'm in a, in a quieter place and I'm holding one of my fingers, I can actually feel a pulsing sensation that sort of reminds me or replicates sort of the energy system that we have in our bodies. And I'm more in touch with releasing the negative thoughts and welcoming the more healthy thought, thoughts to be balanced. And like I said, you can hold fingers of someone who's upset and maybe not understanding the exercise at all. And they'll also receive the benefit. Um, as I teach this Kapasitar workshop and a lot of these exercises, the finger holds have become probably one of the more favorite activities. And when I get feedback from participants, they always say, you know, I still do the finger holds, the tapping too, but the finger holds. So um, I've, I've just really appreciated being able to share Kapasitar with all of you. And I'm really enjoying this whole conference. And so far, everything's been just really, really great. Thank you again. So before we leave sort of the feeling and relaxation and head off to lunch, if you could revisit maybe what number you're at, maybe take a minute more to do your finger hold and without my voice or without accompaniment and write down how you're feeling. And again, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. With that, we are gonna be transitioning to our lunch break. Uh, session will resume at 12 o'clock local Arizona time. Thank you. As I mentioned, lunch break is very short. Uh, so please just grab your food. If you don't finish it, just, just join us with your food. And um, this time it's just so limited because we have fantastic speakers and thank you. Enjoy your lunch. So one hour for lunch, correct? 
Oh, no, the lunch is only 15 minutes. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. That's why I yes. was confused. Okay, so 15-minute lunch break. Yes, sorry for the short one. If you could grab the lunch, then come back. Um, that oh, no, no, that, that's fantastic. fine. Uh, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, everyone. It is 12 o'clock on the dot here. Hopefully you were able to run out and grab a quick snack or lunch to bring back to your computer. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and transition into our next presentation titled Clinical Significance, Identifying Screening and System Navigation. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Tammy Basford. Tammy? Well, good afternoon. I'm Tammy Basford. I'm a family physician with the University of Arizona, um, and I direct a program of care, uh, primary care for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, which is embedded in our uh, family medicine teaching clinics. I also direct the developmental medicine curriculum for our residents and do teaching in the medical school around issues of uh, developmental medicine and disability as well. I also wanted to demonstrate that um, I'm also a model for the range of normal for a, appropriate adult um, behaviors um, based on our last um, conversation um, and Kathy's observation about what's considered age appropriate in the DD world. I wanted to share my teddy bear who um, travels with me. I'm actually back east right now and he was given to me by my aunt. Um, after I had a very difficult surgery to help me not hurt so much when I coughed. So, um, so that's my age appropriate behavior <laughs> regarding teddy bears. Um, next slide, please. Today, I wanna to talk to you about different types of dementia. Um, know things that might increase someone's chances of developing dementia and um, start to be aware of in early indications that someone you know with intellectual disability may be developing dementia. Also want to introduce you to some of the health conditions and medications and environmental issues that can sometimes look like dementia but not be dementia. And then end up with um, being comfortable with talking to your healthcare provider about concerns about dementia. So bringing some, um, some information to the table with your healthcare provider, your, your um, person with um, IDs, uh, healthcare provider. Next slide, please. Just letting you know that um, this is what I'm talking about is intellectual disabilities um, that are not just intellectual function uh, limitations, but um, challenges in adaptive behavior that originate before the age of 22. Next slide, please. So here in Arizona, the vast majority of people with intellectual developmental disabilities live in their own home or apartment, and that's about 18% of folks, or uh, the rest of that 89% live um, with family members. Um, and the, the rest basically lived in, in supervised residential settings like group homes or adult developmental homes. Here in Arizona, it's a very, very tiny percent that live in any kind of institutionalized setting. And so the important thing to know is that people in a person's environment, um, whether it's family caregivers, family support people, or support people um, interacting with someone in their own apartment or in a group home, are going to be the first ones po to possibly notice that something seems off or different about someone as they develop dementia. Next slide, please. So what is dementia? Um, and I find that most of my patients are a little confused about what dementia actually is. Dementia is not a disease in and of itself. It's a group of symptoms. And the symptoms are problems with memory, problems with language, problems with thinking, problems with social abilities. And these things all um, may come in different combinations, but they're severe enough to actually interfere with your daily life. I know I'm constantly being surprised at um, walking the increased frequency that I walk into a room and can't remember what I walked into that room for, but it's not really interfering with my daily life. Um, so there are a number of different diseases that can cause this cluster of symptoms. Uh, next slide, please. 
The most common the, and the one that we hear the most about is Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease causes dementia, those symptoms of difficulty thinking, but it is not the only cause of dementia. The next most common is what we call vascular dementia, which means there are problems with the small blood vessels in your brain, either blood vessel blockages, like we can get in our hearts, or little tiny, tiny bleeds, microscopic bleeding that can also cause difficulties with thinking and memory. A many, some people have mixed dementia, which is often a combination of um, Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. And then there's some things um, that are less common but important to think about. Um, and one is called normal pressure hydrocephalus. And this is not like the hydrocephalus that folks are born with, but a hydrocephalus that can present later and can present with, in addition to memory difficulties, difficulties walking or a new problem with bladder control. Um, uh, there are a couple other more common kinds, Lewy body dementia, um, sometimes that occurs alone or with Parkinson's, frontotemporal dementia, um, which can sometimes present only with a language difficulty at first, and then dementia associated with Huntington's disease, which is a genetic disease that uh, adults get. Next slide, please. So overall, uh, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, which is the primary cause of dementia, is not higher in people with intellectual disability, with the exception of people with Down syndrome. But even in um, people with ID who do not have Down syndrome, dementia may be harder to detect, and it's easier to misdiagnose in people with intellectual disability. Next slide, please. So folks with ID um, can have higher risks of dementia if they have Down syndrome, if they have risk factors for vascular related disease like obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, or other cardiovascular diseases. Um, people with intellectual disability are less likely to receive preventive care and screening from their doctors. So screening, for example, for high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So this is the sort of thing that if someone's doctor isn't offering, it's worth discussing with someone, with um, a person's doctor. It's worth um, to make sure that um, they're getting the appropriate preventive care to prevent vascular related dementia. And then um, people with intellectual disabilities are more likely to be on medications that it can increase the risk of dementia and are more likely to have seizure disorders, which can also increase the risk of dementia. The thing to remember is age is the major risk factor for dementia, and happily, people with ID are living longer, so we are seeing more dementia in people with intellectual disabilities simply because they're living into their 60s and, um, and can develop then dementia at that time. Next slide, please. This is particularly um, true in um, Down syndrome. So Alzheimer's disease in uh, people with Down syndrome is related to the fact that um, there's a, a protein called APP, which is found in the membranes or the skins of cells. Our whole body is made of cells and um, this, each cell has a membrane, kind of like a little skin. And those membranes do a lot of communicating with each other. That's how the cells talk to each other. And there's a protein um, in that cell membrane um, that is found in abnormal bundles or plaques in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. So the nerve cells, something goes wrong with how the, um, the APP is metabolized and it builds up. And we know that that's sort of a marker for um, Alzheimer's disease. And when you see the, um, the presentation by Dr. Um, Sabak, you'll learn a little bit more about that. Chromosome 21 carries the gene for APP. Um, so if you have three chromosome 21s, then the chances of having some abnormality to gene APP is just a little higher. Um, there are also some other genes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease that have to do with how the body handles inflammation that are also on chromosome 21. Next slide, please. So adults with Down syndrome are living longer, and that's why we're seeing more Alzheimer's disease in folks with Down syndrome. The life expectancy with Down syndrome in the US um, in 1983, which is when I actually graduated from medical school, was 35 years. 
Uh, by 2020, this has increased to age 60. So if Alzheimer's disease seems new to, to some medical professionals, it's because that wasn't an issue for people with Down syndrome when they first started practicing. Just as with everyone, increasing age increases the chances of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome, but it begins earlier and occurs at a higher rate. So according to the National Down Syndrome Society, about a third of the people with Down syndrome who are in their 50s have clinical Alzheimer's disease. And about half of people with Down syndrome by their 60s have, again, clinical Alzheimer's disease. Now, some of those changes are happening in the brain um, by the, in, in many, if not most of people with Down syndrome by these ages, but it's not manifesting as a clinical problem. Thanks. Slide, please. So, uh, as has been pointed out earlier, symptoms of dementia um, in people with IDD are usually behavioral. I have may have someone um, who's neurotypical present to my practice and complain about their memory, or um, they're getting lost on their way home from driving from the store. But often, when someone comes to me who has an intellectual disability, what they and more particularly the people around them are noticing is they're getting more stubborn, they're more um, fearful, they're quote, being oppositional. Um, and it's because um, yes, they're using the best tools in their current armamentarium to let people know that something's wrong. For example, if you've lost your ability to sequence tasks to know how to go from A to B to C, and all of a sudden you're being asked to go to your bedroom, get um, your sweater and bring it back out to the um, living room, rather than saying, I don't remember how to get to my bedroom, you're just going to appear stubborn and oppositional by refusing to go to your bedroom and get the sweater. So often that's how families bring someone who they're concerned about to me. Next slide, please. So how do you talk to your healthcare provider about dementia? What should your healthcare provider be thinking about? Next slide, please. So one thing to be aware of is something that um, when I teach it to medical students, I call diagnostic overshadowing. And that means that for physicians, as they're going through their daily business, sometimes the one diagnosis that someone has, like intellectual disability, or Down syndrome may overshadow their thinking about what all could be going on with the person. So they may attribute anything that's going on to the person's primary diagnosis. So it's important to be explicit when you go in and say, you know, there's some changes that make me concerned about dementia. Uh, another issue that faces physicians is that we don't always have a complete medical history from the person bringing someone in to see us. Um, even someone living with their family sometimes may be brought into a family member that isn't as involved in their day-to-day -day care, um, or there may have been a change in who's providing the primary care because of the illness, say, of a, a parent who's been providing a lot of support for the person. And then patients with intellectual disability can't describe their symptoms as well sometimes, have more challenges um, describing their symptoms. Next slide, please. So the first thing you have that I always try and do when someone comes in, say with a new behavior change of sleep disruption and being um, more oppositional and losing some skills, as I look for other things that could be causing it. So we want to rule out everything else before we start thinking about um, dementia. The biggie that I start with is have any new medications been started? So these are the sorts of things that families and caregivers can think about and have in their minds before they um, accompany someone to their doctor's appointment. And common medications that can make you more confused, more sleepy, um, can be some cold medications like Benadryl, which is diphenhydramine or hot hydroxyzine, some anti-nausea medications, uh, promethazine isn't prescribed as often anymore, some bladder medications, anti-seizure medications, and then some behavioral medications like some antidepressants, 
Um, Anti-anxiety medications like benzodiazepines can have an exaggerated effect um, on some people with intellectual disability or a paradoxical effect where instead of sedating someone, they're making them more agitated because they're kind of fighting the sedation. And then some antipsychotics. Next slide, please. And then it's very important to look for other uh, physical causes or environmental causes. Um, when was, the, I always ask the last time that someone had their eyes and ears tested. Obviously, if you're suddenly losing vision, you're going to have a much harder time, say, finding things in the kitchen as you normally used to. And again, if someone, if my patient isn't able to describe that, then we just need to make sure that we get their um, vision tested and eyes test and um, ears tested. And I will not entertain the diagnosis of dementia unless I have some recent um, information on that. Sometimes depression in everybody, neurotypical people and people with intellectual disability alike can present as um, confusion because people just are preoccupied by their depression and so they're not attending to their environment as much. Pain is a huge one. And I'd say the most common cause of undiagnosed pain that I find in my patients are um, dental pain because there's nothing on the outside that people can see. There's nothing they can press to see if something hurts. And it again, sometimes that's hard for people to explain exactly where their pain is. Um, sleep apnea is more common in people with Down syndrome and sleep apnea, poor sleep can definitely have effects on how well you think during the day. A history of head injury recently, and then any changes in the person's environment like a move or loss. Next slide, please. And it's also important for me as the physician and for you to remember to ask your physician to rule out other changes of um, other things that can, um, can make someone confused that are treatable. Um, one is low thyroid, which can occur at any point in someone's life um, and is more common in people with Down syndrome, as well as vitamin B12 deficiency. And folks could be deficient in that if they're not real great about eating leafy green vegetables, for example. And then other just general illnesses like liver or kidney disease, diabetes, anemia, electrolyte imbalances. So there's some basic labs that I always get for people um, on people to make sure that there's not something we can take care of that's correctable that would clear up their thinking. Um, I always get um, uh, a brain imaging and MRI to look for signs of stroke or normal pressure hypocephalus. And then I consider testing for sleep apnea, um, particularly if the person has Down syndrome um, and other testing um, we consider based on how the, um, how the person presents and what their, their own met personal medical history is. Next slide, please. So in general, if I have a neurotypical patient coming in and complaining of memory changes, I would start with something called a mini mental status exam. And this is, some of you may have had this uh, given to you by your own physicians, where they ask you to um, remember three objects, draw a clock, um, ask you who the president is. And this is kind of a standard way to see how oriented people are. Um, and the problem with using this for a person with ID is because we score the um, mini mental status exam um, compared to what the average person would answer. In other words, the average person might get one of the three objects wrong um, when they're trying to remember them. Um, people with intellectual disability um, then may not um, be able to take that test and be scored accurately because what we really wanna do is compare each person with intellectual disability to their self a year ago or five years ago because the only good baseline we have is themselves. Fortunately, there's a tool that you can use uh, to record function over time, and this allows a comparison of a person with intellectual disability to themselves previously and is much more helpful to the physician. And I'm going to um, explain it briefly to you just so you know that it's something that you can get through us, through Dr. Shirai. She also gives workshops on how to, how to administer this um, screening tool sometimes. Next slide, please. 
So the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, or NTG, is a private nonprofit group. It was started by a group of people who worked with um, dementia and an intellectual disability and includes neuro included neurologists and physical therapists and behaviorists and everything. And they came up with, a, um, they have a lot of um, information on their website. And so I've included that on the slide set, but they also came up with a screening instrument that one could use with people um, with intellectual disability. Um, and what it is, it's a form that gets filled out annually by people that are close to the person that it's being filled out for. And it can be filled out as a group, but the people who are filling it out should have at least known the person for six months. So sometimes this can be a family member and in a group home setting, it should be staff that have been there for at least six months and have a lot of direct contact with the person. And next slide, please. And it collects a lot of information demographics, how old the person is, other things of what, what's going on in their life. Do they have, have any chronic health um, conditions? Are there new health conditions, any life stressors? And then the thing that's most helpful to me is a review of, their, of people's function in all these different areas. So their activities of daily living, language and communication, walking, memory, behavior. And so they have little, um, scales that you can fill out for each of these things. And when um, then you do it a year later, you may notice that someone's self-care ability in the area of hygiene has really dropped off as well as their sleep has been disrupted. And that's the sort of thing when you bring to me that might put my antenna up um, for being a possibility of being uh, dementia, of having dementia. Next slide, please. So again, this is something that you can fill out as a group and everybody just uses their best judgment. And um, the thing is, over time, you know, even if someone tends to overestimate things or underestimate things, you'll get a general sense over years of how, um, how the person's function is. Is it improving or is it declining? Next slide, please. Um, and it's important to um, diagnose Alzheimer's disease early for a number of reasons. One, treatment um, can be started for Alzheimer's disease. There's um, no indication that most of the treatments that are the medications that are used for people, um, neurotypical people with Alzheimer's disease um, can be used in people with Down syndrome or other intellectual disabilities. So there's no indication that they shouldn't be used if you, there aren't a lot of studies, um, but also, you can identify potentially treatable conditions like hypothyroidism or B12 deficiency. So that's important because these are things that can correct the cognitive changes. You can change your behavioral approach. Um, once we know that someone is entering a stage of cognitive decline, um, we're going to change our goals for that person to one of maintenance and not increasing new activities and new skills. You can start to plan for interventions and coordination of new services. It may um, reassure people who are wondering why there's been a behavior change um, in their brother or their, or their daughter. And um, it also provides opportunities for participating in clinical trials, which you'll hear a little bit more about um, in Dr. S um, Savag's presentation. Next slide, please. So what to expect when you go to the neurologist's office? So if I fit, say that I have a concern based on all the information, the things I've ruled out and changes in behavior, that I have a concern for uh, cognitive decline specific to Alzheimer's or other dementias, um, and I ruled out um, normal pressure hydrocephalus with an MRI, then I want the person to see a neurologist and it should be um, a neurologist who's um, comfortable and experienced with people with intellectual disability as well as Alzheimer's disease. Um, and if you go to the neurologist's office, um, you can expect a 
general physical and neurologic exam, a review of medications. If I haven't already, um, if the physician that has sent them to the neurologist hasn't already done this, they'll definitely image the brain and get a B12 and TSH and other testing. Um, there's some special tests that sometimes people read about that you usually aren't um, routinely done. An amyloid PET, which is a, a special kind of brain imaging or measuring um, certain proteins in the um, spinal fluid. Next slide, please. And for, um, for people, my patients um, using the um, NTG form, the, um, the screening form, for my patients with Down syndrome, I recommend that that screening begin at the age of 40. And for anybody with intellectual disability, I recommend that that begins at the age of 50. And that way we can get a baseline of people's function before um, symptoms may present themselves. And again, the tool and manual is available online in multiple language at the um, NTG website. Next slide, please. So I've included some resources, which I'm sure that um, this slide set can be uh, sent to you or these things will be downloaded into the chat. Um, but just if people, if you're interested in reading um, more practical guidelines for caregivers around Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome, um, this is the first one is from the National Down Syndrome Organization. And then NTG's um, uh, website has a lot of information that's really helpful. Next slide. And also, this is me. Um, this is my email address. And I am a, a faculty at the University of Arizona in this state. And I also would like to be considered a resource for you if you're just having trouble figuring out where to go. Thank you very much, Dr. Basford. Um, is it okay to move to Dr. Sabat? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we're going to do questions at the end. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to do questions at the end. So, Dr. Sabat from the Neurological Institute, uh, he is a bit level by the video. So, he sent us the video. So, let me try to share the video. My video sharing skill is not great. Um, so just hold on with, with me. So um, the video screen is going to stop for me. Yumi, who's after this, the video? Oh, Dr. Uh, Decker. So do we want to go ahead and have Dr. Decker go because he's here while you play with that? Um, you know, it's the video is up there. So it's just the. Just give me a second. Um, Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We cannot hear it though. That the big I'm Marwan Noel Sabat, Professor of Neurology at the Barrow Neurological Institute. Today I'm going to give you a perspective on Down syndrome dementia research. Could you hear? Yes. We can now, yeah. Okay, perfect. So Dr. Sabat is uh, the expert in the research and neurologist who are specialized in IDD and Down syndrome. And the question, the obvious question is why are we discussing this? And the fundamental issue is that we're seeing that the biggest group of young onset Alzheimer's dementia in the world is Down syndrome. 
uh, by age 70, of almost 80% of patients with Down syndrome will develop Alzheimer's dementia. Why is that? It's because the life expectancy of Down syndrome has gone up in just one generation. Remember, 50 years ago, a, patient, a child with Down syndrome might have lived to 35, mainly because they died of uh, ventricular septal defects or atrial septal defects or severe hypothyroidism. We correct these now, and patients now can live longer lives. We've been seeing an increase in live births from one in 2000 to one in 700, but with new uh, in vitro uh, in, uh, uh, in perinatal testing, we may actually see that go back down again. And it does represent the largest group of presenile onset dementia worldwide, far, far exceeding the presenile one and presenile two mutations. The question then is why? And the answer is, is that down syndrome is being trisomy 21 is overexpression of, uh, of chromosome 21, which is overexpresses amyloid precursor protein. Amyloid precursor protein is uh, the parent molecule of amyloid. And so when you have APP overexpressed, you start to overexpress amyloid, which uh, when it gets to from the monomeric to the diagrammatic to the oligomeric species, actually once you get the oligomeric species of amyloid, it triggers a lot of downstream changes. Uh, oxidative damage, mitochondrial dysfunction, neurochemical breakdown, uh, and tau spread and neuroinflammation. So we know that this is, uh, think of it. As an overexpressive. disease of amyloid, and we know that based on autopsy data, uh, the uh, changes in the brain are detectable by age 12 of amyloid being detected in the brain. This is Cindy Lemire's work. By age 37, I'll show you this data here in a little while, uh, we can see detectable pet amyloid PET, uh, and uh, by uh, age four, early 40s, you start to see symptomatic cognitive changes, or at least symptomatic uh, cognitive behavioral changes. So we do understand mechanistically this is an overexpression disease, this is not an underclearance disease, and that it's almost uh, predictable in, in many ways. But the question then is, can we take lessons from other clinical trials to determine if we can create the prevention trials for Down syndrome? What most people now realize has been uh, many prevention trials already completed. Uh, API, the, amyloid, uh, the Alzheimer Prevention Initiative, was looking at presenilin-1 mutations the age 30 to 60, and these were carriers of presenilin-1. They were randomized to crinazumab over placebo, and the uh, an overexpressive disease, much like Down syndrome is, and uh, they just reported the data out on the API, suggesting that it was not efficacious with crinazumab. The Diane was the U.S. version of the API uh, done with presenile 1, presenile 2, and APP mutation carriers, also using monoclonal antibodies, gantanarib, and solanezumab, and uh, the outcome was, again, not effective. And most recently, the A4 people in not in presenile or autosomal dominant mutation carriers, these are sporadic amyloid PET positive people, normal controls, meaning cognitively normal, but amyloid PET were randomized to solanezumab or placebo, and it did not have any efficacy, hit the efficacy signal on slowing the rate of cognition. So my point here is that the design and the selection of population and uh, 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 is feasible, and Down syndrome might fall in the API feasibility category. So I want to tell you, though, we have understood that the choice of monoclonals might be very important. We know that uh, monoclonals like uh, solanezumab and crinazumab, which tar target monomeric A-beta, might not be appropriate. Aducanumab has come. Uh, it is still a possibility. Lecanumab and others might be other possibilities. But the point is, is that so while we are now saying the design is reasonable, the selection of the monoclonal will be important. Uh, then uh, when we talk about this, we know from the Jack curves, Cliff Jack, uh, that we can see the amyloids, the earliest seminal event accumulating, and then you see the accumulation of tau and tangles. Then you see the neurodegeneration and atrophy and uh, uh, changes in the brain. And then you see the cognitive symptom. This is a, a construct that is uh, uh, din, done or seen in uh, Alzheimer's disease. 
uh, uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So my point is, is that this is the clipjack construct that we have constructed for uh, Alzheimer's sporadic. Now, when you see, uh, and you see, this is important, that you see the onset of symptoms might be in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but the pathological changes are occurring 20 years before the onset of symptoms. So we do know that you're accumulating pathology long before you start to see uh, a change uh, cl clinical symptoms. So why am I going to talk about this? Is because they actually looked at the same construct, the same construct in Down syndrome. And we're saying now that it is basically the same construct you saw in sporadic, but shifted much earlier. And you see at by age 10 to 15, you can start to see interneuronal amyloid. By age 20, you start to see neuronal uh, diffuse plaques. By early 20s to mid 20s, you start to see the accumulation of neurofibrillary tangles and neuritic plaques. And then you start to see the cognitive symptoms starting in the early 40s. And the detectable changes on PET start in the mid 30s, as I commented on. I'm going to show you those data now. But the point is that it is, it is, it is sporadic Alzheimer's but in a more compressed and younger onset. We shifted the earlier, and the timelines are much shorter as well. So we can use Down syndrome as an accelerated model of Alzheimer's disease. What we've shown is that uh, 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 Chris Rowe and company showed that you can see the prevalence of AD shifting earlier uh, in sporadic Alzheimer's, uh, and the PET is detectable as early as 15 years, PET changes are detectable sporadically in sporadic Alzheimer's, 15 years before the onset of, of clinical symptoms. So the question then is, what have we learned from our own experience uh, in Arizona to inform the, the population? I was very, very happy to report this case report uh, uh, several years ago, and this was a very important study. What we did is we had a young man, or actually middle-aged man, his, uh, he was 55 years old, uh, and he had Down syndrome. Uh, I was his neurologist uh, through his diagnosis and through the end of his life. His family was a very forward-thinking family, very supportive, very completely understood this, and they uh, supported the idea of donating his brain to our brain donation program uh, when I was with Banner Health. And we actually uh, uh, recruited him, enrolled him, got a floor beta pier pet uh, uh, just two weeks before he passed. And so we were able to get PET scan first ever and uh, autopsy data. And what you see here is that there was clear accumulation of amyloid throughout the neocortex, particularly in the frontal lobe and in the temporal, uh, te uh, the temporal and parietal lobes. Uh, so this is the uh, accumulation of the uh, of the amyloid PET. And what you see, though, is that it correlated very, very well with uh, the autopsy data. So this was the first ever correlation of amyloid PET to autopsy data in Down syndrome uh, and uh, was a very important study. Another study that I was fortunately able to lead was uh, looking at uh, floor beta pier, FDG, and MRI and Down syndrome with and without uh, a symptomatic, uh, um, with a, and without a symptomatic uh, 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 Alzheimer's disease. And interestingly enough, I'm going to tell you that. Uh, let me. Uh, so somehow it jumped. I'm going to go to the next slide. I apologize for this. Uh, so I want to talk to you about uh, this is the study I led. Uh, so I will say to you that um, there were three groups included, normal control, Down syndrome, and Down syndrome without Alzheimer's. All of them can, uh, had proxy consent, cognitive assessments, MRI, FTG, PET, and floor beta peer. This was the total sample of 24 people, 10 with Down syndrome without dementia, five with Down syndrome with uh, dementia, you see the age of onset and age match healthy controls. The Down syndrome dementia were 15, 14 years older than the Down syndrome without dementia. And what you see is that the uh, Down syndrome age adjusted uh, had uh, uh, the cognitive impairment is impaired, 
the SIB was much lower, the severe impairment battery and other uh, instruments were done. What you see though is there's clear accumulation of uh, amyloid in the brain. And if you look at Down syndrome without dementia, very mild amyloid accumulation. And then eight years later, you see significant increase in amyloid uh, accumulation. So uh, in a predictable way, as already discussed. You also see that the SUVR, the standard uptake down volume ratio, sees increase in SUVRs across multiple regions of the brain, suggesting accumulation is, is quantifiable. Uh, and you see that in frontal, posterior cingulate, precanus and mean cortical. As you know, nowadays we're using the centeloid scale rather than the uh, uh, SUVR scale. And when you see that the SUVR uh, correlates very well with age uh, and, uh, and progression. So you see that the amyloid amounts go up uh, in Down syndrome over time, whereas in age uh, and normal cognition uh, or normal controls, it, it stays fairly, relatively flat. So we're seeing in a dynamic way the accumulation of amyloid pathology, and it starts in the 20s and goes into the 40s and 50s. So uh, this is very important. So the conclusion of that study was in comparison to Down syndrome and normal control, Down syndromes with dementia had greater am fibrillar amyloid burden. Uh, uh, they had uh, lower metabolism. They had uh, volumetric changes. Uh, and uh, this was something that showed a feasibility study. So let's look at the longitudinal studies. Uh, we were uh, looking at a large study that was uh, funded to look at the longitudinal amyloid PET, tau PET, MRI, blood spot, Down syndrome in patients with normal control. Uh, this was a study that we were looking at to 15 subjects uh, without Down syndrome, with Down syndrome 15, uh, with Down syndrome dementia and 10 normal controls. And we showed uh, that we started this study, which is, uh, continues to be ongoing. A total of 18 people were enrolled. Uh, and um, this is uh, kind of what we're doing is building the feasibility for a prevention trial. What would it look like? And you understand that the fundamental issue isn't that methodologies, is that the presentation and the clinical syndrome of Down syndrome is different. So in a typical Alzheimer's construct, a patient with Down syndrome might, uh, or I should say, in a typical Alzheimer's construct, they might present with amnestic disorder, meaning forgetfulness, repeat, repetition of questions, statement stories, uh, uh, getting lost, misplacing keys. So the typical Alzheimer's patient uh, actually presents with an amnestic disorder. However, in Down syndrome, we don't see that. What we see in Down syndrome is two things. Number one is a large heterogeneity of pre-morbid IQ and intellectual ability. So some people with Down syndrome are born and have very high pre-morbid IQs, almost normal. Uh, others are very low pre-morbid IQs. And we see that when you aggregate them, the pre-morbid IQ runs at around 40. But the, th the, the reason it's important is that they don't present, second reason is that they don't present with cognitive issues most of the time. They actually most of the time present with behavioral issues. They become oppositional, or argumentative, defiant, and then they become forgetful. So we've faced multiple challenges when we design clinical trials for Alzheimer, for dementia due to uh, uh, in dementia in Down syndrome. There is uh, a lot of when do we intervene? What's the strategy of the drug design? What is the model? Uh, what are the outcome instruments and measures? And these are all being uh, developed. So the NIAD has actually been a, a national study uh, with 180 adults with Down syndrome, uh, looking at uh, amyloid PET, FDG PET, tau PET uh, at baseline 32, 16, 32, and 48 months, uh, and cognitive measures, um, and then multiple other things, genetics, lipidomics, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, and then autopsy data, uh, and then providing this information for a national study. The questions that are being asked is, when do we treat? Do we treat in the symptomatic phase? How would we know it works if they are a variable in their pre-morbid pre IQs? What outcome measures would you use? Would you treat before onset of symptoms? How soon would you do it before onset of symptoms? Would you do it in their 30s when their amyloid pet is positive, but they're not symptomatic? So the kind of questions is there are a lot of things to consider when you're designing both treatment trials and prevention trials. 
And the question then is, do you treat before the presence of amyloid? So you treat in the early days, or do you, pres or that would be primary prevention, meaning before age onset of 35, or secondary prevention when there's amyloid PET positive, but not clinical symptoms, that would be age 45 to uh, 35 to 45. And then the question is, what do you choose? Do you choose active immunization? So a vaccine, AC immune vaccine has been shown in phase two trial to be safe. Would you use monoclonal antibodies or passive immunization? Would you use base inhibitors or rage inhibitors? And the answer is no, since those have failed in sporadic AD. And then how would you do an IV infusion trial in patients who would be resistant to IV treatments? And then the question is what biomarker? Do you use a primary outcome of a biomarker or a clinical marker as an outcome? Or how would you create these? And what instruments would you use? And there's a lot of different things to consider. Uh, and the reason this is also is that the question is, would you use uh, biomarkers? Would you use amyloid PET? Would you use tau PET? Would you use CSF? That would be very difficult to do. Would you use uh, uh, plasma biomarkers? It would be great to consider the possibility of using plasma biomarkers, particularly P-tau uh, 217, as well as A beta 42 to 40 ratio. These are studies that are being posed right now and created as uh, feasibility studies for Down syndrome trials. So the conclusion here is that uh, prevention trials in Down syndromes are paramount and almost inevitable as they represent the largest pre-senile dementia cohort in the world. But you see there are unique challenges in terms of consenting, assessing, and monitoring. What outcome measures do we use? What uh, do we use biological outcomes? Do we use uh, clinical outcomes? And then the data and experience from M M API number one and NIAD will be paramount in informing design. Thank you very much. The transition now <laughs> to Dr. Decker and uh, Dr. Sabat. <clears throat> I'm sorry, only can join with the video. So we invited from his clinic, Sandy, to just help us for the Q and A at the end of this segment. So after Dr. Decker's presentation, he's going to go over in terms of looking at the DDD as a system. We will open up more for questions. So. Hold on to your thoughts or questions, and we do provide the Q&A segments at the end. Well, thank you, everyone. And I'm, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Tony Decker. I'm a family doctor. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sabah, it was great to hear you. And we are old friends. And uh, Dr. Basford, I am always impressed. I mean, you are such a great teacher. Thank you. So uh, let's go to the next slide. I am the Chief Medical Officer of the Division of Developmental Disabilities. I want to make sure that uh, it's understood that uh, uh, my, my presentation is just my opinions. Uh, we have some qualifying issues that we have uh, for the Division of Developmental Disabilities, which are uh, state, but I'm not representing uh, any federal or state program. I retired after 37 years with the US Public Health Service, the Indian Health Service, uh, spent five years at the Department of Defense, five years with the Veterans Administration, and started with the uh, Division of Developmental Disabilities in 2021 and have stayed on. Uh, it has been an honor and a privilege to work with such a great team of staff, 2,500 staff, who are doing the Lord's work every day in complete anonymity. Next slide. So our objectives for this part of the program is going to be aware of the clinical challenges in the transitions to adult care. And this is a real challenge. Uh, the Division of Developmental Disabilities provides care uh, to about 51,000 Arizonans. And so what happens is that uh, we manage the care through health plans to maximize the independence of our population. The people we serve are qualified in a variety of settings. And so the qualifying diagnoses include autism, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, intellectual and cognitive disabilities, and Down syndrome was just added in 2023. Now, prior to that, there were only six members with Down syndrome who did not qualify because you can have mosaic Down syndromes that have significant elevation of cognitive capacity. 
Uh, my personal interest in working with uh, the population that we serve is that I have a 52 year old sister, Tina, who was born in my senior year of high school uh, with Down syndrome. And uh, Tina still lives with our family. She was with us down in Arizona from 2015 to 2018, but she wanted to go back to Michigan. Now, Michigan had a rough winter and she's asking to come back to Arizona. So that may happen very soon. Uh, we really want to develop an understanding of the difference between eligibility requirements from birth to age six, from age six to age 18 and above age 18. And to be cognizant of the aging issues in all of our members who have, who are in the division of developmental disabilities. Uh, the other objective is to understand the components of a comprehensive evaluation as defined by chapter 200G. Now, uh, Dr. Basford went through that exceptionally well. Next slide. <clears throat> so when we look at our mission statement, the Division of Developmental Disabilities empowers individuals with developmental disabilities to lead self-directed, healthy, and meaningful lives. Um, I just took my seven-year-old grandson for his birthday. My wife and I uh, were in New York City. He wanted to see the Statue of Liberty. And it was wonderful, but it was raining cats and dogs. And uh, so we're out by the Statue of Liberty. And uh, he says, what does she say? And I said, uh, she says that we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the biggest smile was on his face. He said, that's really great. And that's what we want for our member population, for the people that we serve to be able to pursue happiness, to have an independent life as much as possible. And that means that we do as much as we can to facilitate independence. Some members need to have assistance in that process, but the happiest day occurs when a member graduates or leaves DDD because they are on their own. They have achieved independence. Now, many of our members are in the aged population. So it's not unusual for us to have people that are in their 60s, 70s. Even, I think our oldest is 86 right now. Uh, these benefits are lifetime long. Now, we had those, those uh, qualifying diagnoses. So autism, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, cognitive and intellectual disability, Down syndrome, and under the age of six, we use what's called the at risk of having a developmental disability. Everyone knows about the zero to three programs from four to six. If a person has a risk, they're still eligible for services. Next slide. So when we look at this eligibility process, so this is important because we increase our, our population base in Arizona at a very regular rate. I mean, we, Arizona in the general population and in the developmental disability population, there's been a, a very predictable rate of increase. So when we look at these qualifying diagnoses, we make a determination uh, at age six to see if they still need to have services based on their needs. And so prior to age six, it's based on at risk. But age seven and on, they have to have the qualifying diagnoses and they have three of seven substantial functional limitations. Um, at age 18, there's another assessment that's done. And if a member qualifies at age 18, they are eligible for lifetime benefits. Our main discussion today is to talk about the transition from home to group home, home to independent living. And we have many, many members that fall in that category and aging issues in the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Next slide. I should say the last four slides of this presentation, which will be available to you, are really the resources and the Arizona revised statutes that address each one of these issues. So eligibility over the age of six, you have to have a DDD diagnosis accompanied by three of those substantial limitations. So we've already listed those uh, diagnoses and Down syndrome, like I said, was added on. There is legislation in the state of Arizona to include two more diagnoses that still have to be passed by the legislature 
which includes spina bifida and Prater Willie. Next slide. I, I should say that many, many, many members, even prior to when Down syndrome was, was a qualifying diagnosis, uh, were able to qualify in more than one category. So you could have autism and uh, cognitive intellectual uh, impairment. Now, the seven areas that you have to have substantial functional limitations, and you remember, you have to have three of the seven. So that would include self-care, receptive and expressive language, learning, mobility, self-direction, capacity for independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. So you need to have three of these substantial functional limitations to qualify. And uh, we'll take a, a good example, prater Willie. prater Willie, the progression of cardiovascular disease and, and neurologic disease increases with age, and it may happen after the age of 18. So we need to take that into consideration because they're significantly at risk for complications later in life that need to be taken into consideration. And, and really we wanna provide the best services. I, for one, my personal feeling is that we need to qualify every person who's eligible in the state of Arizona. Well, this is such an important issue because this population is at risk from the standpoint of long-term dependent care, but the maximization of independent living and self-directed life is our goal. So we wanna do as much as possible to help that happen. Next slide. So we start looking at these, and we're gonna go through each one of these. So learning is understanding and processing new information. And there are, there are scales that we can use. So psychological evaluation becomes an important part of this. Self-care, which means personal care skills, activities of daily living, toileting, cleaning, clothing, uh, those types of things. Receptive and expressive language. And this is interesting because uh, typically uh, the our members that we serve will have a significant communication deficit earlier in life. And there's a variety of high tech and artificial intelligence interventions that have benefited the population we serve. At the same time, we're looking at what happens at the other end of the age spectrum. As for instance, Alzheimer's disorders become more common in Down syndrome members who age, their ability to communicate erodes. And the same thing happens with organic brain syndrome, cognitive injuries, uh, things like that. So what happens is that we want to make sure that we're looking at maintaining or improving the quality of services as long as possible and as intensely as possible to maximize performance. Next slide. Mobility, moving safely and efficiently. I look at every emergency room evaluation every day. We had 54 members seen in the emergency room last night. Seven of them were from falls. Fall prevention is critical for our aging population. It is absolutely critical for our DDD population. And so mobility becomes a very important part of this. Cerebral palsy, uh, people think that it's a static disorder. It is not. It progresses and balance mechanisms. And all those things that Dr. Basford talked about in regard to risks, uh, in regard to the, uh, the evaluation of dementia, also go along with fall issues. And falls, a broken hip is devastating to the elders and to our population. Self-direction, managing one's life and well-being, that pursuit of happiness, being able to do the things they want. Uh, there's a lot of controversy in regard to, should our members have the right to make decisions regarding sexuality? Absolutely. We don't want them taken advantage of, but absolutely they have the right for relationships and how they feel they can express their sexuality. Do they have a right of risk? If a member feels that they want to smoke tobacco, even though I'm gonna do as much as I can to prevent that from happening, they still have that right. And that's something that the general population needs to realize. We don't wanna be paternalistic in regard to the care of our membership. Economic self-sufficiency. Now my sister Tina works in 
in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan at the Can Do Corporation. And she takes home a check, which she's very proud of, of $4.37 every week. And she deposits that into her bank account. Whenever she comes down to Arizona, she tells me clearly, I'll clean your house, but you have to pay me. Now, self-sufficiency should be better than that. You can't live on $4.37, but you need to have the ability to really go on and provide care for yourself to get the things that you want to have. And these are not luxuries, whether it's a teddy bear or a bicycle, these are all things that, that go along with that pursuit of happiness. And, uh, and, I, and I have to say, I'm very impressed with my sister's capacity to make decisions for herself with her own money. Next slide. And then we have the capacity for independent living, the ability to complete household chores, to live safely without immediate supervision. And that, that, is, as, that is such an important issue to have that sense of, I, I can make decisions for myself. I get the help I need for the things I have to have, but I can make decisions for myself. Next slide. So the things that we need to consider in adult care and, and adult DDD care is number one, monitor for changes in clinical care. All the things that, that uh, Dr. Basford talked about with thyroid assessments, B12 evaluations, you know, looking at imaging to make sure that there's not a subdural or some other things that are causing a person's degradation in overall function. Uh, residence issues, including safety, uh, with decreasing functioning and decreasing mobility. Um, I am I am adamant about a few things for our member population. Water safety. Now, my sister has a closet full of trophies from Special Olympics for swimming. She swims a hundred laps a day when she's at our house, but nobody allows her to be in the pool unless someone else is there. Our dogs are out there barking at her, thinking that because she always loves to play with them in the pool. But water safety is critically important. The second thing is any transportation in a vehicle, there needs to be some way to prevent injuries. Motor we have a very high rate of motor vehicle accidents in the Phoenix area. And Tina won't let us start the car unless she has her seatbelt on. That's absolutely important. Smoke detectors. We lost five members this year, 2023, from fires. It's one of the leading causes of death for the DDD population. It's our responsibility to make sure that we minimize that possibility as much as possible. When we start looking at advanced directives, that's a person's ability to choose who makes decisions for them when they cannot make those decisions. And how do they want to be cared for at the, at the waning years of their life? Five Wishes is wonderful. We're actually working with uh, the uh, Five Wishes company uh, that started off with a, uh, a not-for-profit grant, and they're now a corporation. Uh, their Five Wishes are recognized in the state of Arizona, but we need something for the DDD population. So they have a pediatric and an adolescent form, but we're, at, we're working with them to get a DDD form for Five Wishes. So. Keep on the watch for that. That's an exciting process. Hospice care. Many of our members, and we lose about one member a day, are in hospice care, secondary to a variety of, of illnesses associated with end of life. But hospice care can be critical in supporting our membership in the additional care they need during that end of life process. Rehabilitation versus habilitation. Rehabilitation is when you had a skill and you lost it. You broke your hip and you had to learn how to walk again. Habilitation is when you did not have a skill and you're trying to maintain it or improve it. So uh, we don't provide physical therapy and habilitation after age 21 because Altex and uh, LTC Care can provide that. However, um, DDD actually provides through contract services for habilitation care under the age of 21. Sleep issues, significant changes. Dr. Basford talked about 
uh, sleep apnea monitoring, but there's a variety of other sleep disorders besides obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, there was a very interesting study that came out last year that looked at uh, cardiovascular disease secondary to um, DDD. And this is, a, this is a significant issue that we need to look at. Proper nutrition, proper exercise, range of motion, fall prevention, all these things fall together there. Hydration to prevent bowel obstructions, fall prevention, pain evaluation and care, and Dr. Bashford addressed that earlier. Proper nutrition, uh, durable medical equipment, nursing assessments are now standardized uh, through a program we did with Northern Arizona University. And we're one of the first programs in the United States to have a standard nursing assessment for all of our membership, and then uh, the nursing services too. Next slide. So the next, the next four slides are actually just references that you can use to find out. My name is Anthony Decker. I am all in to support applications and for our membership to maximize their independence, to maximize their self-direction, and to maximize their pursuit of happiness. Thank you very much. I'm assuming that these slides will be available uh, in the chat. So that, uh, that's why I wanted to make sure that those resources were available to the membership here. Dr. Decker, we're actually gonna send all the slide decks um, via email to everyone so they'll have the actual slide deck as well. Excellent. I should add that uh, I was at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center from 1998 to 2010. And at that time, I met uh, Dr. Uh, Marwan Sabi, uh, and I'm very happy to see him again. So please extend that to him. I know he's off the line now, but his staff is on the line. I definitely will. Thank you so much. So I would like to, um, Tammy, would you like to facilitate the questions? So we have a few questions. Thank you so much for Sandy joining in for the team. So one question from the audience was, how to find the PCP or neurologist who are familiar with working with our population or specific to Down syndrome? So um, that's the question. Yeah, so we do have a couple um, special PCPs that we do use for our Down syndrome folks. Um, but if you are wanting some feedback, um, you can actually look uh, a go through Arizona, um, sorry, Down Syndrome Network of Arizona. They are a great resource. They have um, other families that will um, share their, you know, current providers that they use, that they recommend. Um, that's a great resource to reach out. I would say also the um, Sonoran Center of Excellence for Disability down at the university. Um, if if we don't have the answer, someone will work on finding it. Correct. I, I would like to add on that uh, there is a paucity of providers for the DDD population, not only diagnostic, but ongoing care. Uh, Vicki Copeland, who is uh, one of our medical directors at DDD, has uh, really um, initiated and pushed this concept of getting our doctors who are being trained in the state of Arizona minimum standards. And Dr. Basford has charged through and has now incorporated required experiences at the med school level at U of A. And we have, we have seven medical schools in Arizona now. This needs to be standard training for not only all the physicians, but also all the nurse practitioners and all the PAs. So the pipeline is more than 10 years long from the time you're in college by the time you're actually out practicing. So it's, a, it's, it's an effort that's gonna take a while to take off, but there's enthusiastic response by all the medical schools uh, that we've contacted. The other thing, the other thing, too, I wanted to mention is um, if you are having any concerns with your Down syndrome family member or, um, you know, someone that you know, a lot of times Dr. Sabal will kind of be the doctor of all trades. So if it, even if it's a, say you're having some kind of um, 
you know, concern about memory or behaviors or something like that. At one point, Dr. Sabah will decide to go ahead and be the neurologist and PCP if you don't want to go anywhere else. Next question. So that's the only question I got in the chat. Um, oh. I can just read it, Dr. Decker, it's Liz. Um, I was just wondering if there was anywhere on the division website or any specific person that a family or a caregiver could reach out to to find any specialized um, IDD dementia resources, like on the medical side of it. On the clinical side, uh, it sh I should make sure everyone understands that I don't provide, neither do our medical directors, face-to-face uh, -face medical services. Uh, all of us have left clinical medicine to uh, go into the administrative arena, but um, it's, it's important to understand that in the Division of Developmental Disabilities, we have three different uh, service providers, United Healthcare, Mercy Care Plan, and the Tribal Health Plan. Uh, so all 51,000 members get their services through that, that system. But I will say that if there's any problems in that, they have uh, a, a pretty tight program to resolve issues. I just was working with an issue today in which a, a member parent wanted to maintain continued relationship with a provider that they absolutely loved. And uh, the health plans were completely cooperative in making that happen. So uh, it, there's, there's family support services and there's OIFA, which is the um, uh, really the family and member education and support. So if there's any questions, you're welcome to contact me directly and uh, I can point you in the right direction, but uh, our website does have OIFA, the OIFA office, and Leah Gibbs is in charge of that, and she will, she'll track down whatever services uh, are necessary that we can coordinate with you. And then also the information generally about IDD and dementia support. So Dr. Kathy Bishop's uh, slides would include the NTG website information family care support, and also other practical uh, support guidelines, plus Down Syndrome, uh, National Down Syndrome Society, they have fantastic booklets about them. So those are listed in her slide. So we will share those slides and that would be really helpful for the support coordinator, as well as the family member. member. And I know that Barb Picone, who just put a message in chat, she's from OIFA and will uh, have a presentation after us. Wonderful. Well, if we have no further questions, I think we'll um, say thank you to our presenters here and go ahead and transition to our next quick session, which is going to be another me in a minute session. I believe the last one for today. Lizzie, um, is it okay for Sandy to put her clinic information in the chat? Um, yes, of course. Okay, wonderful, Please. thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful part of my day, that's for sure. Thank you very much, wonderful having all of you. And thank you so much to a, another great round of presenters. I thought I'd also take a moment to share my furry, uh, furry four-legged, I'm not sure if you can see McLean here, um, but he's joining us, he's leaving us um, as we go into this last session. So I'm gonna take the opportunity to try to weave in some of the different stories that we've learned today as we go into this last me in a minute series. Um, so what we'll do is, We'll start with the deep breathing technique that you learned in the very beginning. Um, if you weren't here for that, that's okay. I'm gonna go over it again. And then we're gonna layer in some different options. 
So Eileen, if you wouldn't mind clicking it, there's a purple slide that has um, some different words on it. And so I wanted to, to just give you the heads up that eventually what I will do is walk you through weaving in one word and then weaving in a short phrase into your breathing cycle. So if this is something that you're like, I just wanna stick with deep breathing, that's completely fine. But what we wanna do is equip you with some ways to add on to this free evidence-based resource of just using deep breathing. Before, we, before I walk you through this, I also just wanna give you a real life story of what this can look like um, from a caregiver that I worked with a couple months ago. And so one of the things that was coming up in the particular home was stress, especially in regards to pacing. Um, to getting up in the middle of the night to help his wife with toileting and also some verbal aggression. And so when we think of deep breathing, I, I do think it's very tempting to think that it is something that we have to like stop, sit down, relax. And of course, that's, that's awesome if that's possible, but so many of us know that is not always the case. So I just wanna share that in the, in the particular story, that I just mentioned about the, the husband who was facing these challenges with the pacing, with the verbal aggression and getting up at night. When he, uh, after he learned this technique of the deep breathing, he reported back that it helped him the most in the bathroom at night, um, or perhaps early morning, we should say. When he knew that he was going to need to get up, he knew she was going to be in there. He knew he needed to help. But he knew that also the part of the triangle that he could influence was how he showed up with his wife in those moments. And so he even used a post-it note that just said deep breath and he put it um, in the bathroom. So I invite you to think of perhaps a scenario as we go through these deep breaths, since you have kind of the luxury, potentially, I'm not sure you're, many of you are not on camera, but we don't, we have the opportunity to probably be sitting still right now but if you don't, or if you are just on the move, know that this could be an awesome opportunity to practice the deep breathing while moving. So I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate the use of first, the basic deep breathing. I'm gonna walk you through using one word. We'll transition out of that back to just the basic deep breathing. And then I'll walk you through a couple deep breaths using a short phrase. I will go ahead and pick the word and phrase unless there's one that really resonates with you on the screen that you wanna start using already on your own. So I invite you to find um, a comfortable position wherever you are. Perhaps if you're walking right now or on the move, maybe you just come a little bit deeper into your body or into the experience that you're in. Again, perhaps just noticing what is a color of something right in front of you, just coming deeper into the sensory experience. If you're able to and it's safe, I invite you to close your eyes and see if you can take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. You're gonna slowly exhale through your lips. See if you can relax your jaw or your shoulders on that exhale. And again, see if you can take a deep inhale through your nose and hold it. Exhale slowly through your lips. See if you can relax your jaw, your shoulders. And I'm gonna have you keep using that rhythm of breathing as I begin to weave in the use of one word into the next breath cycle. So you're probably coming down to the end of an exhale. So on the next inhale, I want you to do it the same way we've been doing it. So just take a deep inhale through the nose and hold it. And on this exhale, I just want you to say to yourself, open as you exhale. We'll try it again. See if you can inhale through your nose and hold it just on a silent inhale. As you exhale, just say to yourself a one word, like open. Take another deep inhale through your nose and hold it. 
On that exhale, bring in your single word, such as open. And I'm gonna have you continue that breathing cycle as I introduce you to using a short phrase. So again, we're just using that same rhythm of breathing, but now I'm gonna show you how to use two words or different syllables. So on that inhale, see if you can inhale and say the word to yourself, show me. Hold it at the top. As you exhale, you could say to yourself, away. So maybe this is, again, I'm gonna have you keep going as I, I give you a visual here, but perhaps you are this, in the position of the spouse. Maybe it's the middle of the night, you're walking into the, to the bathroom. You know that you're gonna need to be helpful. So on an inhale, you're saying to yourself, show me, hold it at the top, exhale away. Again, I'm going to have you keep using that rhythm while I just say a little bit more about this. That show me a way can perhaps just be a conversation with some source of wisdom. Perhaps it's just the wisdom of uh, creativity or the wisdom uh, that exists in our bodies. Um, or you can use a completely different phrase. So I'm going to try using thank you on our next and last round of breathing. So on an inhale, you can say think, hold it at the top, exhale, say you. And we'll do one more. See if you can take an inhale, saying to yourself one word like think, hold it at the top, exhale slowly as you say to yourself you. At the end of that exhale, I invite you in no rush at all to begin to just wiggle your toes, maybe wiggle your fingers, maybe just move your lips or slowly blink your eyes open. So just noticing your body in the room and knowing that ultimately these are just a variety of ways that you can layer on stress reduction or stress management to give yourself a relaxation response. This doing the deep breathing with any of the variety that you've learned today really can be the way that you give yourself, that you kind of influence the part of the triangle that you can influence, a way to begin to, to relax. With this being said, I'm going to Transition over to Eileen as I invite you to do just a one word reflection. So from your answer, we will have kind of a word cloud, but I wanna ask you, what word describes what you will take away from today's me in a minute? And again, if you just had to pick one word that describes what you wanna take away from today's me in a minute series, what would that one word be? And Eileen will walk you a little bit through to um, accessing this if you need help with that. Well, I really thank you, Mo. And that was, that was a beautiful segue into this. So what I'm going to ask that you do um, is either use your phone or open up another browser. And if you can't, maybe you can enter the information to the chat. But give this a try because it's a lot of fun. I'd like you to go to www.menti.com. And the code is right there, which is 6415. 7963. And I'm going to ask that you go ahead and enter that information. And I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen. And then I'm going to open up that Minty option too. So bear with me for a second, please, everybody. Move everybody down, go into presentation. So we already start to see that we've got some additions here. We've got some wonderful words to describe what it is that we'll be taking away today. Freedom, I like the ah, dream, amazing, common distraction free. And by the way, it can be more than one word. Um, stillness, I like the word this. Uh, grateful, yes, reflection freedom, 
charming. <laughs> These are all words because as individuals, as caregivers, whether we're professional or personal, we all have a very, very different journey, different intensities, different types of care. We've learned so much today, not only about what is out there for the people that we love, but what is for ourselves as well, which is one of the reasons why we decided to offer you this Me in a Minute presentation. Because as we develop care plans for our loved ones, we need to develop care plans for ourselves. Peace. Dream, yes, these are absolutely magnificent and beautiful, beautiful terms. And I don't know if we have any in the chat, I'm not sure, but um, this is beautiful. Clarity, advocacy, relaxation, it can be done. You know, it's interesting because when we talk about self-care, it's as if people have different interpretations of exactly what that means. You know, we have these levels of stress and how do we define that? And what period of time can we do that? And I'm so grateful for everyone to provide grace and space to learn about that today as we continue to take care of our loved ones. Uplifting, that's a beautiful one. Learning, yes, we're always learning, right? I mean, this is just, it's such an incredible, sad. That's the thing too. I mean, it's okay that we lean into the negative and the, you know, the, both the negative and the positive. And sometimes, yes, we're gonna feel sad. As caregivers, one of the things that we find is that, you know, we are, it's a hard job, but we can get a sense of satisfaction out of it, but we have to figure out how we can do that as we care for ourselves. So thank you so much for your participation in that. You can feel free to continue to add to that. And what I am just going to do is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about resources um, that are available. And if you can bear with me for just a second, because technology has not been on my side today. <laughs> okay, didn't do it. Hang on for a second, please. Okay, I think I got it. Hang on. Okay. So when we decided to have this beautiful conference that's so beautifully organized and we have these wonderful people providing us with so much magnificent information, we also thought about the caregiver and we thought about you. And we wanted to have these me in a minute opportunities to give you space to tell you that we honor you and that how we can figure out ways to define our own ways of, of caring for ourselves and how we can take steps forward. And just some thoughts. So who am I? <laughs> I'm Eileen Lawless. I work as a dependent care specialist at a department of uh, called Life and Work Connections at the University of Arizona. We are dedicated to providing life and work balance, integration, and wellness to our University of Arizona community. What do I do? I take care or I work with those who are caregivers of adults and older adults. So my background, I've worked in hospice, nursing home, and assisted living situations. I specialize in long-term behavioral care as well as Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. So what I get to do is I get to sit down with people and hear about their caregiving situation. And together we come up with a plan, not only to care for their loved one, to connect them to the resources that they might need, but to also develop a care plan for the caregiver and do that exact same thing. So some of the things that we've carried along with us, whenever I meet with caregivers, there's a very good possibility that they're very stressed. And a lot of times when we have that stress level, we often feel like we are alone. And as Liz and Mo and Tracy beautifully said before, you are not alone. And I get to have that honor of letting our caregivers at the University of Arizona know exactly that. So just some things. Now, just to ask you to be a little patient with me, because when I work with caregivers, I work with caregivers who are carrying a multitude of different types of caregiving, if that makes sense, varying levels of intensity. They might be caring for somebody who is in their home. They might be caring for somebody who is in another state or in another country. And, you know, their roles may vary. 
And then we think about those other roles that we have as far as community and family. So one of the things, even if we're caregivers over a long period of time, just some things that I usually talk to caregivers about, and I'm gonna use the letter R quite a lot. <laughs> Reframe, we're gonna revisit and just reevaluate. So every once in a while, we might go through this journey, we might see changes. And along with that, we just wanna make sure we're looking at our loved one and we're looking at what we need as well. Okay, so just some things that I, I offer people is a lot of times caregiver apps are great ways. And a lot of times people say, okay, great. I have, you know, we text each other. That's great. But caregiver apps can really give you more intricate communication, can allow that other caregiver to perhaps, you know, make the practical plans that you need, you know, like uh, doctor's appointments and care, uh, you know, going to a support group and how can we make sure transportation, things like that, they can help, that can ease that process a little bit more. The other thing is I find a lot of caregivers are using face, uh, Facebook groups as well. And they're really finding that not just for the emotional implications, but for the, for the practical as well. I'm looking for a commode. Uh, my loved one just had a fall. And now that we need a commode for a, a temporary period of time. One of the things I find that caregivers are so busy and it could be, you know, I want to connect them to the information. I want to connect them to what is available. I want to connect them to resources that are available. So I ask that we make sure, you know, you hear the term support group, but let's make sure that you're getting to it and you know where to go in order to get it. Let's make sure that maybe a virtual caregiver support group might be a little better than maybe in person. We've talked, you know, we have Pima Council on Aging, we have area agencies on aging, and we see these initiatives where we are looking at dementia-friendly communities and partnerships. And one of those things I find is just opportunities like dementia cafes, you know, having that opportunity to be with your loved one and just have some fun. Um, like Dr. Decker mentioned before, it to enjoy life. And I think if we have a group full of people right now who know how to enjoy life and deal with that stress, you're here right now. And I'm grateful for that. So I mentioned before, we want to tap into, maybe we looked at the Area Agency on Aging. Maybe we got in contact with Pima Council on Aging before, and maybe it didn't apply to us. But maybe now it does. And the other thing I want to point out is we talked about aging before. So a lot of times I will have caregivers who are, say, over the age of 50 saying, oh, you know, we don't really need that for my mom, but maybe we need it for us. Maybe if we're over 55, maybe there's some valuable services that we can incorporate as we are aging and as we are caregivers. And then, of course, I also look at, we talked a lot about advocacy relating to diagnosis. And again, I ask for your grace because I work with a lot of individuals with very, very different diagnosis, but a lot of times I find if we revisit it, we might be able to find something that can be helpful. Will it be a magic wand? Maybe not, but I'll give you an example. I recently talked to the, uh, muscul the Muscular Sclerosis Society who offers transportation assistance to those who may need it. So there are a lot of wonderful, wonderful services available. Okay, so then when we look at that R word, you know, when we reframe, when we revisit, when we reevaluate, we talked about self-care and I'm so grateful for your time in doing that. So we all define that in different ways. We have different intensities of caregiving that we offer. But what I want you to think about again is what is it that we can do to revisit that, those aspects of self-care? Is it reaching out to our community? and asking for help. Maybe it's accepting help at this point with these changes. Maybe the really nice thing is that we have some great resources available uh, relating to respite. So for example, I love to refer people to the Arizona Caregiver Coalition. They have a wonderful re uh, respite reimbursement program. And the neat thing is in my research, I find that a lot of people are starting to a lot of advocacy agencies are reevaluating what respite means and offering that flexibility to caregivers. And, and it's good for us to find out what's out there for us. I talked about those connections, you know, maybe finding those connections through support groups, through those dementia cafes. I'm re repeating myself a little bit there, but I guess I just wanted to add in, you know, those are the wonderful things that I want you to be aware of as you look at your caregiving situation, because it's never really linear, right? 
And it's like, we have to flex and we have to pivot along with that. So I want to say so much thank you to Tracy and to Mo for their wonderful presentations. We learned a lot about breathing. We learned about um, the labyrinth and, compa and capacitor training. We also learned about, you know, uh, emotion freedom and technique. And these are all wonderful uh, tools that I hope that you'll put in your own personal toolkit. So um, I just also wanted to let everybody know that we have some magnificent raffle uh, prizes that are up. I'm talking really good. As you can see, we have some listed here, which includes a, a beautiful gift bag, um, massage stick in a pillow from Tracy Carroll, uh, from Marsha, we have the, the gift bag, from Art de la Vida, we have decorative pillows, and we have from Yumi some beautiful mini massages in a class. But wait, there's more. We have gift certificates from ACES Massage School. We have a, uh, two free admissions to the Roadhouse Cinema. We have a DoorDash gift certificate. We have one, three, and six month memberships, free memberships at either the Tucson JCC or the JCC Valley of the Sun. Wait a minute, there is more. We also have uh, some, we have books on exactly what Tracy was talking about before with Capacitor. So I'm very grateful that that is being donated. We have five of those. We also have uh, a gift card to Dee's Island Grill here in Tucson, as well as a parish restaurant in Tucson and, and two $75 uh, cash gifts as well. So with that being said, um, I thank you. And again, all the resources we have, we will be having the um, presentations being emailed to you. That will also include the resources that we talked about uh, today. So once again, that drawing is going to come up once you do that exit uh, survey. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Eileen, and to the whole team who put together these wonderful Me in a Minute sessions. Um, we're going to go ahead and move to break. Uh, we are just a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to make sure to take a five minute break right now, which means the next session will be starting at about 1.42.
Okay, that concludes our short break there and we're ready for the next presentation. So up next, we have Accessing Support and Services. This is gonna be presented by Harbhajan Khalsa, Morgan Hartford, Helena Morgan, Nicole LeMay, Catherine Steele Watson, Barbara Picone, and David Silverstone. All right, hello everyone. Just bear with me while I get my screen up. Right. Hello everyone. My name is Harbhajan Khalsa. I am. Um, I work for Pima Council on Aging, and I am the Dementia Capable Southern Arizona Program Director. I have had the pleasure of working at PCOA for four years now, and I have been in this current role for two years. We provide a variety of services for people living with memory loss and their caregivers. Um, I will go into those services, but first I wanted to do a little bit of an overview of PCOA for those of you that may not be as familiar. So Pima Council on Aging is the designated area agency on aging in Pima County. We are a nonprofit and we have been around since 1967. We primarily serve people 60 years of age and older. We really try to target services towards those who have the greatest economic and social needs. We are a service planner. We provide coordination. We provide advocacy. We also have a large emphasis on supporting caregivers. And recently we have um, delved into dementia programming. So I will talk about that in a little bit. I also wanted to highlight two of the other organizations under our PCOA umbrella. We have Pima Care at Home, which is a non-medical home care agency that provides personal care, homemaker services, companionship, and supervision. It's for ser it serves all ages. There is no age limit for those services. Um, it is a fee-based service. They do accept all text plans and self-pay. We also have our Caregiver Training Institute, which trains certified caregivers, nursing assistants, and assisted living managers. So I know Eileen was just talking about this in um, the conversation before about how to access services for cam family caregivers and understanding what services are available in your area and in your community. So at PCOA, we have designated services for family caregivers. These services are available in person, over the phone, and also via Zoom. We have one-on-one -on -one caregiver consultation. We have a variety of trainings designed for caregivers. We offer, I believe, 11 or 12 caregiver support groups in Pima County. These are both in-person and virtual at sites throughout Pima County. We offer respite care support services. We also have a program designed to assist grandparents who are raising grandchildren. And we have newly launched what we are calling Empowering Caregivers, which is a workplace support program that is designed to support caregivers who are working full-time and then providing care after work. I next wanted to talk about Dementia Capable Southern Arizona. So this is the program that I um, have the privilege of being a part of, and we have been doing this work for about two years now. So we have a couple of goals, and Eileen kind of set this up perfectly for me. Um, so one is we're really working on early detection of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Uh, we are utilizing the NTG, EDSD, to screen folks in the IDD community. And we are utilizing an AD8 for screening other older adults. These screenings are free of cost and they can be done um, in our office or in your home. We're also in the process of creating a dementia-friendly community. So our hope for that is that every sector of our community will be dementia-friendly. And I'll get into that in a little bit. We are also working to create strong partnerships to strengthen resources for those people living with dementia and their caregivers. And we're looking at ways that we can bridge the gap in services. 
So what are areas that are not being fulfilled right now and how can we provide support? So a little bit more about dementia-friendly Pima County. So we are currently in this process right now. Um, we have had a resolution adopted by Marin Council. And for those of you that may not be familiar, a dementia-friendly community is a town or a village or a community where most people understand dementia and there is less fear and stigma for interacting with people who are experiencing dementia. I like to say, if I'm an individual living with dementia, my family can be comforted knowing that everyone I interact with, if I take the bus, go to the grocery store, go to the bank, has some understanding of what memory loss and dementia can look like. So if I'm needing support and services, people can intercede and give me that assistance that I need. So we're very excited to be able to bring this to our community. In addition to this, there is a dementia-friendly training that we offer, and we have a specific IDD component for that. We also offer options counseling in Pima County. So this is where we can provide memory screenings, as I was saying, the NTG EDSD or the 88. We also provide one-on-one -on -one support and consultation. So we'll meet with families, figure out what are the goals. We create a person-centered plan to help accomplish those goals as they relate to memory loss. Are you needing resources, information, referrals? assistance obtaining a diagnosis, looking at housing options. We really focus on meeting our clients where they're at to provide them with the best level of care. And we will come to you. So our services, again, can be in office, in home, over the phone, whatever you're the most comfortable with, we will be happy to oblige. Eileen mentioned memory cafes. And so this is something we're very excited to offer in our community. So right now we have two cafes in Pima County and a memory cafe is a socialization space for people who are experiencing memory loss in their caregivers. We like to say you leave your diagnosis at the door. It's an opportunity to just take a deep breath, not have to worry about your problems and know that the people that you're interacting with are trained in understanding what you're going through. We have a lot of fun at our cafes. Most of ours right now are musically themed. We like to do sing-alongs and have an opportunity for folks to play instruments and interact with the musicians. We also had the book bike from the Pima County Library come and have free books available for participants. We do arts and crafts. Uh, next week at our cafe, we are actually hosting Ben's Bells and we will be doing um, some crafts with them and then at the end of the month, we'll be having a, another local musician come for a sing-along. And our hope is to expand these. Memory cafes are available across the world. They are in the United States, across in the United Kingdom. So if you're interested, there's a lot of resources online to find a memory cafe in your community. I wanted to highlight, while we've talked about general support groups for caregivers, there are also some very specific dementia caregiver support groups. And I'm sure Morgan will talk about those with the Alzheimer's Association. Banner Alzheimer's Institute also has several that are offered monthly. Right now, all of theirs are on Zoom. And I'm very excited. We have partnered with the Alzheimer's Association and PCLA, and we have a dementia care partner support group that is happening monthly and in person in our office in central Tucson. So we're very excited to offer that to our community. So thank you so much for taking time and listening to me today. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, I will be hanging around. Um, my contact information is here. And the best way to reach our services is by calling our helpline at 520-790-7262 or going online to PCOA dot org for more information. Thank you very much, Habajin. Um, next to it would be Mulligan uh, from Alzheimer's Association.
Excellent. Well, Harbhajan, thank you. And thank you to Pima Council on Aging. Uh, Dementia Capable Southern Arizona is an amazing initiative. And uh, PCOA has been an incredible collaborator and partner in all of that work. Uh, and let me share my screen. I'm really excited to um, share some complimentary resources um, to the other ones that we'll hear about today. Go. Oh, geez, my computer's a little bit slow. There we go. All right. So very grateful for the opportunity to share these resources about the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, my name is Morgan Hartford. I'm the community executive uh, here at the Alzheimer's Association Desert Southwest chapter out of our Tucson office. Our Desert Southwest chapter has offices throughout the state serving communities near you uh, through our free programs and services. And I'm really Happy to share some of those with you today. So just as a brief overview, many of you know this already, but um, our latest facts and figures report shows that more than 6 million Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's disease today. Um, you can find more information about the facts and figures at alz.org facts for details about that. But Arizona is at the epicenter of this Alzheimer's crisis. More than 150,000 people over age 65 are living with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, more than 261,000 caregivers who are unpaid providing that care to those to their loved ones. And the Alzheimer's Association is focused on accelerating Alzheimer's research, uh, as well as research around all other dementias, um, providing risk reduction information, early detection, and maximizing that quality care and support for all those affected. And apologize. Okay, there we go. We are dedicated to reaching all communities. So we believe that uh, it's an important to be able to uh, provide access to care and support to all communities, regardless of who they are or where they are. And we do that in a number of different ways through our free programs and services, um, through our 24-hour helpline available at 800-272-3900, uh, also available via chat as well. Sorry, my slides are really encouraging me just to move on, so I apologize about that. Great resources at our website, alz.org, and at our alz.org, uh, Alzheimer's Association, and AARP Community Resource Finder. I want to share some of those resources with you. This is a screenshot of our community resource finder uh, where you can find programs and events from the Alzheimer's Association, from AARP. You can also find local resources, including your area agency on aging, home care agencies, additional community services, housing options, and medical services, all in this one hub. Uh, now, this is great for people living uh, here in Arizona, but you may be a caregiver or have family members that you need to help uh, find help with in other parts of the country, you can access that information here on our community resource finder, finder as well. In addition to that tool, our helpline uh, has also launched a chat feature, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. Uh, really excited about the ability to not just call our helpline staff, uh, our clinical staff are available 24 hours a day in 200 different languages. And these are master's level clinicians allowing you to uh, provide support at any time of day in a number of different topics and providing that, um, that care consultation that's ongoing as well. So again, really nice compliment to what our budget shared. You can find that information at alz.org slash help and support. And we have Alls Connected, our online uh, networking community and message board. We can talk with other caregivers throw out uh, challenges you may be having, uh, celebrate wins, um, and, and find those connections for people all over the country. And we've got uh, education programs and services both locally in person and online. So here is a screenshot of our help and support page at alz.org. You can see that live chat feature 
uh, right there where you can chat with our clinical staff 24 hours a day. You can also access this information in Spanish. And here's a screenshot of our Alls Connected message board. So very excited about this. You can see these ongoing discussion threads in English and in Spanish for people living with dementia, for caregivers, um, really incredible. And uh, again, all of this is available for free and whenever you need it. So maybe you have a question that you just wanna put out there um, and see what comes back. Well, you're harnessing information from caregivers all over the country when you do that. And we have a really amazing Alls Navigator that was just uh, updated recently. That's a step-by-step -step process in accessing the care that you need. This is a choose your own adventure, if you will, uh, way to access this. And I wanna stop sharing this for just a second so I can actually show you some of these resources. Give me just a second and I'll pull that up. All right, so here's an example of some of the information that you'll find uh, at the Alzheimer's Association. Sorry, it looks like you're seeing my PowerPoint still. Give me just a second. Actually, Morgan, we have the Alzheimer's Association website up there, if that's what you were oh, needing to share. You yep. That. Excellent. I'm so glad. This is the, the challenge of and, and beauty of working with two different screens here. So um, you can see some of the information that you might find at the Alzheimer's Association website, alz.org, uh, as well as our online education resources. So this is an example of what you'll find online um, at alz.org, education programs, about warning signs, important conversations, money management, et cetera and our Alls Navigator that I'm really excited to share. So this is a step-by-step -step tutorial. It's gonna ask you questions about your role. Say that you're a caregiver for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. We'll go through this process with you and ask you um, a number of questions where you're, uh, about who you're supporting. And it's gonna give you some specific information when you're done about the resources and next steps. It's creating this DIY action plan for, for care that you can then share with family and friends to support you along the way. Of course, the Alzheimer's Association is always available for you um, as you go through that process. Again, these programs and services are provided for free from the Alzheimer's Association, coordinating with local agencies as well, like Pima Council on Aging. Um, and Arizona State University is another really great partner who provides a program called CarePro that I wanna give a plug for as well. Uh, so this is a, a grant funded program that um, the Alzheimer's Association has partnered with in the past, is currently being facilitated uh, with Arizona State University, uh, but another really amazing uh, didactic, uh, interactive um, program over the course of weeks for caregivers, including uh, those caregivers of intellectual, uh, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I would definitely encourage this program as well. And you can search for Care Pro uh, at ASU to find more information about that. So I want to thank you for uh, taking allowing me to take some time and share those resources with you. And uh, always happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Mongan. Next up is from Hospice of Valley, uh, Helena. Hi. Let's see. Can you see me on screen? There we go. Good afternoon. Okay. Let me screen share. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yes. 
All right. So uh, I'm Helena Morgan. I'm a dementia education specialist with Hospice of the Valley. I work specifically for a program that we have called Supportive Care for Dementia, uh, which is a non-hospice program. And so Hospice of the Valley offers a lot more than just hospice services and our supportive care for dementia program are one of the things that were developed to help the community um, with those who are caring for individuals who are living with dementia. So I'm here to talk a little bit about our program today. So our program was started back in 2013. We are currently grant funded as well. Um, and we currently have a grant that uh, allows us to help service and provide more support to those who are living with IDD and their families. So we do have a special focus um, to help individuals who are living with IDD and help their families and care, caregivers or care partners, whether they're family related or professional care partners, understand what is happening with those cognitive changes that are no longer maybe um, habilitative, I guess, and help them to maintain abilities. As was mentioned in multiple of the conversations today, that the those that are living with Down syndrome or living with other IDD disabilities and also Alzheimer's or dementia are having some changes. And so we need to handle that approach a little bit differently. So with our program, uh, we will also help to improve health outcomes of both the person living with dementia, and we also spend a lot of focus on the care partner or caregiver to help them live well. So our supportive care for dementia, what it is, is a in-person visit if the individual lives in Maricopa County. And we make those visits wherever that individual lives, whether it's in their personal home, with family, or in a group home or facility. They will get on average about five visits and spans out to be about five or six months. And they'll be working with our dementia educators. If we feel that services need to continue, we can prolong the services uh, to provide support as needed. If we have an individual who's living outside of Maricopa County, we can provide visits and support over the phone or via Zoom. Um, we're gonna work to support anybody living with dementia, whether they have a diagnosis or not. So it's not required that they have a formal diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia. Sometimes what we're doing is stepping in and providing education and guidance on how they can pursue a diagnosis if wished. Uh, we're gonna coach, we're gonna educate caregivers on their approach. That's their approach towards the behaviors that they may be experiencing from that person living with dementia. So if somebody's having signs of agitation, aggression, uh, maybe they're trying to leave their location or having issues with insomnia, um, any other things that could be causing disruptive behaviors for that caregiver, we're gonna help teach them about their approach and try and take a holistic approach at it to see is there something that could be happening in the environment or maybe something that's affecting mind, body, or spirit and take a non-pharmacological approach at helping to relieve some of those symptoms and help that caregiver understand. We're gonna provide community resources. So we may work on connecting individuals with Arizona long-term care. We will connect them with area agency on aging, maybe uh, different home care agencies or whatever that need is for that individual patient or family. It's definitely um, an individualized support system because every family may have different needs. We're gonna to continue to provide support for families and the group home caregivers while they're on this journey of dementia and to help them live well. We utilize um, a couple different tools uh, with our system. When we're doing our admissions, we use something called a ZBI, which helps us understand where that level of caregiver stress is. Uh, we'll do an initial ZBI, and then we also utilize something called an NPI, which help us 
helps us to understand the person living with dementia and any symptoms that they may be experiencing and how it is also affecting the caregiver. And with those two uh, assessments that we utilize, it helps to give us tools as a care team to figure out what we need to focus on. And then our goal is to really try and reduce those numbers. And we will repeat those assessments again at the end of our visits to see if we were able to make any decrease in the burden that caregiver may have been feeling, or maybe to help them understand those behaviors that they may have been experiencing from that person living with dementia, and if we can help reduce those behaviors as well. We've noticed that with our care and support that we are offering through our program, that we are having lower hospital rates, lower ER visits, and so it's something that we are proud of as an organization. We also have our Dementia Care and Education Campus, uh, which is located in Arcadia, uh, 44th Street, just south of Indian School. And there we have a bunch of different opportunities that are available. Some of them are of no cost, but some of them are private pay. Uh, we pride ourselves in our education center that we have at the campus. And there you might find Mary Beth giving some educational workshops. Uh, those run on Thursdays and those are of no cost. We also have an adult day club there and a child care center, which are some great components for individuals that are living with dementia. It will help give them uh, things to do and help engage them during the day and while also giving the caregiver a little bit of respite. And with our child care center, what we will do is some multi-generational integration. We see some great outcomes with those two. Um, our adult day club is a private pay option. Uh, we also have an assisted living center, a very small unit there that is also private pay that focuses on people living with dementia. We do have a small inpatient hospice unit there as well for our hospice patients since we are a part of Hospice of the Valley. And then uh, there was mention of memory cafes and how beneficial they can be. And so the memory cafe is something that we also offer at our campus every Monday within the education center. And that is something that is of no cost to the care partners and the person living with dementia. So we have a really great community of members that come and participate in the memory care cafe um, every week. And so it's been really great to see the relationships that have grown because of that and the support that they offer each other. So below you can see that is the website to our dementia campus and you can log on to that website if you're interested to look at the available classes that we offer weekly. And then we also have a couple things like support groups that can be attended in person um, that or that can also be attended online as well. Since we are uh, working with that grant and immersing into the IDD population. We also have a partnership with Opportunity Tree, and you'll get to hear a little bit more about that from Layla, who is uh, one of the coordinators that works with Opportunity Tree. But we have partnered with them to help provide support and services for their members and for their caregivers to help them understand some of these changes that the person living with dementia and IDD may be experiencing. And so, like I said, she will bring a little bit more to that um, later on, I think, in the panel discussion. Some information about how to get a referral for the Supportive Care for Dementia program. If you know somebody that's interested or you yourself might be interested, as I mentioned, you do not have to have or be on hospice services to be a part of our Supportive Care for Dementia program. It is a non-hospice program. We are a no-cost no program, so we do not bill insurance. We're currently funded by grants, and you also do not need to have a physician referral. So anybody can call and make a referral for somebody who's living with dementia-related changes, and you can do that by calling the phone number there or by simply sending an email. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So next person is um, from the Banner Alzheimer's Institute. And Nicole 
Lomi, she called this morning. She unfortunately got really sick today. So、um, she asked me to share the slide on behalf of her. And she、um, very, very sad and apologized that she couldn't visit、um, here in person. But she has a beautiful program. And、um, Banner Alzheimer's Institute has. Multiple、um, programs relating to the dementia support. And her program is particularly developed for supporting the native and、um, native communities. So the slide would capture what programming are available for our community. So I'm just going to share some slides, and I, I know some parts and other parts I do not know. So for the future, You are free to reach out to her, and I will share the slide with other slides、um, in a couple of days with you by email. So, since 2003, they, the Banner Alzheimer's Institute have a Native American project, and they, their goal is to increase knowledge and awareness of Alzheimer's and related dementia. And then also, they have a particular study. Talk,、um, Learning about the memory loss and non memory loss, how to live in, age,、uh, in the community. So, they have a, a signature kind of a newsletter that goes out with the members and Beacon newsletter, and they have a specific unit,、uh, one for the Native American community. And they do highlight some of the stories in those newsletters. So it's really nice to receive those if you are interested. In And they do also have a face mat、um, learning about a bit of the culture and other、um, information about dementia. So this is a Native American、uh, place mat. So the person who are impacted by dementia can. Use as a coloring book as well as the、um, information sheet. And they do have a wonderful music program、um, with the CD as well. And they do have、uh, brain health information and、um, their educational services. And those are majority of those services are for free and some require some cost. Dementia Flint's Champion program. And then this one,、um, we asked them to present this piece, Supporting Tribal Caregivers. So, this is a toolkit training for the caregivers. It's an intensive planning book, and it's a beautifully made based on the cultural kind of support and background to capture.、Um, A culturally sensitive way of how to adapt our support for the individuals. And it is available, but it, it may have some fees or cost、um, because it comes with the beautiful package. And if you are interested in it, please reach out to her directly as well. And also, they do host a monthly、um, Native American circle group. So, again, I apologize that、uh, we couldn't have her here today, but her voice was gone. So, she just couldn't stop coughing. So,、um, for the future, please reach out to her. And she's wonderful. And part of why we are inviting all those providers in this space together, because when you talk to everybody, that's why we have Habajin and、um, Morgan and Elena from the Aging Network. Um, when we work together as a,、um, partners, we don't really have the barrier to who are the DD workers versus aging network. So,、um, Nicole is one of them as well, that she's very personable and wonderful. So, let's stop sharing the slide here. Okay, so, I think the timing is a bit earlier, but we will move on to our next、uh, presenter.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to take a minute to share my screen. Okay, can you all see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So my name is Catherine Steele Watson. I am the program development coordinator with the Arizona Caregiver Coalition. I hear a little bit of feedback here, so I don't know if someone needs to mute or it's on my end. But we'll just go ahead and move on. So who are family caregivers? Family caregivers can be anybody. They can be your friend, your neighbor, maybe even yourselves, especially for those who are joining the conference today. Family caregivers do a variety of tasks. Some of that includes shopping, medications, bathing, dressing, me medication management, transportation to doctor's appointments. These are just a few examples of what family caregivers do, but really there are so many more tasks that go beyond just this limited list here. And I like to always ask the people I present to if you are a family caregiver, which I know most of us are joining the call today, but if you want to add into the chat and just say I am a family caregiver or maybe you're here on behalf of a family member who is a family caregiver, you can also say I know a family caregiver, just feel free to drop it into the chat. So the Arizona Caregiver Coalition is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to improve the quality of life of family caregivers all across Arizona through collaborative partnerships, advocacy, resources, and respite support. And our vision is for Arizona family caregivers to have the hope and resources to overcome obstacles of care in both urban and rural communities. We operate the Caregiver Resource Line, which is that 1-888-737-7494 number, and it is live Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., but you can also leave messages. You can also email us at info at azcaregiver.org, and this resource line is exactly that. It is a resource line for family caregivers all across the state to find those services, the respite support, resources, support groups, any information you are looking for, whether it is through Arizona Caregiver Coalition services or through our collaborative partnerships, you can call our resource line and we can help you direct you to the service that is right for you. Respite is important for family caregivers' mental and physical well-being. We heard from Eileen earlier about the importance of self-care and respite, and that has been a theme throughout this conference. And here at Arizona Caregiver Coalition, we take that very seriously, and that is the, the framework for the work that we do in the community. We have a variety of programs that are available for family caregivers. There's a lot of information to cover, so I will be brief, but even after the presentation today, you are more than welcome to call the resource line, email us at info at azcaregiver.org, or you can visit our website, azcaregiver.org. And at the end of my presentation, I will be dropping all of that information into the chat, but we do have some respite programs. So we have the respite voucher program, adult day health center program, and the Maricopa County Caregiver Support Program. We have the Family Caregiver Reimbursement Program, as well as a variety of educational and advocacy resources. The first I wanna talk about is our Respite Voucher Program. So we have two options that are either $599 Respite Voucher or a $1,200 Respite Voucher. They're typically broken into quarterly payments, but we can adjust the distribution on a case-by-case -case basis. And how this works is that you as the caregiver would apply for this program and we would enroll you and it is consumer directed. So you get to hire who the respite provider is. So if that is maybe your neighbor to come and care for your family member who has Alzheimer's and dementia or IDD and wants to have someone come so that way you can take a break, you are more than welcome to hire your neighbor. You can go through an in-home care agency anyone you feel comfortable with to care for your loved one so you are able to take a break and focus on your self-care. So as I said, the paid respite provider can be whoever you choose. Um, we do ask that the paid respite provider not live in the same home as you, but again, it can be through an agency or self-employed, and they don't have to have a certification to be a respite provider. It's really up to you who you would like to hire. 
there are some eligibility requirements. All these are listed on the website. So I'm gonna go over this fairly briefly as the eligibility for most of our programs is the same, but we do ask that the caregiver is an Arizona resident over the age of 18, that the caregiver is living with the care receiver. You are not actively receiving respite services from all texts, the AAA or the VA, and that you assist with two or more activities of daily living. But again, all of our eligibility requirements are on our website. For those joining the call today, you might not be living in Maricopa County, but I did want to share some information about this program because we are trying to bring this statewide. So please stay tuned um, and join our email newsletter list for this. But we did incorporate the Maricopa County Caregiver Support Program back in 2022. And we wanted to really extend and involve the idea of respite. As Eileen mentioned before that the idea of respite has changed, especially after COVID. And family caregivers don't all necessarily need those traditional respite models of having someone come into your home to care for your family member while you take a break. So we wanted to include some other categories. And the ones I want to highlight are recreational activities for you and your care receiver. And so if you wanted to take go to a memory cafe together or go to an art event or a music event, something that would just bring that sense of respite for yourself and for the person you care for, that is incorporated into this program. And we are looking to bring it statewide. And it also we have educational respite and to be able to hire a social worker or care navigator if you are wanting to help navigate the various services and systems here in Arizona. We also have the Adult Day Health Center Respite Program, which is up to 96 hours per family in a licensed day center that's typically over the duration of three to four months. You can apply once per calendar year and this program is so you can, most families get on the Area Agency on Aging program long-term. So this is kind of the beginning stages of that program. Eligibility is fairly similar to the voucher. The only difference is that the family caregiver cannot be working outside of the home for this program. But again, everything is on our website. We also have the Family Caregiver Reimbursement Program, which helps reimburse the costs of home modifications or assistive technology, which includes hearing aids or walkers or even fall detection devices. So this is a program where we can reimburse up to 50% of the cost for a max cap of 1000 for the year. I do need to change that date. That receipts must be paid after, I believe, January 2022. But again, all that's on our website. But this is really great if you're looking for to help offset some of those costs of home modifications, like installing grab bars or ramps or those assistive technology devices. And the eligibility for reimbursement, again, very similar, um, but we do ask for income limit for that program. Our other programs, we do not ask for income, but for the Family Caregiver Reimbursement Program, we do have an income bracket. Some other services we have, every year we have the Family Caregiver Day at the Capitol. This past year, we actually did both a virtual and an in-person event, so that way we can really bring together caregivers across the state. We present the David Best Award, who is the founder of the Caregiver Resource Line, and we have a lot of different information and advocacy resources available during both the virtual and in-person event. We offer free CPR and first aid training classes for caregivers, and you will be certified after those when we do one, about once a quarter. We offer powerful tools for caregivers, which is an evidence-based six-week course to help with stress management, self-care, and also having some difficult conversations with family. We have planning ahead for respite webinars and more. We do a lot of classes and collaborations with our partners in the community to bring free resources out to Arizona family caregivers. So this is all of our information. Again, you can visit our website, azcaregiver.org. Call our line at 1-888-737-7494 or email us at info at azcaregiver.org if you have any questions um, and feel free to leave them in the chat during our Q&A session, but I will be putting all this information in the chat for you. So thank you all so much. Kathleen, just stay on um, quickly because it's related. Um, so is that thousand 
dollar reimbursement limit lifetime or per year? Per year. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you, everybody. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we are ahead of time, so we have some time to discuss. So uh, if you have questions, please start putting it into the chat. And thank you, Barb. Okay, give me one second here. So set up. Can everyone hear me and see me? Barb, we can hear you, but we're only seeing your Zoom background. We're not, oh, there you go. There I am. <laughs> there I am. Okay, perfect. Give me just a second. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Barb Picconi and I'm with the Division of Developmental Disabilities, Office of Individual and Family Affairs. And just a little bit um, about my background. I've been with the Department of Economic Security, which is the umbrella over um, DDD for the last 26 years. Um, and I started when I was 10, in case anybody was wondering. Um, here within DES, I've worked for vocational rehabilitation. I've worked um, with our DVD support coordination, as well as uh, quality management, and now here in our Office of Individual and Family Affairs. And I'm going to reference that as DDD OISA as we move forward. Um, with that, let me move my screen down here so I can see it a little better. Okay. DDD. So let me start with talking about the Department of Economic Security. And again, that is our umbrella. Um, the mission of the Department of Economic Security, otherwise known as DES, is to make Arizona stronger by helping Arizonans reach their potential through temporary assistance for those in need and care for the vulnerable. We have a true north as well. All Arizonans who qualify receive timely DES services and achieve their potential. And as you can see, these are all the programs under DES. And again, DDD is one of them. That's the only program that I'll be talking about today. But in the uh, resources I shared with you all that you'll get at the end of, of this conference, you're gonna have a booklet that will tell you a little bit about each of these programs. Um, and just with the topic that we're covering today, I believe some of these other programs may come in handy as well. Now we're gonna talk about DDD. Uh, DDD's mission statement is the Division of Developmental Disabilities empowers individuals with developmental disabilities to lead self-directed, healthy, and meaningful lives. Now, Dr. Decker, my colleague, uh, talked a lot about the eligibility, but I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Um, and just so you all know, I, this um, slide deck that I'm sharing with you is our, our main outreach uh, slide deck that really encompasses everything about the division, uh, most everything. Um, and so I'm, I'm including all the slides and it may be a duplicate from some of the information that Dr. Decker shared. So I'm gonna skip over some of those, but you'll have this slide deck as a resource, kind of a one-stop. Um, DDD provides supports and services to individuals diagnosed with developmental disabilities. And those disabilities include autism, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, cognitive intellectual disability. And as Dr. Decker mentioned, our recently added Down syndrome that we're very excited about. Um, and we do now, this slide does say 49,000 members, but we are at that 50,000 mark and growing. This is a, kind of a good kind of quick snapshot of our membership by primary disability. So you'll see those disabilities that I mentioned. The only one here that's not included as of yet is Down syndrome, but more information to come. This information is updated quarterly, so I have a feeling our next quarter will have that information reflected. Um, and we do have a category here, which is our at-risk. That's our age, um, below age six with, um, as we mentioned earlier about um, that, that qualifier, you do not have, have to have a diagnosis as of yet under the age of six. So that's our at-risk. We have 
24.8%. So you can see age-wise, we have a large, um, we do have a large amount of younger kids, but our younger children, but we also serve pretty much um, from age zero to end of life. Early intervention, again, this isn't super relevant for all of you, but I know many of you work across um, many different areas. So I did include our, our AZIP information in here. It's the DES Arizona Early Intervention Program, and that's the statewide system of early intervention services and supports for families of infants and toddlers. So it just talks a little bit how you could go about applying for, um, for those services if there's a need. And anyone can make a referral to AZIP. Again, here's a little bit more about AZIP. I won't go into too much detail. A little bit more information about it. Some of the services under AZIP are service coordination, developmental special instruction, and OT, PT, and speech, and contact information here if you should need it as a resource. Program eligibility, again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but this is a kind of quick reference um, for you. I know Dr. Decker talked about the substantial functional limitations. Um, and again, here's our qualifying diagnoses. It talks about who we, we, who we can receive diagnoses from. So this, this gets into a little more detail based on the disability who um, you would need to have those, uh, those diagnoses. Um, here we have the functional limitations again. Here are the first three, and we have the last four on this page. Hope I'm not going too quickly for our interpreters. Eligibility redetermination. This was also referenced earlier. We do a redetermine at the or redetermination at the age of six and also at the age of 18. A little bit more about application and how you go about applying. Um, you do, again, information is going to be shared after this conference. We have a direct link to our eligibility page. You can apply online, you can apply, you can print it out, mail it in, you can call our eligibility department and you can ask for accommodations if you should need them. A little bit more about eligibility. Here are the uh, physical addresses in the event that you take advantage of that hard copy um, eligibility piece. Eligibility questions. So here we have an email address as well as the customer service center. Um, and questions do come up. You may um, get a letter notifying you that you're not eligible, but you thought you had everything you needed. Um, and, and there, our eligibility area is wonderful. So if you have questions before you apply, I just got a question today about someone who's moving from another state and they're coming here. How do they start that process? Any questions you have, and, and this number here is our customer service center. So you can call them, ask for eligibility. You can call them and ask just about any question you have about CDD in general, and they'll channel you to the correct function area. This is what you can expect after the DDD application. Newly eligible DDD members will be screened for referral to the Arizona Long-Term Care System, which is Altex. And DDD and Altex are two separate state agencies and systems. And the next slide is very busy. So I'm gonna do my best to, to break it down um, for you. So once someone is determined eligible to, for DDD, they'll fall into one of these three membership categories. DD only members, you'll see here we have developmental disability, which is our DD only. We love to use acronyms here. So this is a good resource for you as well when you hear people throwing these acronyms around. We have targeted support coordination, which is TSC, and we have long-term care, which all text and otherwise um, known as LTC. Uh, DD only members who are not Medicaid eligible and they will receive a um, support coordinator who helps them connect 
to resources. So usually what happens is when someone comes in and applies for the division and they become eligible, they'll get a support coordinator right off the bat and they're considered DD only, possibly targeted because I'll tell you a little bit about targeted in a second. Um, and, and sometimes what happens is, most of the time what happens is they apply for DVD, then they're referred to all text, then they become all text eligible. But sometimes they don't meet that all that long term care criteria, so they'll remain DV only. But the benefit of that is again, as listed on the slide, they'll get a support coordinator um, if they need to be connected to community resources. That's something that the support coordinator can do. The support coordinator meets with them regularly so they can assess changes and possibly. Um, you know, refer to other community resources that might be needed. Um, so next, targeted support coordination is for members who are determined eligible by access for targeted support coordination. And access is our Arizona State Medicaid Agency. And these, me these members are financially eligible for an access health plan but not medically eligible for, an, for um, Arizona long-term care. So they, with, with being eligible for an access health plan, uh, they're able to access uh, physical and behavioral health care through their access complete care plan. So that's what's a little bit different about targeted. Um, then you move into, um, the long-term care, and that's when you are financially and medically eligible for long-term care. And these members, and as do targeted support coordination members, they all receive a support coordinator who can connect them with community resources, but the long-term care members, because they're eligible financially and medically, they receive a DDD health plan that provides physical and behavioral health services. As Dr. Decker mentioned earlier, we have our um, contracted health plans here within DDD. We have Mercy Care, we have United, and we have the tribal health plan as well to choose from for those tribal members. Um, and in addition to a health plan, these long-term care members are also eligible for long-term services and support. This includes those home and community-based services that I'm gonna to touch on here in just a second. And um, assessment for those, well, those services are based on assessed need and med medical necessity. And again, just to reiterate, all of our memberships here include a support coordinator, which is case management services. They do meet with those, um, those support coordinators regularly for those person-centered planning meetings. Okay, next slide, a little bit about what the support coordinator is responsible for. I have a feeling many on this call probably have had some interactions with our support coordinators. Um, and so basically the support coordinator is the primary contact for questions, support services. Um, they meet with the member and the family or responsible person at mm. those scheduled intervals that we talked a little bit about in the last slide. Uh, they assist with completion of the person-centered service plan, otherwise known as the PCSP. They explain member rights, and they also assist in coordinating services and support to meet needs. Next is a little bit about the services that um, we have here within DDD. We have respite, we have attendant care and habilitation on this slide. Respite is meant to give the primary caregiver a break. We talked about that earlier with some of the other resources that we have available. This is something available to our long-term care members. Again, this, these next couple of slides are very specific to those that all text membership that, that I talked about. Next, we have attendant care. It's a service that provides someone to come in and, and basically do for the member to help them remain in, in their home. It could be um, self-care needs, uh, cooking, cleaning, just to support the member and the family uh, to remain in his or her home and to be able to participate as best they can in community activities. Whoops, hold on. 
went a little fast there. Habilitation um, is, a, is a teaching service. So basically, if, if someone can learn to meal prep, habilitation can be assessed to help, to help teach that person to meal prep and to be as independent as they can in their environment. On the flip side, just to kind of compare and contrast attending care habilitation, attending care is more doing for that person. So that's, that's the difference. Um, so habilitation can be assessed to help someone be more independent in their own in their own home, out in the community, in their own environment. Next, we have therapies. We have occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. Um, and, and noted, and this was also mentioned earlier, um, our physical therapy reverts to the DDD health plan on the member's 21st birthday. Um, so that's a, a tidbit out of here. Um, I also want to mention some other services that we have. Um, we do have day, uh, day treatment services. We have employment services that could be an option. We do have out-of-home placements. Um, and one of the things, just in light of what we're talking about here today, um, you know, we serve members, again, from zero to end of life. And the support coordinator is meeting with those families regularly and, and sometimes as much as every 90 days. And it's important as caregivers and, and as people working um, with our members to, to communicate information and communicate changes and because things change. You know, sometimes it seems like some of the services we, we offer are kind of cookie cutter, but they're not. They're so individualized. Um, and as needs change, as do the services and the service levels. So it's so important um, to just talk about that. And if things change and a higher service is needed or something's going on and, and you just don't know what to, to do and, and you don't know where to turn and you're not sure if DDD can help you or go come to your support coordinator, let them what, know what's going on. Talk with your primary care physician. It's just so, because again, we're so individualized and, you know, a member could need, you know, have certain needs at, at you know, three months ago and they could, they could have taken a turn and maybe there's new stuff going on. And, and the biggest thing is to communicate that information to the people that are on your team and that, that are supporting you. This slide talks a little bit about community resources. And, and many of you may be familiar with a lot of things, a lot of these. We have Raising Special Kids, Ability360, the ARC, Arizona Statewide Independent Living Council, Arizona Autism Coalition, Strong Families Arizona, Pilot Parents of Southern Arizona, First Things First, Southwest Human Development, and Mentally Ill Kids in Distress. So this is just a list of resources to have at your fingertips. As I mentioned earlier, your support coordinator is gonna be your main point of contact um, within DDD. And, and if you have questions and something's going on and you don't know if there's a community resource available, talk to them. This is a quick reference to have handy too. Our OIFA office. Uh, this is the area that, that I work in. Um, OIFA is a wonderful, um, area where we support our field staff, we support our members and our families and our community stakeholders. And let me just touch real briefly on what we have here in OIFA. Our customer service center. So I'm gonna provide um, information on the next slide. I talked about it already. I can't say it enough. We used to have magnets. Just if you are part of DDD, even if you're not, have this information available, that'll be your point of contact. Anything we talk about, anything I talk about here about OIFA, you can always call the customer service and say, or did a presentation, she said something about housing, can you send me, you know, send me to the right person? And they will absolutely do that for you. Um, we have behavioral health advocates. And those, um, those advocates, uh, you know, we know when we're, when we're involved in multiple systems, like the behavioral health system, like CDD, um, we do offer advocacy to help the member and the family navigate through those systems because they can be challenging. Um, so, so don't hesitate. You can ask your support coordinator about it. You can call our customer service center, but those, um, those folks are available to you and they're above and beyond the support coordinator. Um, so it's, it's just a really good resource. 
um, community engagement. We are always out in the community sharing information at schools, hospitals, um, conferences, anywhere there's a need. Um, so that's something we can provide to you. If you have an agency, if you work with a group of people who you would like to have more information about this, absolutely call our customer service center. I'd love to get an overview on DVD for my agency and we will absolutely come out and do that for you. Um, benefits coordination. And actually benefits coordination and our justice reach in um, coordination are in the same area. And we have liaisons who can answer questions about, just general questions about benefits. And we also have liaisons who, if a member comes into contact with the criminal justice system, we are able to help, um, help that process go smoothly. Because when someone goes into some type of um, institution, whether it be a prison, a jail, a juvenile detention center, um, we want to make sure that people know um, that there might be needs that, that, that they're not seeing. Maybe that person has medications that need to follow them into that institution. Those are the kinds of things we do out the gate. And then once a person is released, because sometimes we have members that you know, something happens, they're arrested, they're released within a day, a day or two. We have other members that unfortunately become incarcerated for a lot longer. So our Justice Reach and Care Coordination helps facilitate the release from, from those institutions as well. So we wanna make sure the services that were in place prior to are in place once that person is released. So another um, uh, service we provide. Uh, also, we have a Department of Child Safety foster care liaison. We do have shared members with the Department of Child Safety. We have shared members with Tribal Social Services. So we have staff liaisons that can help people navigate those two systems. Um, we have independent oversight committee liaisons. Let me tell you this, we are looking for volunteers here with the division. If you are interested in volunteering with the division, we have our independent oversight committees, one in each district, and they are kind of a second set of eyes that, that work with the division. They provide recommendations to our assistant director. They provide recommendations to the different function areas. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a great group of people across the state that we have on board right now. So we also have our program review committees that review behavior plans and they're looking for volunteers as well. Please reach out to me if you're interested or a customer service center. Um, we have a tribal liaison. Same thing as I mentioned earlier with our, um, we have shared members, we have shared members, we have approximately, I believe we're pushing 2,300 members out of our over 50,000 that are tribal members. So we have a tribal, um, a tribal liaison that helps navigate um, processes as needed. And last but not oh. least, well, two more areas, we have our communications, which send out we send out newsletters. If you're not on our mailing list via email, get on our mailing list. Um, we share information on our websites. Um, and lastly, we have a social work internship program paid, which is pretty awesome. So if you know anyone or work with anyone that's going through uh, either a bachelor's of or master's in social work, they can actually come on board with DVD and get paid um, and work in our field uh, for that for that educational piece. And the good part, well, we have an alternative motive a little bit with that one. Um, when we have people come intern with us, they see how great it is over here and how great our population in it is. And we've had actually people uh, apply for DVD later and become support coordinators from that program. So very exciting. Customer Service Center, which I talked um, at great length about again, huge contact for you. Not only do we have our customer service center and phone number, we have an email box as well. And here is my information. Don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. And about anything I spoke about today or anything in general, um, I know there was a question earlier. Um, I, I believe it was Liz that talked about, you know, dementia and if we have, you know, folks that work directly um, that we can refer to. And again, OISA does all kinds of things. So 
Um, even if it's something you don't think we provide, you can absolutely give us a call in OISA and we can connect you. We have advocates that don't just work on the behavioral health side, actually we have one, um, but she works on my team. And if someone is going through a certain something that's unique um, and they need someone to, to kind of step in um, and, and kind of that next level support, we have an advocate that we could, um, we could assign for you all. So that's another benefit here. And that is it for me. Any questions? Hope I didn't go over time. Thank you very much, Barb. And we do. Um, oh, sure. And we have a question and answer segment. So there's, I'll be mm -hmm. sticking around too. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you. Are uh, the intern job? It's posted on the AZ job website, Barb, just quickly. They, as a, yes, as a matter of fact, they are. I was just on the site today and we do have um, those positions posted. And usually they're posted for a while because right now, what are we in? May, we have our um, existing interns graduating and we're seeking um, interns for our next, for the fall semester. Thank you. David? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, sorry, I was not able to get my camera to work or the microphone, so I'm still on my phone and I had to connect to the meeting through remote desktop. So um, I should be able to present here. Let me try to share my screen. It might be a little bit laggy, um, but it should be okay. All right, can everybody see that? Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, my name is David Silverstone uh, with Arizona Long-Term Care, or Altex. Um, and today, I'm going to be giving you a very high-level overview of the Altex process. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be doing a little bit of generalizing and some simplifying on the medical process. Um, this is due to time constraints, and I hope that when I'm done, you'll have a kind of a better understanding of the basic medical criteria for all techs and how a dementia diagnosis can intersect and potentially affect eligibility. So, like I say, this is just going to be a very high level overview of, um, you know, what eligibility would look like if someone was at that skilled nursing level of care and um, you know some potential options we could take if they were not at that skilled nursing level of care but they had a dementia diagnosis okay so hopefully this won't be too laggy here let me go to my first slide so access in all text just for those of you who may not be aware of what access or all text is uh, most people probably probably are but just in case um, the Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System, or ACCESS, is Arizona's Medicaid agency that offers health prog healthcare programs to Arizona residents. Altex is for people who need ongoing services at a nursing facility level of care. And that nursing level facility, or that nursing facility level of care is important, and we'll get more into that in just a minute. To receive services, customers may live in their own homes while receiving the needed in-home services. I know one of the misconceptions that I hear a lot um, is that, you know, if I apply for Arizona long-term care, I have to leave my home. You know, they're gonna take me and put me in a facility. Um, and that is definitely not the case. So, um, you know, if someone's needs were better served in a facility, you know, that might be a, a possibility or a route that um, you may wanna look into, but it's not, it's not necessarily that You've applied now you have to leave your home and they can also live in a, 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 a assisted living facility or a skilled nursing facility like i was just saying and the customer must be both financially and medically eligible um, so remember there are always two sides to every altex application and you must be eligible for both the financial and the medical to be eligible for long-term care 
All right, next slide. And some of the services that we uh, cover, um, there's quite a list here, and I know due to time, I'll just skip to the, the most important ones here or the ones that are used the most. Um, and that would be like hospice care, um, nursing home care, attendant care, and assisted living. And if anybody wants to see um, the slides or the list, I'm happy to, um, to send these out to anybody that may need, or if they're not available. And before we get too far into this, um, before we talk about determining eligibility, let's first cover or talk about levels of care. So for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna split levels of care into three basic categories. So at the top, we're gonna to have acute care. So that'll be the hospital setting or intensive rehabilitation. So that's at the top. And at the bottom, we're gonna have supervisory level of care. And that's like housekeeping, cooking, uh, meal setup, laundry services, reminders to take your medications, occasional hands-on assistance, trips to the doctor, things like that. So what we're funded for or where our level of care starts is right in the middle. And that's that skilled nursing level of care. And the easiest way to think of skilled nursing level of care is daily hands-on assistance with your ADLs. So hands-on assistance with mobility, transferring, bathing, dressing, grooming, eating, and toileting. So for the purposes of this, we're just going to use these three basic categories. We're just going to keep it simple and go with um, three basic levels of care. And from that, you should be able to see kind of where we start. We're kind of right in the middle. I know one of the misconceptions is that uh, you can apply for all techs for those supervisory level of care needs like housekeeping and stuff like that. So just remember, we start at skilled nursing level of care. Okay, um, so the next we're gonna talk about the pass assessment, the who and the where. And you might be wondering, what is a PASS assessment? And PASS stands for Pre-Admission Screening Assessment, or so a PASS assessor, Pre-Admission pre Screening Assessment Assessor uh, is the person who comes out and does the medical assessment. And the PASS assessment itself is a, simply a battery of questions that helps us determine medical eligibility. And the PASS interview is conducted with the applicant and or the authorized representative. And the PASS, so that interview can be done in person or over the phone, uh, depending on the needs of what's happening. And I know a lot of agencies during the pandemic um, stopped going into the field and we ourselves, we stopped briefly, but um, it was only for a few months and then we, had, we uh, immediately returned to the field. So. Um, if you wish to see us, if you're applying for long-term care, you can always um, request an in-person pass. We're always happy to come out and see you. I like the in-person assessments. It's always good to meet face-to-face, -face, shake hands. That's how I like doing it. But um, you always have the option. So now that we've covered the pass assessment or what that uh, the pass assessment is, the battery of questions, let's talk about scoring and eligibility. A combination of weighted functional and medical factors are evaluated and assigned a numerical value, then added together to reach a total score. The threshold score or point at which a customer becomes eligible is determined by a formula utilizing those scores. And the threshold score for the eligibility using the EPD or elderly and or physically disabled tool, we call it the EPD PASS, P-A-S. Um, so the threshold score is 60 points. So what does that mean? It means the questions on the PASS assessments have a points of value attached to them. At the end of the assessment, based on the information reported by the customer, caregiver, diagnosis, and medical records, a score is generated. 
If the score is 60 or above, the person would be potentially eligible for long-term care. So we've got the assessment and the scoring system, how that works. And I'm sorry, my computer is going so slow. So a quick explanation of the EPD or elderly and or physically disabled tool. The functional section is the first section. Um, it is, it essentially it assesses the applicant's ability to manage those activities of daily living that we talked about earlier, the mobility, transferring, bathing, dressing, grooming, eating, and toileting. Next would be the medical conditions. Um, the assessor will verify medical conditions and determine whether these conditions impact the activities of daily living, and if the medical or nursing services and treatments are required. And then diagnosis and function deficits. Um, this is important. There's not one single diagnosis or functional deficit that automatically makes an applicant eligible. So for instance, cancer or paralysis. Um, that's another thing I'll hear in the field a lot. Um, people will, will have been told by various agencies that, you know, you have a certain diagnosis, you're going to be eligible. But when it comes to diagnosis, there is no one diagnosis that automatic, automatically makes you eligible for long-term care. And so before we get into the dementia information, um, if a person is applying and they have a dementia diagnosis and they score in based on their ADLs, then, you know, their level of, if their level of care is at that hands-on assistance or that skilled nursing level of care, then having that dementia diagnosis um, isn't really a factor at that point because they've already scored in. But a lot of times um, that doesn't happen because when it comes to dementia applicants, you know, with regards to the ADLs, physically they may be able to do those ADLs, but um, what will inevitably happen is they may need reminders for to, to complete those ADLs. So let's run through this uh, dementia slide here, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the question, um, now that we've learned about the pass and scoring, is are we bound to that same 60 points? And the answer is yes, and potentially no. <laughs> um, we are still bound to the same 60 points. However, if a person is not scoring in, we may be able to send that pass assessment for what's called the physician's review. Um, that is if some specific criteria is met. So what needs to happen to potentially get a physician's review? First, we must have an actual diagnosis of dementia from a neurologist. And this can't be just a diagnosis that's been added to a history and physical or uh, a similar medical record. A lot of hospitals and nursing facilities will add a dementia diagnosis to a person's records if they appear to be disoriented. Um, this happens more often than you would think. Um, and this may later end up being something as simple as an issue with medications or UTI. Um, however, the diagnosis is still in the records. So when we get those records, um, you know, that diagnosis may be present, but for, for the needs of sending it to physician's review, we have to have a diagnosis from a neurologist. And secondly, that dementia diagnosis must also be directly impacting those activities of daily living that we spoke about. Uh, for example, a person can groom uh, you know, brush their hair, brush their teeth, but they need those daily reminders to groom. They can bathe themselves, wash their hair, wash their body, but they need those daily reminders, maybe step-by-step -step instructions during the process. And same for dressing. They can pull their shirt over their head, pull up their pants, undergarments, socks, and shoes, but they need those daily reminders. So now, if we have that official diagnosis, and the person needs daily reminders for his or her ADLs, and the applicant is not oriented, we can potentially send that case for physician's review. So you might be asking, why is this important? 
it's important, as I mentioned earlier, and as you can see, these needs, like reminders, they don't fall into that skilled nursing level of care. So even though a person may not be scoring in, if we have the diagnosis, the reminders, and the person is not oriented, we can still send it for review. And if the person does score in, um, so if they've applied and they do need that hands-on assistance, like I said earlier, that dementia diagnosis doesn't really come into play. But it's important to know this because um, in the field or in the hospital or in a facility, you might hear, um, which is correct, that you know long-term care starts at that skilled nursing level of care. And if you're looking at maybe a parent or a grandparent or a loved one, and you see that you know they don't need that hands-on assistance, you might think, okay, well, they, they might not be eligible. So knowing this going forward, um, if, if you do have a, an official diagnosis and someone is needing that, uh, those reminders for the ADLs and they're not oriented, um, when it comes to that application, even if they're not scoring in, we can still send it up for what's called that physician's review. And in which case a physician will take a look at the case and based on the notes from the field, the past assessor notes, um, the diagnosis, the comments from the customer, and any caregivers present, um, that physician can look at all that stuff and say, okay, based on everything that's happening, um, despite the score, the person may be a, or is a good candidate for the program. So that is always a possibility. And then one other thing to remember is having a diagnosis of dementia does not guarantee eligibility. When I was doing field work, uh, I still do field work, but when I was doing field work daily, I, um, I saw a lot of people in the field who had a diagnosis of dementia, but you know, with the aid of medication and family support, um, you know, they were still, um, well, some of them were still even living independently in the community. So it, it, just, it just depends on what's going on in the individual's life. Like I said, this is a very, very high level overview of the medical process. And it's very complex, as you can see, but I just wanted to give you guys kind of a snapshot of how it works. Um, so you would know kind of the ins and outs of how um, the basic application works and how having a diagnosis of dementia could potentially um, intersect with that application and potentially change the results. I know that's a lot of potential. I, I promise, I, I apologize there. And next, el the eligibility determination. Um, if they are, if the, if the customer is found both financially and medically eligible, then they would be approved for long-term care. And again, remember, you can be financially eligible and not medically eligible. And you can also be medically eligible and not financially eligible. But to be long-term care eligible, you have to be eligible for, for both the financial and the medical components. And then that's it. If you're eligible for both, uh, then you'd be eligible for long-term care, and then you could get those um, in-home services, or if you needed to go to a facility, um, like an assisted living home or something similar, then you could do so. And that is a very quick snapshot of the long-term care medical process. And thank you for your time. I can't thank you enough for having me. Thank you so much, David, for personalizing into the issue of dementia and our focus of the presentation. Thank you so much. No problem. Like I say, thank you for having me. It's it's wonderful to be here among such uh, great and amazing and knowledgeable people. And um, yeah, I just can't thank you enough. But I'll stick around for the questions too. <laughs> Yes, please. So the speakers, please stay around for the questions. And we have a few questions that I got from the text, and I'm not sure whether that's answerable for the moment, but I would share. So one, um, one question, do they have supporting group or res uh, resource for the deaf or deaf community? 
does any of the uh, presenters or even participants uh, aware of any support groups or resource for the deaf? Would you like me to comment in regard to the Division of Developmental Disabilities? Sure. Yes, please, Dr. Decker. So Obviously, communication, both expressive and receptive. So whether it's deafness, hard of hearing, auditory processing disorders, or even vision issues. Uh, that does, that's one of our seven substantial functional limitations. And we do provide not only hearing assistance, cochlear implants, uh, but also uh, augmentive devices, which is typically an iPad with a special program. These are these are rather expensive. It's about fifteen thousand dollars, but uh, the members can learn to speak with the uh, with the advanced technology, and some of our members are able to speak almost as fast through a Augcom device as a person who has no communication problems. So the evaluation uh, is done by specialists in speech and language therapy, and uh, DDD does uh, provide those services. Keep in mind that as people age too, hearing loss is a common denominator for all populations. So those who are hard of hearing and need to have hearing aids or things like that, that is that is a benefit that's, that's covered. Yeah, thank you so much. The question was that, do they have supporting group or resources for the deaf? And Dr. Decker provided the DDD perspective and available support, so thank you. And any of the speaker has other resources in the community, let us know, please jump in. Uh, this is Morgan from the Alzheimer's Association. I will say that uh, while we don't currently um, have a specific support group uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing, um, that's something we're very interested in. And so uh, open to that. If we uh, continue to, to um, have interest in that, it's something that we would make happen and uh, would certainly be uh, very open to partnering with other agencies and making that work as well. Thank you. Um, and I see another question that was earlier on, on the, oh, maybe post that. Um, my mother has the de degenerative back problems, uh, split disc and sclerosis. Where can I find help with this? That was uh, not necessarily related to uh, memory loss or anything, but then back problems and degenerative disc issue. So chronic pain syndrome, 70% of chronic pain is from the neck and back. And so this is a very common presentation and it can be quite debilitating. The key is that the primary care provider needs to get diagnostic evaluation. So typically, X-rays first, MRI second, and then intervention services by a specialist is most appropriate. Some people will do better with massage uh, or other types of treatment. The goal is to stay away from opioids if at all possible. And then the final, op the final option is uh, epidural injections, radio frequency ablations, uh, spinal surgery. We try to avoid spinal surgery but sometimes patients have such instability that uh, they need to have some kind of support in that area. Now, exercise is across the board seen as the most important thing. So working with physical therapy, chiropractic care, osteopathic care, all those things become part of the assessment and treatment process.
Thank you very much. And um, any questions that I missed on the chat, in the chat? So um, what about qualifying for Arizona long-term care with diagnosis of SMI? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Can you guys hear me? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Um, so that's a great question. So what about qualifying for all techs with the diagnosis of SMI? Um, first, we are not a behavioral health program. Um, so for instance, um, say for instance, I was applying for myself and I have a primary diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, and just due to anything that may be going on in my life with regards to that diagnosis, I'm choosing not to complete those ADLs that I was talking about earlier. You know, so I'm, I'm refusing to bathe myself, groom myself, dress myself. Um, so score wise, I may be scoring in, but if my primary diagnosis is one uh, in the behavioral health field, I'm most likely not going to be a candidate for the program just because like I say, um, we're not a behavioral health program. Now, if I, so if I applied and I was denied, which I would most likely be, um, and say, for instance, something happened to me, maybe I had a stroke. So again, reapplying for myself. Um, now I've gotten another application in and um, I've had a stroke. I have total right side paralysis and um, I'm still not completing those ADLs. Now, I still have that diagnosis, um, that SMI diagnosis, but it's shifted from being my primary diagnosis at this time. So um, I got a new diagnosis in place. Uh, well, an, an additional diagnosis of a stroke with uh, right side uh, paralysis. So now I'm reapplying and um, obviously we still have to go through the application process and gather medical documentations and complete the path assessment. But just for the purposes of this, let's say that I'm scoring in, um, so I'm medically eligible, um, in which case with that diagnosis, and you can still have the, the, the SMI diagnosis, it just can't be the primary. Um, so with that new diagnosis, um, I've scored in medically, I'm medically eligible. And if I was financially eligible at the same time, then I would be potentially a good candidate for the program. Oh, I'd, like Thank you very much. I'd like to make a oh, comment sorry. in regard to the Division of Developmental Disabilities. So as you can see, when you look at that list of seven substantial uh, functional limitations, behavior is not one of them. Now, inability to care for yourself, uh, toileting, you know, independent living, all those other things are definitely areas that we measure. But a person could have autistic disorder, with inability to communicate, inability to um, care for themselves, toileting issues, dressing themselves, feeding themselves, but also have behavioral problems. And so the behavior is addressed separately from the qualifying diagnoses of the member's presentation to DDD. Uh, so we have a we have a chief of uh, of psychiatry, uh, Dr. Underwood. We have a chief of psychology, uh, Dr. Arnold, and we have a complex care behavioral health team. So we address issues of behavior, but the behavior is independent from the eligibility standpoint. Thank you so much for clarifying those. It's an important and um, very confusing part as well. And it's really related to the, um, the IDD population as well as dementia. Um, behavior is it becoming uh, very challenging as it progresses. Um, thank you. So um, any other questions that's popping up? 
And I would like to move into the panel discussion because that was uh, our purpose, gathering together um, IDD and the aging network of panelists that we are here uh, having with us. So we wanted to discuss what are the potential, you know, good collaboration to enhance the support of our population and also the caregivers. And I have a few examples that DD agency and the aging network work together collaboratively. So we wanted to bring up uh, some example here from the Hospital Valley and Opportunity Tree uh, worked together in their uh, healthy aging project. So Leila, if you are around, do you mind to unmute and share? Okay, awesome. So hi, I'm Leila. I'm the Supported Aging Coordinator at the Opportunity Tree. And I know Helena kind of introduced our program, our Supported Aging Program in collaboration with Hospice of the Valley. So um, a little bit about our organization. Um, we were founded in 1963. So we've been serving individuals with IDD for over 60 years. And that has led us to have a very high um, older population in our organization. About 30% of all of our members are over the age of 50. Um, and that includes those in our group homes and those that come to our day program um, throughout our four sites. So Hospice of the Valley reached out to us um, and we have been collaborating on this program um, with the goal of helping people with IDD age in place. Um, the first goal of the project is to um, expand dementia capable um, home and community based services. And then another goal is to um, expand the dementia capable workforce in Arizona. So our program is kind of all encompassing. We started by training the staff on dementia and the signs and symptoms, um, how to work with um, individuals who are experiencing dementia and some of the best prevention support that we can provide. And then we work, we target the members over 50 um, with programming um, and it's a variety of members. Um, some are in our day program, so we provide uh, services for them here and that's five days a week that they're coming and getting this um, programming that's specifically for those with dementia. Um, and then we also have members in our group homes that we visit and target um, and work with them on providing support for them as well. Um, and so some of the some of the things that we've done are um, making our campuses more dementia friendly by putting up signs, um, pointing to the bathroom and where the water is located, just to kind of remind some of our members as they start to kind of forget how to get there. Um, and we also focus a lot on activities like creative arts, um, movement memory games, um, cooking class, and overall socialization just to keep them engaged throughout the day and provide them with meaningful activities that they can do at our day program and at their houses. Um, so overall, we just want to identify what supports our members need and um, be able to support them and improve the quality of life in the later years. Um, and as others have said, the early detection and intervention can be very beneficial. Um, so that's our goal for our members. Thank you very much. So um, is there anything that, you know, I know that you had the program for a while and collaborating with the Hospice of Valley, bringing that, you know, um, dementia specific knowledge and experience into your program. What was the most beneficial things for you as a program staff that you observed? And then also to the uh, members, participants who is uh, being with you for a long while. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the staff training was super beneficial, just telling them about 
how dementia affects our population, especially those with Down syndrome, and what those symptoms can look like and how to address them. I think I really saw a difference in how staff approached some of the members and how they dealt with some of the symptoms from some of our members that are experiencing the dementia. Um, and then as for the members, I think just providing um, a lot of activities for them to be doing like creative arts and memory games has really helped. Like sometimes it can really engage them and kind of bring them out of that state of confusion. Um, and so that's been very cool to see. Um, and just to hear their feedback that they're enjoying the program and that some of the um, behavior symptoms have been decreasing. Thank you. And I see Dr. Hamilton in the uh, panel. So would you just share from your perspective, Dr. Hamilton? Yeah, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I think several, including the Pima Council on Aging, have received the Administration on Aging grant that asks that we work not just with dementia, but with DD. And when I called around the country, there's been very little success. People with DD do not want to come to a regular dementia program. And it's very hard. Even the DD departments are overwhelmed. So it wasn't working at all to take a dementia program and add DD people. So then I went to the DD organizations and the older people were just sitting in a corner because they weren't engaged because they weren't part of what usually happens. And so I thought, okay, let's fund a program just for, and then we tried to have the two together. We got six people with DD who were older and had dementia and six just regular dementia programs in our dementia day program. They didn't mix at all. It didn't work at all. They're very different. So uh, that's when I said to Layla and her organization, okay, we're just gonna fund Layla and she's gonna create a program just for older adults with DD. And she has done that. And with two different groups of 10 each, and then another group in Casa Grande of 10. And we're actually looking for an agency that might be interested in replicating this so that we can show that it works. And I will stop. Thank you so much for uh, sharing. You know, sometimes we, it's hard to admit what are the challenges before we see some success? And thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, uh, Habajun, are you available? So we do have a PCOA um, who has also ACL, the funding from the administration um, on community living. And uh, she, would you share some of your experience working with the IDD network or part? Absolutely, I would be happy to. And I can echo some of the challenges that we have had in our programming with trying to connect our services in the DDD world. We have had some successes and we have also had some failures. Um, I will speak to our successes. We have a partnership right now with Easter Seals Blake Foundation in Tucson, and we have done a variety of things with them. First, we started off with staff training. And so we came in and we provided dementia, the IDD Dementia Friends training to all of their staff, as well as just some general knowledge on what are signs and symptoms to look for in the aging IDD population where there might be concerns for memory loss. We learned very quickly that it would not be appropriate or applicable for them to do the NTG EDSD screening. And so we offer to do that for their clients. We have limited success with those referrals, but with the training overall, that has been very successful. And the other piece that we didn't really expect to happen, but was one of those beautiful happenstance is we have one of our memory cafes in town and one of our staff got in touch with one of the day program staff at Easter Seals and said, hey, I know this is during your open time. Do you want to bring some of your day program clients who are older and experiencing memory loss to our cafe? And so every two weeks, we have a group of 
anywhere from three to seven folks who come from the Easter Seals Day program to our memory cafe. And it's been really great to have that integration. Um, the folks are really, really enjoying it and we haven't had any challenges in that respect. So that's been a really good way that we've done integration there. Um, and we're hoping to do some more partnerships, but you know, like you just echoed, it, it's very challenging and, and it is difficult. And so we're we're here and we we have services available. And I think I think part of why ACL keeps asking that all the grantees do this work is because they're trying to find the right recipe that works. And every community is different. And so we just have to try different things and see what what works best for our area and for our population. And I've talked to probably a dozen programs that the Administration on Aging recommends saying, oh, these people are doing a great job with DD. And every time I call, they say, well, we have three patients, we have six patients, we've got eight patients in two years. What we've decided to do is educate. So they go and educate these different programs. And that, I think, is helpful. But I wanted to do something. So I'm pretty excited. I'm going to put my email in the chat because I just saw some people. Yeah, Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. I just, and you... I just wanted to, yeah. I'm so sorry, just to jump in really quickly. It looks like the captions have swapped case. If we could change the captions back to um, mixed case with the first, case, first letter being capital. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. So, um... Please reach out to the Hospice of Valley and um, PCOA if you would love to extend the partnership. And then also we like to extend this conversation as potential you know, future collaboration or how the member of IDD community can utilize or work together with the aging network program that's already in the community. And if you have any thoughts or ideas, uh, please, share that in your chat, um, that would be fantastic. And panelists, if you have any thoughts, please jump in, you know, you have a power to unmute yourself. So Catherine, do you want to unmute and share your thoughts? Sure. I was just going to say um, we have the Arizona Respite Network, which is through the Lifespan Respite Grant from the Administration for Community Living. And we work together with the Division of Aging and Adult Services. Many of you are on the call that are representative, including area agencies on aging, um, DDD, and all techs. But if any of the other organizations who are on are interested in collaborating to um, address the gaps in respite services in Arizona, please just feel free to email me and I put my email in the chat there and I will send you the information. Thank you. And then Arizona Caregiver College and respite program is really important uh, to fill the gap who may not be eligible or are trying to get eligible for the Arizona long-term care, but does not have yet the service. And they can uh, provide some temporary support. So just to have that awareness is really important. Thank you. Thank you. So I always ask, um, particularly I work or I direct a day program for a long while and uh, all the caregivers, they have less connectedness with their peer caregivers as they get older. And that's my immediate concern when I think of the aging and anything that can be addressed or supported um, through any of the existing programming in the community? Uh, 
I'm on double muted. Yumi, can you repeat that question? Yeah, so our family members. Um, so we just had the DDD Fantastic Self-Care Family Caregiver Conference last week. Mm -hmm. That was fabulous. However, I see older caregivers as we, um, as they get older, they lose their network of connectedness as they get older when they start needing more support. So is there any way that we can tap into the existing programming, for instance, support groups or peer network uh, in some ways for the adult and older caregivers? That's my question. Well, I think it's a great question, Yumi. And I feel like education and even with educating our field staff, our support coordination to know maybe what resources are available. And I, I finally just had, had a chance to scroll through the attendance of this conference. I think we even had a few of our DDD support staff here. Um, and maybe we can do better, you know, at communicating that information um, with our teams when they're out there having those discussions with families and recognizing when things take a turn. And like I had mentioned earlier, when things change, you know, it's not really just about when our members you know, change. I think it's also about when our caregivers change, our families are changing. We support that whole um, family unit. We want we want the member to be able to remain in that home. So I don't have the answer, obviously, because I don't I don't know that they're that we're out there doing that right now. You know, I do know we're very individualized, and I do know we have some very strong support coordinators. And I bet there's a piece where we are, but I think we can always do better. Hey, Barb, it's Liz. Um, was there anything at your uh, caregiver self-care? You know, yeah. at the self-care conference, we really tried hard to get people to connect with each other. We had tents on the tables where, you know, where we wanted to stimulate conversation. And, and I think that was a really good thing. I can't tell you, We I know that Leah is still going through. We got amazing feedback. I think we are going to have to have one every year now. I don't think there's any question on that. But I think we had a lot, we tried to have activities where people could connect with each other. Um, now, how successful that was, and, and hopefully people took that away, right? Made some contacts, made some connections. We also, um, on the name tags, we had, we had asked participants to say how many people are you caregiver for and what are their ages because we wanted people to connect with each other where they had similar similar interests similar um you know responsibilities right so so maybe that would stimulate some conversation um and i do know we're going to make it bigger next year i do know that there's no question about that either because there was quite we we've recognized a need and we're very excited about it. I know Yumi, you were there. I don't know if you had a chance to to do some of the the activities, but um, yeah, we did try to incorporate some exercises to connect people. Yeah, that would be great to strengthen, you know, that confidence with also looking at the uh, caregiver of older adult, you know. I think that becomes harder for them to drive and come out to those conference hall day event. So I think that would be a you know very um, we need to reach out to those caregivers to join to the group. Thank you so much for sharing, and I think that can be ongoing our kind of uh, mission <laughs> moving forward. Any other thoughts working and hearing with other programming that we have in the community that whether we can collaborate together in the future or interested in to learning more about? So the caregivers of IDD and um, individual themselves can benefit. I really think it's us stepping outside of our comfort zone because I know DD, so that's where my focus is. 
So I think asking, you know, being able to search out like the Alzheimer's Association and getting that as part of my network so I can start partnering. And I, you know, would like to empower everyone to do that is kind of step outside your comfort zone, whether you're coming from the dementia side, step into the DD side, and those of us that are in the DD side, step to the dementia side, so we can start making those partnerships. This is, I don't know if we, you know, how far north we have people, but I know that Yumi's in Tucson, Eileen's in Tucson, I'm in Mesa, Mo is in Mesa, Tracy's in Tucson. So we heard from the uh, Pima Council on aging, but knowing that there's other ones throughout the state looking for those connections. So I think what we, or what I got out of the conference today was kind of more of a to-do list of who to reach out to, um, how I can better my network to help support those that we support or those that we serve. I would echo that, Liz, and, and I think to everyone on the call, uh, including our participants today, uh, reach out to agencies and even just say, have you thought about partnering with so-and-so agency? I, I received services from them or I've worked with them in the past. Um, I think that's how we're going to be thinking outside the box a little bit. Um, I think it, it, we're in an era where we have to do that more and more and collaboration becomes much more important. Um, so uh, yeah, extend the, the invitation. As far as the Alzheimer's Association goes, we're always happy to partner or support or provide resources however we can. Let's do lunch, Morgan. <laughs> I'm all about that. That sounds great. If, if I might add any something, um, you know, I, I feel like when I work with caregivers, we also have a person who works with with families and, and children. I, I try really hard to make sure that when we look at caregiving, and again, I cover a lot of different um, intensities and types of caregiving. Um, I'm trying to look at things from more of an intergenerational perspective, you know, and it's not just the person who's receiving the care, it's the person providing the care. So how does that affect their perspective on aging? Do we need to strengthen as a university the support that we offer for people who are considering retirement and maybe have to retire early? Um, do we need to consider supporting people who have already retired and continuing to support them as well? So I, I guess that's, that's all I can, just from a university perspective, I just think that the programs that we offer, we need to look at caregiving from a very generational perspective and, and with that with that lens on aging as well. So I'll be working with all of you. Hey, Lynn's gonna save the no, world. I think that's Thank you so much. Okay. And I think that's an excellent point. I mean, just being here today and now over like Liz brought up the caregiver conference and I was even thinking, I thought, you know, I don't know that we really targeted that population, people that are caring for older, like maybe we needed to do a session around that. So I think moving forward, those are things that, that are pretty easily implemented. And I think everybody here now that has a piece of this and, and has identified a need, when we're out there working on our different projects, we just need to be mindful, right? To incorporate that and to capture that audience because I don't know that we're always doing that. I mean, we have such a, there's so much. I mean, like Yumi said, it's like, save. you know, we try to save the world in every aspect, but I don't, <laughs> it's really, challenging. <laughs> um, but I think we can all take a piece of this and incorporate it into what we do. If we're not, because a lot of us don't specialize in working with an older population. And I think as we talked about, those of us that work in with DDD specifically, we have that zero to, you know, the whole gamut and to really recognize that, that we do have these individualized needs that we need to make pop right in certain ways so yeah that's the idea starts coming up and in, in the chat we have the bruce put mm -hmm. the club light to create a caregiver helpline with a phone number mm -hmm. that support the chat that would be fantastic and katherine has responded the arizona caregiver coalition at some lines right so then 
if the DD caregiver call that is in a care, uh, caregiver collision hotline, are they knowledgeable? Do they have place to refer, you know, make the referral or make additional support? So the connectivity becomes very important for that. And that's a great idea. And how about the growing shortage of home care attendants, uh, sky, ski or sky takes that. That is, uh, I see different public listening session and that's been a big issue throughout the COVID. Even it was before the COVID, but it's worsened, you know, through and after the COVID time. So the shortage of the direct support professionals and the caregivers. That we can, can address those together. Thanks, Yumi. I can speak a little bit to that, at least here in Pima County. Um, we have definitely noticed the shortage of direct care workers, and it is not just a, a local issue, as you said, it's a national crisis at this point. There are just not enough people who are joining the workforce. And so there are things being done on the national level and the state level and then the local level. And I know um, at Pima Council on Aging, we are working with the United Way of Southern Arizona to offer kind of um, financial incentives and also some uh, financial support to help people become trained as direct care workers and then to get them into the workforce. So there are things being done on local levels to help address this, um, but I, I think it's going to take a uh, efforts on all levels, you know, local, state, and federal to really address this issue. There isn't one solution for it, but in, in Pima County, we are doing what we can to try and uh, incentivize people to become direct care workers and make it less of a stopgap job and more of a career. Well, and as a policy geek myself, I always encourage people to reach out to their local legislators um, and stress the importance of funding the division and AAOA, anyone that gets funds that trains and hires caregivers, that's that's a big holdup for, for agencies. So find your local legislator and shoot them a, a email or give them a call and let them know that, that we are struggling. Thank you so much. And the timing is coming up. The closing time is getting closer. So we like to kind of closing our discussion part. And then we like to make that as a starting point of our continuous conversation. So thank you so much for the fantastic speakers. And we like to get started on the uh, closing kind of part of the reflective part. Uh, if Lizzie can share the slide, that would be great. So that's kind of obvious to show the feedback survey. So we love the presentation and the participation. And of course, we can improve a lot. We have very fabulous uh, planning committee presenters. Everybody is so passionate and we have so much help. But we love your help for us to give us some feedback. So how we can continue our network. And this is the connection we made. So moving forward, what may be a good idea for us to do as a group? And then also, I don't know whether we can do annual conference, but I think this is, we think this is a starting point of conversation because we only tapped into the, just the foundation of issue of IDD and dementia and supporting caregivers as well. And we have so many more in-depth sessions we can do. And Dr. Decker mentioned when we initially talked about this issue, we haven't talked about the loss and grief, though it's more emotional, how we can support ourselves and process ourselves, how the individual themselves can process and prepare. So we don't have that conversation yet in our conference. We just only had the one day. So let us know your interest and your feedback in the survey. We really, really appreciate um, like Eileen mentioned, we have a bunch of raffle prizes that can be, uh, you can enter into the raffles after the end of survey. And I will ask, um, I wonder if Eva is available to put the um, survey link in the chat as well, if you cannot use the phone. 
That'd be great. Thank you. Yep. So I believe she put it in the chat. Oh, and there it is again. Perfect. Oh, great. Oh, thank you for double time. I'm a bit slow aside, so I don't see it. So it takes just a few moments. Thank you. You mean you know, did you this is people to hang out after they do the survey? Because aren't you emailing raffle winners? Yes, we are. So the this this survey will take you to the raffle link. So if you put the name and if you want to be put into the raffle, um, we're gonna do the drawing later. So you're gonna be contacted by email. So once you put the raffle uh, entry, you are asked to provide your email address. So then we can reach back to you if you win some items. Yeah, but we once have they do the, the survey, they, they can leave. Yes. Okay. So what's next though? Just that we have a few more slides. So we do have Liz and I and Melissa Kushner, she's on it today too. Uh, we do provide the two hour virtual training for healthcare advocacy, particularly for our issue of IDD aging and dementia. And we do go through the screening tool from the NTG and also how we can use that tool to advocate the needs of the healthcare working as a group. So that's by month three, so you can just, um, stay in tune for that registration site. And, and then also, um, we're gonna share today's resource um, slides by email. So keep eyes out for the email that you're gonna receive the slide from today and additional resources. And the next slide. And then also we do have an eye adapt task force that our planning team, most of our planning team is on it. If you would like to join our team, please email me. Um, so we can put you in our calendar and email list. So thank you so much. Um, this one is a fantastic and it, we couldn't done um, without all single members help and also the family member. And because they have so much passion in working it, with the individuals and they have such a personal experience, they reminded me how important is the caregiver role is to the support of our team. And then also our team realized us, we cannot do this on our own. It takes a village and we so are grateful to have this village. So please stay in tune and stay in touch. And thank you so much.